Hi, my name is Aiden, and I have a question for you. Have you ever worked at a fast food place? What's the weirdest thing that ever happened to you? I know a lot of people who have never really had anything happen to them other than drunken customers making a mess or family fights. In the beginning, I had never experienced anything like this, and I didn't think it would really happen to me since I only worked in a humble neighborhood of Popeye's Chicken. I never knew that in just a few months, I would have the worst night of my life. The beginning of my night shift at Popeye's went along with the typical routine of a quiet night. It was around 10 o'clock at night, a time when we usually receive more customers, and the atmosphere was chaotic, with the intense murmur of conversation scattered among the tables. But among all the people talking, one person stood out. A very tall, thin man had entered. His eyes were small but terrifying, as they were wide open. He sat in a corner away from the rest of the diners, and what disturbed me most was not simply his appearance, but his fixed, penetrating gaze. He watched each individual with an intensity that sent chills down my spine. As the night progressed, more customers joined the scene, but this man remained static, making no requests, simply observing. It was as if he was analyzing people, studying their every move. On the other hand, no one noticed him. He was like a ghost that only I could see. Suddenly, the man walked towards a family having dinner. As soon as he arrived, he looked at them all and gave them a smile. However, there was something wrong with that smile. It was rather forced, as if he was practicing an emotion that did not come naturally to him. As he engaged the family in conversation, I could sense the discomfort in them, as if something was undoubtedly out of place. The man who seemed to be a stranger to everyone approached the tables uninvited. As he walked, his smile widened, but his eyes remained wide open. They never seemed to close. It was as if the man never blinked. Each word he spoke seemed more intense than the last, and families became increasingly terrified after meeting him. Some even grabbed their food and left. At first, all the families he spoke to tried to be polite and friendly, but as time went on, the atmosphere became more and more tense. The man's gestures were disproportionate and his laughter was enormous. I kept watching him from my position behind the counter, attentive to what was happening. Some children were crying and parents were looking at me sideways as if looking for help to get rid of this man without having to fight him. The man didn't seem willing to leave. It was as if he was enjoying the discomfort he was generating in others. I decided to approach, trying to remain calm. Excuse me, sir. Do you need anything? I asked with a forced smile, trying to hide the uneasiness that his presence generated in me. The man turned to me slowly. His gaze was fixed on me. It was penetrating and terrifying. I must admit that I froze. Oh no, I don't need anything at all. I'm just enjoying the company. Isn't that the charm of a fast food restaurant? His words chilled my blood. There was nothing in what he said that could be considered threatening, but something in his tone and look was sinister, as if he was toying with all of us. After a defiant smile, the man simply walked out of the restaurant as if nothing had happened. I could hear people still talking about the strange man who had appeared in the restaurant, but unlike before, they were now telling it as if it were an anecdote and making jokes no longer afraid that the man would approach their table and do something to them. Shortly after, the clock struck 11 o'clock at night, and I decided to go out for a short break. I walked out to the parking lot of the restaurant with a cigarette in my hand. I was still quite nervous about my encounter with the scary man, but I feel I handled the situation really well. Even so, I still felt a sense of discomfort. It was as if something was still wrong. As I walked out into the parking lot, my eyes adjusted to the darkness. I headed towards my car, but in a moment, a strange hunt made me pay more attention. There in the shadows, I made out the figure of the man. He was standing near my vehicle, watching it carefully. Hey, what are you doing here? The man slowly turned to me, his smile widening eerily. His face reflected an unsettling calm as if he was enjoying my surprise and fear. Without a word, he began to walk toward me with slow, deliberate steps. My heart began to pound. I instinctively backed away trying to get back to the restaurant. I didn't know how to handle the situation. The man, with his erratic gaze and unpredictable attitude, kept getting closer. Each step he took intimidated me more than the other. I was so scared that I could barely react. 
You don't need to be afraid. I'm just here to have a conversation with you. The man continued to advance toward me with a slowness that seemed intentional. I tried to run away, but suddenly something happened to me at the worst possible moment. As soon as I started to run, I fell to the ground dizzy. It was hard to breathe and I felt like I was going to die. I couldn't feel my arms, my legs. I couldn't feel almost anything in my body. Please, please stop. I'm having a panic attack. Please, don't do anything to me. Hey, what's wrong with you? Why is this happening to you? Are you afraid of me? I just wanted to talk. I'm s sorry. I'm not feeling well. I told you I need to talk. Suddenly, his expression changed. His head began to shake and his eyes got even bigger. It looked like they were going out of place. His scream was so loud that it made me cry out in fear, still unable to escape. Don't you understand? Can't you see I've been nice all night? Why can't I have a normal conversation with anyone? Have you all gone crazy? I want to talk. I want to talk. I want to talk. As soon as he finished the last word, the man lifted me off the ground with his two hands and threw me away from him. Crying, thinking I was going to have a heart attack, I started to drag myself to the restaurant. After mustering up some energy, I got up from the ground and made a great effort to run, but I stumbled. I fell to the ground, hitting the rough pavement with bated breath. Come on, can't you even run? Hey, come on, you can do it, just a little run. If you can't even run, some bad guy will hurt you. With the help of the psycho, I got up crying and ran again. I was limping, crying, humiliated. The sounds of footsteps behind me stopped. I dared to look back, and the man just stood there waving at me. With my heart pounding, I arrived at the restaurant. I tried to tell him everything that happened, but I fell back to the floor. I have had many panic attacks in my life, but this was the worst. I felt like I was going to die at any moment, but I still tried to talk. I needed the police to be called, or the psycho would hurt someone. Once I recovered, I was able to tell the manager to call the police as there was a psychopath in the parking lot. Without hesitation, the man went to the cash register and started pushing the panic button under the counter. It didn't take long for the police to arrive, but the man was gone. Although I never saw the strange individual again that night or any other night, his presence continued to haunt me in every shadow, every dark corner of the store. As the restaurant closed, my manager called me a cab. As soon as the car started, I swear I could see a silhouette in the shadows looking at me. I could see the silhouette raise a hand and with a sinister smile, wave at me from a distance. That was the last time I saw that man again. To be honest, that was the last time I ever went near Popeyes. Nowadays, every time I leave my house, I do it with fear. There is no way for that psycho to know where I live, but I always feel that he is near me, stalking me, ready to kill me. Hey, my name is Andrew. You may not know me, but I'm a recognized chef in my country. I don't want to brag, but I'm really very good. I've been a judge on many reality shows. People know me quite well, not by the name Andrew, but by my stage name, which, for obvious reasons, I would not like you to know. But I'll just tell you this story so you can learn from my mistakes. You see, I was one of the best chefs in the world. As a teenager, I didn't even like to cook. I loved people cooking for me, but I didn't know how to cook at all. That is until one Tuesday night. That night, I decided that I was never again going to go to a restaurant or eat something given to me by someone I didn't know. No, after what I experienced that night, I decided I would be the one to prepare my own food. I told them the story from the beginning. The day had already started out weird. I was in a hurry to meet my girlfriend and go get something to eat together until a car ran a red light and almost ran me over. I got out of the crash intact, but I fell off my bike and let me tell you, it was a miracle I didn't hit my head. Before what had happened, the driver got out worried and came running towards me. He appeared to be a middle-aged man, polite, relaxed, and friendly. Although I could see on his face 
that he really felt guilty for having caused an accident. The man checked that I was okay and asked me if I needed anything. He also told me that I was free to write down his license plate and sue him, as it was the right thing to do for what had happened. Laughing, I stood up and told him that it wouldn't be necessary. What had happened was an accident. It could happen to anyone. Grateful but somewhat confused, the man smiled at me and left, telling me that he was late for work, but that he would be eternally grateful for my generosity. Soon after, I met up with my girlfriend and we started looking for a place to eat. We looked everywhere, but there was nothing new. Everywhere we went, we could find burgers and fries or pizza. We wanted something different. Halfway there, as if sensing our dissatisfaction, a man stopped us and invited us to eat at a fancy restaurant called The Feast. To be honest, I didn't know it, but as it was a hidden and quite exclusive place, we agreed to enter the mysterious black door that the man indicated and went in. As we entered, I immediately noticed the peculiar atmosphere of the place. The dim lights and soft music created a peaceful atmosphere, but something in the air was not quite right. I couldn't put my finger on exactly what it was, but an uneasy feeling settled in my stomach. My girlfriend, on the other hand, seemed very calm. She was casually talking to me and telling me that she liked the place. I admit, they gave me some peace of mind, and we were able to get on with the evening. We were seated at a table by the window, and a friendly waiter handed me the menu. There was a wide variety of exquisite dishes, but I decided to go for what I knew I couldn't go wrong. When in doubt, I opted for steak. A safe choice, I thought. As I waited for my food, I looked around. The restaurant was full of people, but everyone seemed to be immersed in their own worlds. There was no laughter or lively conversation, just murmurs and muffled words. I also noticed that there were no people our age. They all looked to be in their 50s and 60s. I decided to just ignore what was going on and started eating. The first bite of steak confirmed my expectations. It was delicious, tender and perfectly cooked. However, as I progressed through my meal, I began to notice something strange. The flavor was becoming more and more intense, almost overwhelming. I tried to remember the last time I enjoyed a meal so much, but something didn't add up. It was then that I noticed that the people around me were looking at me. Their stares were fixed as if they knew something I didn't. I felt uncomfortable, even dirty, but I decided to ignore the stares and finish my dinner. However, the more I ate, the harder I found it to swallow. The taste, once delicious, was becoming bitter and unpleasant. My girlfriend, on the other hand, didn't seem to notice the stares of the people, but she did notice the taste of the food. She was disgusted and enraged like a person who had just been ripped off. She wanted to make a fuss, go after the chef and not pay for the food. I told her it was not a good idea, that the environment seemed dangerous, and to at least let me finish my meal. I still don't understand why I asked her to do that, but today I can deduce that if I hadn't, my life would be different. Minutes passed, and finally, I decided to stop eating. I looked around and noticed that the atmosphere in the restaurant had changed. The music had stopped, and the murmur of conversation had died down completely. People were still looking at me, but now their faces expressed more than curiosity. They were desperation, anxiety, nerves. Something was wrong with these people, and neither my girlfriend nor I could be long a second longer. Before we left, I got up to go to the bathroom. I needed a moment to recover. As I walked in, I noticed that the room was cold too cold to be normal. I looked in the mirror and saw my reflection pale and sweaty. My eyes showed a mixture of fear and confusion. I was ready to go back to the kitchen and tell my girlfriend that we were leaving. But before I did, to my surprise, someone grabbed my arm. A man, one of the customers was next to me, grabbing me. At what moment did he appear? Was he in a cubicle in the bathroom and I was so absorbed in my thoughts that I didn't see him? I asked the man to let go immediately, but he didn't. I would even say he squeezed harder. His eyes were lost in mine. The man was drooling and had a terrifying face. 
full of perversion and evil. But boy, where are you going in such a hurry? The night has just begun. Disgusted by his words, I tried to hit him, but it was useless. With a sharp blow to the stomach, I fell to the ground, surrendered, and without the possibility to continue fighting. Realizing that I could not defend myself, the man got on all fours and approached me as if I were a dog, sniffing my face, obviously. My only possible reaction to something so bizarre was to cry. I didn't understand what was happening or why it was happening to me. In my moment of confusion, the man threw me to the ground and on top of me began to choke me with his two hands. His gaze was more obsessive and disturbing than ever. It was as if he was in a trance, lost in what he was doing to me. Little by little, I began to lose the fight. I started to run out of air and was resisting less and less until something else happened. From the restaurant, I heard my girlfriend's desperate cry for help. Filled with new energy, I managed to land a knee to the man's private parts and knock him out. In a hurry, I ran to the bathroom door and when I opened it, looking for my girlfriend, I was shocked at the sight. Everyone in the restaurant went from looking at her to looking at me. They were all standing around, looking obsessive and sickly like the man in the bathroom. They all began to ignore my girlfriend and slowly approached where I was, ready to do who knows what to me. Cornered, I fell against the wall in fear until a man dressed as a chef stepped in the middle. This was the man from before. He almost ran me over with his car. Please, let this one go. I'll make sure you have a replacement for the situation. His voice had changed. He sounded more professional, reserved, and cold. After saying this, people returned to their seats, and he looked at me and my girlfriend, who joined us, still terrified. I hope you will excuse them. These are people from uh, very wealthy circles. They are very intelligent, but once a year, they go with their instincts, and we throw them a special party here. What do you mean? Escorting me out, the man continued speaking. I'm sorry, you have uh, fallen into a little trap of my people. In this place, we do not have the same diet as you. It is a special place for special and distinguished people. I recommend that you do not come here again tonight, as they were waiting for dessert to arrive. Dessert? What are you talking about? I don't understand. Honey, I think he means... You. That means... That means that the meat we ate? At that moment, I understood everything. During that night, I had eaten human flesh. And that man who had stopped me in the bathroom, that man wanted to eat me alive. At this realization, I grabbed my girlfriend by the arm and ran away as fast as I could. As I did so, I could see how the waiter simply looked at me with a smile and returned to the restaurant, satisfied. Once we arrived at my house, we considered calling the police. But what was that going to make any sense? It was the statement of two 18-year-olds accusing a place full of millionaires of conspiring to eat human flesh. Instead, we just spent the night puking in my house, considering how close we came to being dessert for some millionaire psychopaths who wanted to eat human flesh for fun. It's been several years since that day. My girlfriend and I are still together, but we don't talk about it anymore. We feel it's reliving a ghost we don't want to remember. Maybe it was the coward's way out. For sure we would have helped many people so that this does not happen to them, but we were afraid to do it, and no one can blame us for that. Since that day, I don't trust anyone anymore. As I told you, I am the one who makes the food. I will never again be willing to eat food that I don't see how it is prepared on the spot. To have eaten human flesh, even once, is more than I will ever be willing to do in my entire life. About four years ago, I started dating a girl called Angie. I'd met her at school and we pretty much hit it off. Now, I liked almost everything about Angie, like how she preferred listening to songs on vinyl, and her love for everything nature. But there was one thing that we didn't agree on, and that was her incessant love for the Chick-fil-A restaurant. 
I'd first noticed it when we started going out, as Angie would often eat at the restaurant three times a day. She also wanted us to have most of our dates there. Now, I didn't hate the restaurant Chick-fil-A or its food. I just wasn't fond of fast food restaurants in general, but I really liked Angie, so I managed to tolerate it. At least I did, till one disturbing incident. We were on our date night, and as per Angie's request, we went to the Chick-fil-A restaurant. After ordering the food, we sat down to eat. As I said earlier, while I did tolerate eating there for her, I was always jesting about how bad the food was. I remember telling her, you know, they might say this is chicken, but I'm pretty sure it's sewer rat. Angie laughed before responding with, well, it's some pretty good sewer rat, and since you're talking about it so much, maybe I'll catch some from the sewers and grill them for you at home. We both laughed hard at her response as we continued eating. Having the same humor was another thing I liked about Angie. She knew I didn't like being there, and she was able to laugh about it with me. As we continued eating, I decided to make fun of the food one last time, as I said. You know, if we wanted food this bad, we could have just eaten at the dumpster. Angie then responded with, Hey, that's enough. I know you're here only because of me, but I'm pretty sure you'll soon love their food, just like I do. I just need to shove more of their amazing sandwiches down your throat. We laughed again, and I decided it was time for me to stop my jests. But out of the corner of my eye, I could see an employee giving me a death stare. Now, I don't remember talking to or meeting this employee, but for some unknown reason, he was looking at me with pure hatred in his eyes. I tried ignoring it at first, as I told myself he might not be looking at me, but this particular employee didn't stop staring at me throughout the rest of our date. Now, I'm not really a confrontational person, so I told Angie that we should get our food to go as I wanted to go catch a movie after eating. On our way to the theater, I couldn't help but feel like I was being followed. The feeling didn't go away even when I walked back home after dropping Angie off at our apartment. I looked over my shoulder a few times and I even stopped at intervals to check my surroundings, but no matter how many times I checked, there wasn't anyone following me. I eventually told myself that it was all in my head and I was just being paranoid, but that night, something strange happened. It was around 2 a.m. and I couldn't sleep because I was still feeling a bit nervous. That's when I heard my doorbell ring. I didn't move as I wondered who could it be at this time. I then decided to ignore it and hope the person will eventually go away, but whoever it was just kept ringing the doorbell till it became unbearable. Like I said earlier, I wasn't a confrontational person, but I knew I had to defend myself from whoever was harassing me, so I took my old baseball bat and I made my way to the door. But by the time I had gotten there, the person who had been ringing the doorbell was gone. I wondered who could be playing this stupid prank at a time like this. There weren't any children up at this time, and the adults I lived with in the neighborhood were pretty sensible people, so I knew it had to be some random individual that just wanted to mess with me. I stayed at the door for a while to see if the person would come back, but no one returned. The morning soon arrived before I could get any more sleep, so I left my house feeling tired. I usually like to walk in the mornings, but I didn't have the strength, so I went for my car. But as I reached for my keys, I noticed something odd. Someone had keyed my car. I was frustrated and confused as I asked myself who could have done something so petty. I knew I hadn't crossed anyone recently, so I was perplexed as I wondered why this person was doing this. I also had the feeling the person who did it must have been the same person who incessantly rang my doorbell at night. I then asked my neighbors if they'd seen anything, but they all said no. So, with nothing else to do, I just drove my car like that, and I made plans to report the defacement of my car later. Now, for some reason, even after my report, things just got worse from there. Whoever was harassing me just increased their efforts. Some things were just childish, as I came home one day to see my house had been TP'd. Others were very disturbing, as the person also inscribed the words, die on my door. Apart from all this, I constantly felt like I was being watched. I thought I was losing my mind, so I looked it up and found out it's a biological phenomenon that's known as gaze detection or gaze perception. It's that strange feeling that someone is staring at you, but no matter how much I tried, I couldn't find the person that was following me around and making me feel like this. I suffered this torture for a week, and there still was no updates. That Saturday night, 
My girlfriend Angie told me she was going to come over to keep me company. She'd been really supportive during this period, so I decided to surprise her. I went to the Chick-fil-A restaurant to pick up her favorite order before she arrived. It was the Chick-fil-A chicken sandwich and their chicken nuggets. But as soon as I stepped into the restaurant, I'd been feeling all weak. Whoever had been watching and harassing me was there and it didn't take long before I spotted him. It was the same employee I had seen on my night out with Angie and he was still staring at me with hate in his eyes. I'd pretty much had had enough of everything that had been happening at that point and I didn't care if I was confrontational. So immediately I walked up to him and asked, Hey man, do you have a problem with me? The employee whose name was John then looked at me and said, You don't deserve to be with her, you disgrace of a human being. His response told me all I needed to know as I was now sure he was the same person who had been stalking and harassing me all week. So I told him, what did I ever do to you, John, you sick freak? With rage in his eyes, John then responded with, What did you do? You opened your foul mouth to insult the prestigious food of the esteemed Chick-fil-A restaurant. I heard what you said, and I decided to teach you a lesson for that. John's words left me speechless, as it didn't make any sense why he would do all that, just over a couple of harmless jests. The man also had a crazy look in his eyes, so I assumed he was unhinged. I then took out my phone and told him, So you made my life a living hell just because I joked about your shitty food? Are you crazy? I'm calling the cops. But before I could dial the number, John attacked me. He threw a barrage of blows while he screamed the words, I'll kill you, over and over again. I tried to defend myself from his attacks, but the man was like an animal. I eventually managed to get away and I ran to my car. John followed me out of the restaurant so I opened my phone's camera to film the entire incident and have some hard evidence to show the cops. Once I entered my car and closed the door, John, who was frustrated, fiercely punched my car's window. I immediately called the cops from the safety of my car and John was arrested later that day. After some investigations into his background, it was revealed that John suffered from Intermittent Explosive Disorder, IED. Apparently, this disorder involves frequent episodes of impulsive anger that are out of proportion to the event that triggered it. More investigations also revealed John was an avid lover of the Chick-fil-A restaurant and their food, which is one of the major reasons why he worked there. He'd also been named Employee of the Month due to his dedication, and he cited this as one of the reasons why he couldn't stand by and let me insult the restaurant's food. The officers asked if I wanted to press charges, but even though I was extremely angry, as I didn't want to see his face anymore, and I just wanted to get him the help he so desperately needed. After the incident, I started to hear about some strange loyalty prices going on behind the scenes with their employees, but I never thought some of the employees would take it that far. I completely stopped going to the Chick-fil-A restaurant after that day, and my girlfriend Angie completely understood why. It's been a couple of years since this incident happened, but I still can't pass a Chick-fil-A restaurant without seeing John's angered face. And because of that, I always have this subconscious fear of being attacked by one of Chick-fil-A's loyal but crazy employee of the month. How many of you believe in demonic possession? I would say many of you enjoy watching those horror movies, but in real life, hardly anyone believes in things like demonic spirits or ghosts until they experience it firsthand. Being a horror freak, I did not miss a single horror movie. You name it. I must have seen it at some point. But like traumatic endings of some horror movies, my life too did not go as I planned, and I ended up working in the Burger King. My job was not even flipping the patties or taking the orders. Nope, I worked as a cleaner. I made sure the Burger King outlet was clean first thing in the morning and last thing in the evening. I mostly worked throughout the day picking up trash and trays left by people on the tables. I wiped the floors whenever necessary and washed the dishes whenever necessary. Every day, hundreds of people visit Burger King. But we have a nurse that works in a hospital opposite to us. She comes here for lunch every afternoon. And with her is her little daughter, Maria. Both of them come here almost every day. The majority of the staff members know these two and their orders by heart. Little Maria won't be more than five. She is a special child as she has mild autism and needs some medical care. Good for the little girl, her mother is a nurse. So every morning, 
Mary brings her daughter to the hospital with her for therapy, and every afternoon, they come here to grab a bite. Then she drives little Maria to her grandparents and returns to work. Never before this had I dealt with an autistic child. But Maria is pretty sweet and is friends with most of the staff. So she is not scared of us. But to comfort herself, she carries a little rag doll with her everywhere. They say it's to make her feel comfortable. The rag doll makes her feel grounded and safe in some ways, says her mom. Hell, what do I know? If the doll makes the kid happy, so be it. But now Mary is going to be six and most probably go to school. So her doctor and therapist thought that it's time she lets go of the toy. So for the last few weeks, they have been working on separating the doll from the child. So far, no success. She had the doll since she was born. It was gifted to her by her late grandmother. And by the condition of the doll, you could say that it has seen better days. Although the doctors are patient with the kid, Mary is not. She thought it would be best if she took the doll away from her daughter once and for all. Sure, she would cry and throw a hissy fit, but Mary was ready to handle it. Mary thought that Maria would get bullied in school if she carried a doll everywhere with her. Nonetheless, a very beaten up old doll. So the day Mary planned to do this, she brought Maria to our Burger King and ordered some extra food, especially the items Maria liked. Mary had planned to leave the doll behind in the Burger King and pretend that they had lost the doll so it would hurt Maria less. She had spoken to a few of the staff members about her plan, and we were all going to help Mary distract Maria. I was entrusted with the job of slowly sneaking off with the doll while Maria was busy eating. I had to make sure Maria does not notice me, or worse, catch me in the act. The day comes when we have to execute the plan. Little Maria enters the Burger King with her mother, and she looked tired from her daily therapy. One of her hands was holding her mother's and the other clutching the damn doll. They sit at their regular table and the waitress brings their food, the extra cheese fries and milkshake on its way. Maria is happy to see that her mom is treating her with all her favorite food items. She momentarily forgets her doll and that's when I go to their table pretending to take their empty trays and I pick up the doll too. Maria was so focused on her food that she did not notice her precious toy missing. But before I could discreetly return the doll to Mary, she got a phone call from the hospital. And she left in a rush, almost dragging little Maria behind her. The poor girl just grabbed her milkshakes and walked away with her mother. No thoughts about the doll. I guess that I was left taking care of the doll for the night. The next day when Maria and Mary would come, I had planned to return the doll to the girl's mother. In the meantime, I decided to keep the doll in the supply closet with all my cleaning stuff. The doll was so dirty that it fit right in there. I continued my shift and paid little attention to the doll. At around 10.30 when all the staff left and I was left with the responsibility to clean the restaurant and lock it up, I walked to the supply closet and opened it to grab my cleaning supplies. But surprisingly, the doll wasn't there. I searched through the closet and found it had fallen at the bottom. Instead of locking up the doll again, I decided to place it on a table and start working. I often clean the kitchen area first as it gets dirtier. Once I finish cleaning one area, I switch off the light and move to the next. I had placed the doll on a table close to the kitchen area, and once I was done cleaning it, I switched off the light, plunging the table into darkness. I continued cleaning, whistling to myself. That's when I see a moment through the corner of my eye. I instantly turn towards the table with the doll and freeze mid-cleaning. The doll was no longer laying flat on the table, but was standing and bent in a weird position. However, what scared me the most were the glowing red, orangish eyes that seemed to pierce through my soul. Next thing I know, the doll's head twists backward, and it's all like it's a horror movie. Instead of being a brave person, I just dropped my supplies and ran home. I did not even bother to lock the Burger King. The next morning when I reached the restaurant, the manager is already at my throat for being so careless and leaving the restaurant open. I explained to him what had happened, and he threw the rag doll which was still on the table at my face and fired me on the spot. But I knew that something was very wrong with the doll, and now I'm sitting on the sidewalk waiting for Mary with a doll in my hand and without a job. Now that I look at it, its button eyes and old frilly clothes are the same as they were before. No sign of any demonic possession. So is the doll really possessed, or is there a problem with my head? 
Have you ever had to close a food restaurant over the last shift? My name is Alex, and it happened to me while working at Taco Bell. This Taco Bell was pretty special, though. Since it was located in a very secluded town, I'd say it even operated by its own set of rules. Unlike the city Taco Bell, here we had fewer employees because, truth be told, we didn't need them. I was the newest of the bunch, and honestly, I liked the job. I had a good group of people, and everyone was very patient with me, even though I was a little clumsy. Everything was going well. I was learning the job very quickly, until one night, I was assigned to the night shift. Since the restaurant was so small, only one person stayed on the night shift to close it, and since I had already been working there for a few months, they trusted me. Closing the place wasn't hard. Just giving everything a final cleaning, putting up the chairs, and locking up. I didn't even have to worry about closing the cash register because that was done by a colleague before leaving. The only rule we had to respect without exception was that we had to leave before 11.15 p.m. It was forbidden. I mean, absolutely forbidden to stay on the premises after midnight. To tell the truth, I thought it was something bureaucratic, but I knew it was more to it than that. The manager used to be a very permissive and carefree person, but regarding this issue, he was categorical. When I asked the rest of the employees what the reason was for this, they seemed to know the answer, but they didn't want to tell me. They would always tell me that it was better to just obey him, that someday they would tell me. I closed a few times on the night shift, always obeying the one rule of not going over time. So I was trusted with the night shift more and more. Everything was going well until one fateful night, when by trusting me and not understanding that the time limit was put in place to protect me, I put my life at risk as I had never done before. That night, the restaurant was full. There was so much work. Luckily, my coworkers helped me. They moved several of my tasks forward so I could leave on time. When they left and the tables began to empty, I must admit that I made a terrible mistake. When cleaning the ice cream machine, I accidentally broke it and the ice cream started pouring out nonstop. To make matters worse, while trying to fix the ice cream machine, I kicked the bucket, flooding the entire restaurant. I felt like the clumsiest person in the world. I couldn't let this mess stay until tomorrow or I would surely get in trouble. Just for that night, I decided to stay a little longer to tidy up and pretend nothing had happened. My idea was to go over the deadline, but still finish before midnight. I hurried as fast as I could and finished cleaning up pretty quickly. I went on and on, and before I knew it, I was done. There was just one little problem. Oh no, it's 12.15. I wasn't going to tell anyone that this had happened to me, but at the same time, I couldn't stay in the restaurant for another minute. I tried to run to my locker to grab my things, but I tripped on the wet floor and fell to the ground. I hurt my arm in the fall, but that was no big deal. It was just a fall. The only problem was that it wasn't at all, because when I raised my head, something had changed. Suddenly, the good vibes in the restaurant disappeared, giving way to an atmosphere of enormous discomfort and the feeling that something was wrong. I don't know how to explain this. It was as if the air had changed. It was as if something was there with me, and that something was very oppressive. Scared, I raised my head. And that's when I saw it. A human figure, or at least it looked like one. But something was wrong. Its eyes were completely black, absorbing all the light around it, and its body, its body seemed to be withered impossibly. I blinked several times, thinking it was an illusion. Maybe there was a gas leak. Maybe I hurt my head without realizing it. The only thing I knew was that no matter what or who was still there, I should move away because what was in front of me looked very real and I didn't want to be a victim of that horrendous being. Before I could try to rationalize what was happening, I could see that the shadow began to move slowly in my direction. My heart was pounding so hard that I thought it would burst out of my chest. 
I tried to scream, but the words wouldn't come out. I backed away slowly, frozen with fear. That figure was moving its legs, but it had no reason to do so since it was floating. Little by little, it began to get closer and closer. Something prevented me from running as if this twisted and horrifying being was doing something to me. With a lot of effort, I managed to get up from the ground and try to walk, but things got even worse. Suddenly, I began to feel a strange pressure on my knee. The pressure became stronger and stronger and unbearable, and when I couldn't take the pain anymore, in a single second, my knee broke. I felt I had no more salvation. I started to crawl to the exit while crying in pain, praying that I had enough strength to make it alive for someone to save me. When I almost reached the exit door, my body froze completely. That being that was behind me got too close to me, and now he was only a few centimeters away from me. Having me at its mercy, the monster made a hand movement and suddenly I began to choke. It was as if my throat had temporarily stopped. No air was coming in or going out. I felt like I was going to die that very day. Suddenly, and to my rescue, the entrance door next to me opened violently, and without hesitation, he grabbed me and dragged me out of the room. Seeing his face, I realized it was someone I knew. It was my manager. I told you to get out before midnight. Wasn't I not clear enough? What? What was that? (sighs) We don't know what it is. We only know that it arrives at midnight and attacks whoever is in the place. But how come no one knows? How is this place still open? This is a secret. If you tell anyone, we'll all be out of work. Understand? But it's dangerous. Listen to me. We give work here to a lot of people who need it. Most of your colleagues have a family. We need this place. And as long as we respect the rules, nothing bad will happen. My manager's logic may be strange, but I must admit that I partly understood it. The situation of my coworkers and the people in this town is not the best. So having a place like Taco Bell is very good. Besides, I've been here for several months, and to be honest, nothing has ever happened to me before. I kept working there, but I learned to respect the rules. Every night at 11.15 p.m., I would leave everything ready to leave quickly when the time came. It didn't matter if there was any work to be done. I never encountered that entity again. But the lesson was clear. There are things in this world that we cannot understand. And sometimes, it is better not to challenge the unknown. Since then, my mental clock has been set to leave any place before midnight. Hi, I'm Parker Jovis, and I and my two teammates are paranormal investigators. I know that you have heard stories about another paranormal investigator called Harrison on this channel. But today, I am about to tell you the stories of my team's paranormal investigation. We are a team of three, myself, Sarah our psychic, and Andrew our cameraman. We too, like Harrison, investigate haunted locations and help people facing paranormal incidents. Last summer we investigated a haunted Starbucks. I know you must be thinking, of all the places, a haunted Starbucks? But yeah. It was the most interesting and one of the most challenging cases we have faced. So this was Starbucks in a mall. And I know you must be thinking, how could a Starbucks in a mall be haunted? Aren't there people like this all the time? Well, that's what makes this case so special. The first incident was reported by a barista named Kelly. She was closing up the cafe when she heard a noise in the back room. When she checked, she saw one of the employees going through their pantry. She tried to tell her colleague that she was closing up, so he needed to leave. But this colleague continued to go through the pantry. However, when she looked to the left, there was no reflection of this colleague in the metal door of the fridge. Kelly freaked and reported the incident to the manager and their staff members. No one believed her. However, when similar incidents started happening with other staff members, 
The manager took note of the incidents and decided to contact us. Now, after listening to the experiences of the staff, we stepped in and decided to conduct our investigation at night when the mall shuts down. The first thing we did when we entered the Starbucks, we shut the doors and locked ourselves inside. We set up night vision and thermal cameras all over. Then we finally began our investigation. We decided to spread out and try to detect any EMF, electromagnetic field changes with the use of our devices. Now, let me tell you, this Starbucks was huge. It had almost 25 tables and a big counter to take people's orders and serve them. As we split up, Sarah went into the farthest corner. I stayed near the door and Andrew went behind the counter and the back rooms. For an hour or so, there was no activity at all. We were trying to communicate with the spirits by asking them questions, but we did not get any response. We almost concluded that the place wasn't haunted as we weren't able to detect anything. That's when Andrew busted out of the back door into the main cafe. He was breathless as if he had run a long marathon. He wasn't able to formulate any sentences as he gasped for air. Never in our years of practice had we seen this man so scared. What happened, Andrew? You okay? I asked. Parker, Sarah, I, I saw Parker inside. I knew for sure he was out, but I saw him standing in one of the back rooms going through the pantry. How is that possible? You might have seen the spirit, Andrew, Sarah suggested. Yes, I knew the spirit was trying to mess with me, but then it suddenly changed its shape and looked like you, Sarah. I think we are dealing with a shape-shifting spirit here. We need to be very careful. Andrew warned us all. Never had we before dealt with a shape-shifting spirit. While Andrew sat at the table and caught his breath, I and Sarah kept investigating. While I was covering the grounds for both Andrew and me now, I noticed Sarah staring into space for a while, as if she was in a haze. Sarah, what are you looking at? I asked her. Without saying anything, she just pointed in the direction of a glass wall that separated the Starbucks from the sidewalk in the mall. When I looked in that direction, I saw Sarah standing right there with a creepy smile on her face. But I knew the one pointing towards the sidewalk was real Sarah, and the one standing by the sidewalk was the shape-shifting spirit that was messing with us by taking Sarah's form. It was the weirdest thing I had ever seen. And looking at the real Sarah, shell-shocked looking at her creepy version just out there, was the scariest shit I had to witness. I just held Sarah's hand and made her sit down beside Andrew, who was still recovering from what he had experienced. Now it was just me battling the spirit, as both of my teammates were down. Parker, I think we should give up this investigation, man. It's just too much for us to handle. We have never dealt with anything like this before, Andrew suggested. We can't give up now, Andrew. We need to see this through or else the spirit could harass the staff even more. So what are you going to do as I'm not stepping into the back rooms again? I think I may have to go in there and see for myself. I pulled out the cross that was hidden under my collar for so long. I started saying my prayers and entered the back rooms with my EMF device. Instantly, it started blinking, which meant the spirit was right there with me in the back room. I kept walking towards the infamous pantry, and as soon as I reached the pantry, all the refrigerator doors opened automatically. The one nearest to me hit me in the head. My EMF device slipped out of my hand and fell a few feet away, beeping to its maximum potential. I reached under my collar to grab my cross necklace. That's when I realized it was missing. Without my necklace, I felt powerless. The spirit must have sensed me. It might have felt me weaken. However, I spotted Sarah by the door. She looked concerned. Are you okay, Parker? Yeah, I'm fine, but I lost my necklace, the one with the cross on it. Instantly, a sinister smile crept on Sarah's face. I knew at that moment that this was not actually Sarah, but the spirit was manifesting as her. I walked back closer to the pantry not knowing what to do as the spirit in the form of Sarah approached me. As closer it got, I noticed how the eyes had changed color. This was definitely not Sarah. You think you can banish me, boy? It spoke in a weird, almost robotic but manly voice. I did not answer. Instead, I started praying again. 
This was the only way out of this situation. Evil Sarah was almost a foot away from me when a voice from behind said, He may not be able to, but I can. I was so relieved looking at the person standing by the door. Harrison had definitely saved my life by just being there. He had my cross necklace in his hand along with some other holy objects. He started chanting prayers and I could see the spirit lose its form and its powers. I just stood there looking at the scene before my eyes. Harrison was pretty good at his job and within minutes there were only me and Harrison in the back rooms. No sign of the spirit. Harrison encouraged me to walk out with him. Sarah and Andrew were just where I had left them. I called Harrison as I had a feeling you would need help, Sarah said. And at that moment, I was extremely grateful to Sarah. If she would not have acted in time, I would have died. This was the last case we took as a team of three. Therefrom, we assisted Harrison in his missions. A strange man entered the bar and sat at a table in a secluded part of the room. He was a heavyset man with large eyes and shifted uncomfortably in his chair. He looked tired and irritable and yet was carefully observing everything that was happening around him. His eyes darted back and forth at all the customers and then shifted towards the girls waiting tables. I immediately felt a chill when his eyes locked with mine. There was something about him that made me feel very uneasy. He lifted his hand and gestured me to come to him. He kept looking at me as I reluctantly approached him. I have been a Hooters girl for a little over four years now. The work has had its share of high and lows while I navigated my way through medical school. But it has helped me pay my bills while also allowing me to look after my five-year-old nephew. Anyways, this was increasingly looking like one of those uncomfortable nights at the workplace. Welcome to Hooters. I am Stacy. What can I get you? I asked. He continued to stare at me in the face for a while and finally growled back, beer and chicken wings. I smiled and nodded. Even as I turned back to place the order, I could feel his gaze fall upon me, like he was measuring my every move. Creepy. He had a voracious appetite, cleaned out five plates of wings and chugged half a dozen bottles of beer. When I finally approached him with the bill, he asked, how much? That would be $147, I said. I meant, how much for the night? I am not that kind of girl and this isn't that kind of place either. I replied back calmly. This was not the first time a drunk customer was making a lewd pass at me. I placed the bill at his table and he suddenly caught my hand. Where do you live? You have nothing to worry about. It's just single night of fun. No harm done, right? He smiled back to reveal two missing front teeth. I yanked my hand away from his grasp and reported the incident to my manager. He was quickly escorted out of the building after being made to foot the bill. He looked back at me one final time before heading out. When my shift finally ended, I was exhausted. I packed some dinner for my nephew and got out of the restaurant to get to my car. As I was walking in the parking lot, I saw an old black sedan with tinted windows slowly go past me. I got in my car and started driving. It looked like the same sedan I had seen in the parking lot. Was this the same guy who was at the bar? I thought to myself while also panicking at the same time. I stepped on the gas to create more distance between me and the other car. The sedan picked up in speed as well. Every time I slowed, the driver also slowed, and when I hit the accelerator, he did the same. I was being followed, there was no doubt. I slowed down at a traffic signal when the light turned red. Luckily, the sedan and I were separated by another car in between. I sped off before the light turned green and kept driving without stopping. A few moments later, when I looked back in the rearview mirror, there was no sign of the sedan anymore. I had a huge sigh of relief. As I kept driving, I suddenly felt a piercing pain run through my body. The sedan appeared out of nowhere and crashed into my side window. As the black sedan crushed into my car, I caught a glimpse of the driver for a split second. He was the same man who I saw at the bar with a frightening smile on his face. I woke up from my bed with beads of sweat dripping down my face. I ran my hands over my body to check if I was hurt. It was a dream. I then slowly looked at the clock and realized it was already 7 a.m. 
I was running late for medical school and my nephew was late for his school as well. Woke up, got my nephew, got him ready and prepared a quick breakfast for the two of us. As I saw my nephew Rudy enter the building, thoughts of the recent years flashed before my eyes. Rudy was the son of my sister Emily. Emily and I were inseparable as kids, but had a falling out in our late teens. As a result, I had cut off all contact with my sister. So after not talking to her for more than seven years, it was a shock for me when I received a call from Child Services asking if I would take in Rudy. Emily had died in an accident and they could not trace Rudy's father. To have not been a part of her life all these years and to find out about her son in this manner really broke my heart. I felt a huge pang of guilt when I learned of her demise and it remains the biggest regret of my life. As I reached the medical college, I rushed to the lab to be in time for class. All the students were already assembled around a table and listening to the professor. As I inched closer to get a better look, my face turned white. I was looking at the naked, lifeless body of the man who came to the bar last night. There was a huge knife wound in his chest. What on earth is going on? Why is this man repeatedly coming into my life in the most bizarre ways? As I was beginning to question my own sanity, the professor took a scalpel in his hand and asked all of us to lean forward to get a closer look. A wave of uneasiness enveloped me. It was bad enough to face abuse from this pervert, but now I have to see him get medically disemboweled? I suddenly felt like vomiting and I cupped my mouth with my hands to prevent any sort of gag reflex. As the professor worked on his intestines, I could hold no longer and I barked all over John Doe. My morning's breakfast of cereal and oats forming a nice little puddle in the place where once his stomach was. When I slowly lifted my head, I could see the professor looking at me speechless and horror-stricken. He then came to his senses, his face turning a deep crimson red. He started yelling at me at the top of his voice. I became even more pale as his voice echoed through the entire building. I could feel like I was going to faint as my legs began to give away. My batchmates caught hold of me before I fell to the floor and helped me get to the cafeteria. They gave me some electrolytes to deal with the nausea. After a few minutes, I felt much better even though I was still shaken from the episode. I then received a phone call from my nephew's school. It seems there was some large suspicious man looking around the school for my nephew. The panic started once again. Who is at that school now? I am the only family Rudy has anymore. So why would anybody come looking for him? And who was the man lying dead in the cadaver lab? What on earth is going on? I kept repeating to myself as I rushed towards my car. When I reached the school, Rudy was sitting by the principal's office. The man who had come asking for him had left abruptly when the principal insisted on calling me first. I was relieved to find Rudy safe and thank the teachers for being vigilant. I decided to take Rudy back home. Fear and paranoia were gripping me. It was a crazy day, and I could do with some rest before contemplating my next course of action. As I opened the door to my apartment, I could feel my heart stop in my chest. The man was standing in my living room. He had tossed my home and was clearly looking for something. He saw me standing by the door, and my nephew was there as well. An evil grin appeared on his face. As I thought of fleeing, he lunged quickly at me, caught me by the hair, and pulled me back into the apartment. He slapped me so hard that I crashed into a piece of furniture. He then reached for my nephew and growled. Where is it? Where is it, little boy? Where is that musical box? My nephew started crying. I don't know, he cried out loud. I don't know any box. He was weeping as he was speaking. Don't play with me, stupid boy, he growled back. Where is the musical box your mother left you? He added as he cornered Rudy and pinned him against the wall. He was really hurting my nephew now. For the first time, things began to make sense. When I received a call from Child Services following Emily's death and met Rudy for the first time, he was holding onto a small music box. It was his most prized possession. He never let go of it and carried it with him every day to school as well. I saw Rudy's backpack strewn on the floor. The box must definitely be inside. Should I tell the guy about it to save our lives? Or will he kill us both after getting his hands on it? Then I saw he was carrying a gun in the small of his back. I slowly scrambled to my feet and lunged at him with all my might. Both of us hit the ground as I fell on top of him. 
I managed to lift the gun from his trousers and pointed it at him. Do you even know how to use that thing? I wouldn't recommend you to do anything stupid or you will be really sorry. Who are you? What do you want with us? I asked him with the gun still pointed at him. He slowly began to move forward. Stop right there or I will shoot, I yelled back. But he lunged at me and I fired two shots. We both crashed to the floor, his massive frame on top of me as he lay there lifeless. I tried to wiggle free, but he was a heavy man. I could see a puddle of blood forming around us. Rudy came running towards me to help, and with great difficulty, I managed to break free from him. I then called the cops. When the police came, I learned about the identity of the man. He was Tony Sanchez and a notorious bank robber. He also had a twin brother by the name of Curtis Sanchez. Both of the Sanchez brothers were arrested following a heist, but the authorities never managed to recover the stolen loot. The police also recovered a small folder from a black sedan parked near my apartment, which of course belonged to Tony. It had a picture of Curtis and Emily who was cradling an infant Rudy in her arms. Curtis was killed during his stint in prison when he got involved in a gang fight. The body I saw in the lab must have been that of Curtis. There was also a picture of me and Emily smiling. So that is how Tony managed to track me down following his release. He was in some way looking to recover his stash. After the police left, Rudy and I took the music box from the bag. I closely inspected it to see if there was something valuable about it. Rudy then pressed a button which opened a secret compartment. Inside was a small key which looked like it belonged to some safety locker. There also was a slip of paper which contained a bank name and account number. The following day, I tracked down the bank location and got the safety locker opened. There was a small pouch inside. It was full of diamonds. Flame broiled beef on a Whopper is what put Burger King on the map since 1953. Hi, I'm Dylan, and I've been a regular customer of Burger King since I was on solids. And now, I have just been promoted to manager at the one I work at. My co-worker Tracy is much older than me and hates that I am the manager, and she isn't. She's been trying to sabotage my position for weeks, but she went to an extent none of us could have imagined. Looking back now, I feel like I should have seen it coming. Tracy was angry, but she wasn't dangerous. At least, that's what I thought. She made comments and threats, but never followed through. One night, my other co-worker Kyle and I were working the late shift with Tracy. Kyle was on drive through duty while Tracy and I made the orders. She cooked the food and I wrapped it. Everything was going normal and we were flowing as a team. The dinner rush had settled down and we took some time to clean the restaurant. The lobby was near closing when two customers, a man and a woman, walked in. They appeared to be a couple. Tracy was mopping the lobby when she looked at them. We're closing the lobby. Get out of here. The man shot her a menacing look. It doesn't close for another 15 minutes. You don't have to be so rude. You need to leave. I came out from my office. Tracy, you can't talk to customers that way. Are you the manager? Yes. I apologize for the manner in which my employee has spoken to you. I don't take orders from you. Tracy, if you think this behavior is going to get you sent home early, you've got another thing coming. Kyle came from around the counter. What's going on out here? Tracy is trying to chase off customers before we closed the lobby. The woman looked at us. Excuse me, we would like to order now? Kyle nodded and went behind the counter to take the order. As a bit of a punishment for Tracy, I made her go to the kitchen and put their order together, which turned out to be rather hefty. They ordered six triple whoppers with extra cheese and pickles, six orders of french fries, and six Oreo milkshakes. As I expected, she was pissed at me, but I didn't care. She's lucky I didn't fire her for talking to customers like that. She did what I told her to do, cursing me the entire time. I gave their order to them and they went out the door. We cleaned up and Tracy left while I gave Kyle a ride home. The next day, I was called to come into work and talk to my boss face to face. When I got to work, I was surprised to see the crime scene tape was wrapped around the building and the police were there. My stomach dropped as Mariah, my boss, approached me. Dylan, the office, please. I nodded and followed her in where she closed the door. You had two customers late last night just before closing. Dylan, 
Those customers were in an accident last night. An autopsy was performed this morning and traces of rat poison was found in their system. They were dead before the car crashed. I fell to my knees in shock. How did... What? Rat poison? As manager of this Burger King, they are holding you responsible and they're questioning Kyle and Tracy. Tracy, could she have really stooped so low? I put Tracy in charge of making their order last night. She had to have done it. She's been trying to sabotage me ever since I got promoted. I'm sorry, Dylan, but that doesn't prove anything. This is part of the heavy responsibility that comes with being a manager. We discussed this. I understand. Until this is resolved, I have no choice but to shut down the location. I left the office and agreed to go to the police station for questioning. After a series of questions that I answered to the best of my knowledge, Kyle and Tracy were brought in for questioning too. A few weeks had gone by and we were able to open up the restaurant again. There was still no knowledge of who put the rat poison in the food, but the owner now has a mandatory bag check as employees go in and out. I wanted to apologize to Tracy and hopefully come to an understanding. Her favorite item on the menu was the bacon whopper and a chocolate milkshake. I bought them for her and even made them myself to give to her. When she was on her break, I invited her to sit with me in the lobby and we could eat together. Tracy, I know that it seems backwards to be working under me. I want to know how I can earn your respect as a boss. She took a large bite of the burger and let out a sound of delight. <laughs> Buying me lunch every day is a start. I laughed. I want to apologize for making you handle that big order that night by yourself. That was petty and unfair. Thank you. I forgive you. She smiled and took a sip of her shake. She went to say something else when she began foaming at the mouth. Tracy started coughing violently and fell to the floor puking her guts out. Tracy! Oh God! Somebody call an ambulance! I looked around, and to my horror, all of our guests in the lobby were on the floor like Tracy, puking and foaming. What the hell was going on? Kyle called the cops, and we were shut down once again. Because of the food I prepared for Tracy being poisoned, I was framed and arrested for the murder of that couple, Tracy and all our guests who ate our food that day. Kyle came to visit me in prison. We sat out a window and talked over the phone. I'm sorry you got arrested, man. It's not your fault. I swore it was Tracy who put rat poison in their food that night. Until she died, right in front of me. Tracy was mad about answering to you, but she wasn't a killer. Neither are you. Who do you think did it? Kyle suddenly got really quiet. I did. My eyes went wide. You? Yes, me. And to think, you are the one behind bars, not me. He began to laugh maniacally. I sat there shocked. So many questions. Yet, I couldn't speak. The police monitored the phone lines, and Kyle was immediately arrested. He confessed to slipping rat poison into the food while Tracy went to grab more pickles from the fridge that night. When he failed to frame her, he used me to poison her and admitted to slipping rat poison into the food that day. I wanted to apologize to her when he came in with me to open the restaurant. Kyle admitted to wanting to know what it felt like to kill people. I was released from prison, and I cannot bring myself to set foot inside another Burger King anymore. Hey, my name is Gene. Like most of you, I love pizza. There's nothing better to eat on a Saturday than a huge pizza, right? Well, now I'll tell you something we certainly do not have in common. I never order pizza delivery. I always go to pick it up because since that rainy day, I don't want anything to do with pizza delivery guys. That day, it was a normal day. Don't confuse me. I was looking forward to Saturday. Those days I stayed home watching horror movies and started pizza. But then again, that's what I did every Saturday. I have a lot of friends, but after a week of studying and working, I usually want to relax. That rainy day, I did the same thing I always do. I ordered pizza and prepared a horror movie. I was waiting for the pizza to arrive, but to my surprise, a few minutes after I ordered it, the delivery guy was already at my door. When I went to open the door, I had a very bad feeling. There was something wrong with the pizza delivery guy. 
His eyes were focused on me. He was staring at me in a very nervous way. The man was breathing very heavily and wasn't even looking to protect himself from the rain. He was just standing under him, staring at me. Before I opened the door, I asked the man to wait for a moment as I had forgotten my keys. He didn't answer me. He just stared at me in a frightening way, smiling a big smile. Once I entered my house, I quickly called the pizzeria and asked him if my order had gone out. If this was one of his delivery men, I was shocked by their response. The girl at the pizzeria said no. She told me that they are running late. She told me that they are running late because of the rain and they didn't even start making it. Before I could answer her, the phone was cut off along with the power. I was totally in the dark. I looked out quickly to see if the man was still in the rain waiting for me. But no, there was no one outside. There was no one outside. I went to look for my cell phone, but it was totally out of charge. I always had this terrible habit of letting the battery run out and just charging it at that moment. But this time, I would really pay the consequences of that. I went to the kitchen and looked for a knife to defend myself. Was I being paranoid? Was it all just a huge coincidence? No, it couldn't be. The man tried to deliver a pizza that wasn't meant for me. He knew I had ordered it, but still, it could be a joke. Surely the light would be back soon. As if to answer my question, I heard glass breaking and ran into the dining room. The window was open. Someone had smashed it with a rock and used his hand to open it. In the darkness, I could see parts of my dining room wet. Someone came in from outside. I was not alone. I thought about going outside and running out into the rain. But what if it was a trap? What if that scary person was waiting for me outside? I began to ask myself what I should do, and I paid for that doubt dearly. A man came out of the darkness and started choking me from behind. Why was he doing this to me? I had no problems with anyone. I had never made any enemies, nor was I conspicuous enough to be attacked. I struggled to free myself and managed to push the man away, who only took a step back with a big smile on his face. At that moment, I realized that the man wasn't squeezing too hard. I don't think I got free on my own. He let me go. I ran desperately towards the broken window, but before I got there, I fell backward. The man behind me was not the only pizza delivery man. There were about five more coming through the window. The men grabbed me and dragged me to the center of the dining room. The light illuminated them enough that they could see me perfectly. I was surrounded. I had no way out of this. Synchronistically, everyone opened their pizza boxes and pulled out markers from inside. As if they had done it before, they began to draw symbols on my body in a perfectly synchronized manner. My body started to burn a lot, not because their strange ritual was working, but because they were passing the markers with such force and violence that it felt like it was burning my whole body. The pain became more and more intense until from one second to the next, I stopped feeling it. I began to lose consciousness and fade away at the mercy of these terrifying men, knowing that I might never wake up again. But to my surprise, I did. When I opened my eyes, there was a pizza delivery man in front of me, but he wasn't evil. He was Wally, the pizza delivery guy I had originally ordered was standing in front of me, soaking wet and calling the police. Once the police arrived, there was no sign of the men. Although I had no ring door camera, many neighbors filmed these people, but the police could never find them. From that day on, I never felt alone again. I feel watched at all times, and sometimes I know I am. Sometimes I see people spying on me in the street. They don't even try to hide that they see me. They just do it. Unfortunately, this is not the worst of my worries. Since that day, I feel that something else is stalking me. A presence that appears in my house when I am in the dark. Something that takes more and more shape and is getting closer and closer to catching me. I try not to think about it, to always be with people and never be in the dark. But every time someone wants to order pizza, I remember that horrible rainy night and I tell them no. We can order pizza, 
but I'll be the one to go get it. I have been working at Burger King for the past three years. I have two teenage daughters to look after and a mortgage to pay. But due to lack of high paying jobs, I am stuck working at this fast food restaurant chain for so many years, despite having a degree. Most of the time, this is not such a bad place to work, but there is a man who has made all our lives hell. Now, you must think this man is our manager. But surprisingly, our manager is a lady who is super nice and understanding. However, there is a regular customer who loves to harass us, especially the female staff members. His name is Mr. Beck, and he is the fattest man I have ever seen. Not that I'm fat phobic or anything, but this dude is a creep. I'll describe this guy so you can paint a picture. So, this dude is very fat. He always wears a three-piece suit with a tie and all. However, he cannot walk on his own, as his legs cannot take his body's weight. So, he uses an automated wheelchair that he can control with a control near his hands. He is bald and as pale as snow, and wears expensive shoes and watches. Everyone knows he is loaded, but instead of eating some good food, he prefers eating two burgers, large fries, and a large chocolate milkshake from Burger King. But that's not even the worst part. Because he is our regular customer, our manager expects us to give him special treatment. And in the beginning, we weren't against it. However, the more familiar he got with us, the worse he behaved. For example, we often reserve a table for him, or at least make sure the one nearest the exit is available for him. We also bring him his food. Whenever a waitress brings him his order, he tried to grope her or touch her inappropriately. He had pulled this stunt so many times that now only the male members of the staff served him. He also passed lewd comments at some of the younger girls. However, he never did it around our manager. So even if we complained about him, our manager used to ask us to adjust a bit. However, this one time, he crossed the line. As all the male waiters were busy, a new girl who had started working there had to bring him his food. Now, I myself have two daughters, and this girl was like a little sister to me. Hey, you look new here, gorgeous. Mr. Beck said to Myla, the new girl. Not knowing anything about this creep, the poor girl replied. Yeah, are you a regular here? Yeah, I am. Mr. Beck said with a mouthful of burgers and fries. Nice to meet you. Now I'll leave you to it. Myla pointed to his food, smiled, and started to walk away. But just then, the man wrapped his fat, chunky hand around Myla's waist and pulled her into his lap. Before the poor girl could make out what was happening, Mr. Beck goes, If you sit on my lap and feed me this food, I will give you a hundred bucks. <laughs> then he started laughing like a maniac. Myla sat there frozen for a second, looking at us all behind the counter. Then she started struggling against his hole while the huge man laughed. All I could see was red. I instantly went over the counter and freed Myla from his grasp. The young waitress hugged me and started crying. You need to leave, sir, or else we will be forced to call the cops. Oh, you think you can get me arrested, miss? What are you, a mere waitress? You think you can get a man like me behind bars? I knew it was wrong to comment on someone's size, but this time I couldn't hold myself back. I had to give him a fighting comeback. Well, looking at you, I don't think you'd fit in a single jail cell. But I'm sure the cops could starve you enough to put you in one. This got the whole restaurant laughing. Everyone had seen what this man had done, and none of them were about to pity him. But I could see the rage in the man's eyes. He flipped his food tray, and in seconds, there were fries, pieces of bread, and chicken along with some spilled milkshake all over the floor and his table. You, you think you can humiliate, humiliate me, you, you bitch? Now Mr. Beck was yelling at me. In one instant, he tried to get up from his wheelchair, but the fat man couldn't take a single step and fell face first into the mess he himself had created mere minutes ago. This got another round of laughter from everyone. Even Milo was giggling. But before anything more could happen, there were cops in the Burger King, and after hearing about the incident, the cops helped the man into the chair and arrested him. 
More of the staff members stepped forward and complained about his harassment, and he was forever banned from Burger King. Now all the staff members were very relieved. Even our manager supported us after the shit that went down. After that day, we never saw the fat Mr. Beck in the Burger King again. It was like a hex was lifted from our restaurant. However, a few weeks later, someone anonymous started ordering the same order Mr. Beck used to order. This order was to be left at the door of a big mansion. None of the delivery boys saw who picked up the order, but every day in the evening around 5, the order used to be placed. Everyone was sure it was Mr. Beck, as he was, according to Daphne, one of our waitresses, addicted to junk food. But we didn't care much, as no one had to deal with the fat man anymore. However, one day, when the delivery boy delivered the order, which we thought to be Mr. Beck's, he returned and told us that the food he delivered yesterday was still by the door, which meant Mr. Beck had not eaten his order. Or he must have forgotten it. Some of the staff members even joked that the fat lad must have croaked with all the eating he does. We all laughed it off. But the next day, the delivery boy said that the food from the last two days was still by the door. This got us a bit concerned. However, if he was indeed dead, then who was making the phone call to order the food every day? We all hated the man a lot, so we did not think much of it that evening as well. But when the delivery boy reported the same thing the next day, our manager decided to call the cops and report the incident. Initially, the cops did not think it was serious either, because we were receiving the payment for each order on our online payment portal. But when this continued for five consecutive days, we requested the cops to take a look. Just to be sure everything was okay, I and my manager decided to go to the mansion while the cops checked it out. One of the cops decided to check through the windows when the owner of the mansion, whom we thought was Mr. Beck, did not answer the door. As soon as he peeked inside through the glass, he yelled for backup. Soon, there was a bunch of cops and paramedics breaking into the mansion, all while I and our manager were standing there clueless. Oh yeah, this is his mansion. His full name is Mr. Lambert Beckham. And didn't anyone tell you what's going on? No, officer. Well, looks like this dude died of a stroke weeks ago. Plus, he kind of choked on a fry. Could not get to his milkshake and due to the fear of choking, died of a stroke and finally dies. But that's not even the worst part. There are like a dozen cats of multiple breeds in there and he wasn't able to feed them for a week. These felines ate half the dead man. The medics will take whatever is left of his body. Looks like the cats didn't starve themselves and didn't mind eating their owner. Saying that, the officer left and I and our manager just waited there not knowing what to do. A few minutes later, there was a strong rotten stench in the air. And then we spotted the medics carry some remains of what looked like a half-eaten Mr. Beck on a stretcher. I kid you not, that was the worst thing I had ever seen in my 35 years of life. Looked like the man got what he deserved after all. To anyone listening to this, every word of the experience you're about to hear is true. Due to security and privacy reasons, I won't be disclosing my real name, so I'll identify as Sean in this story. For most of my life, I've suffered from a particular form of crippling fear, and this morbid experience will tell you why. The word masculophobia is not used very often when diagnosing the cause of fear in adults. For those of you who don't know what this means, masculophobia is the irrational fear of people in costume clothing like masks or mascots. Now, this phobia is normally seen in toddlers and young children as their minds are too small to understand the concepts of mascots. Naturally, with age, almost every child grows out of the phobia as their minds develop. That's why this phobia is rarely seen in adults, as our brains and bodies are fully developed to understand what mascots are. Now, after explaining all of this, what I'm about to tell you will seem very strange because at 62 years of age, I still suffer terribly from this fear. To make things a bit clearer, I have a pretty peculiar form of masculophobia, as I'm not actually scared of every single person in a costume or mascot. 
No. To be honest, I'm only scared of a particular one. To understand why I have this phobia, I will have to take you back to the year 1983. I had just gotten a job working at a nearby Domino's pizza restaurant. Now, in the late 1990s, numerous chain restaurants were popping up everywhere, and in order to stand out and gain popularity for their products, numerous advertising methods were used. Out of all these methods, the most popular and effective ones were the creation of mascots. Nowadays, these iconic mascots have become synonyms with these restaurants, as I'm sure everyone knows these names. Ronald McDonald became the face of the McDonald's restaurant in the year 1963. Wendy Thomas became the face of the Wendy's restaurant in the year 1967. And Chuck E. Cheese became the face of the Chuck E. Cheese restaurant in the year 1977. The trend of mascots just went up from there, as every massive restaurant chain in the fast food industry really wanted to boost the popularity of their products. Now, in the year 1986, Domino's Pizza, which was already a massive fast food chain at the time, wanted to hop on the mascot trend. Those of you who were born in the late 1990s or early 2000s may not remember this, as in recent times, the Domino's Pizza restaurant has no notable mascot. But believe it or not, we used to have one, and it was called the Noid. The Noid was created in the year 1986 for Domino's by Will Vinton's Studios. The character looked like what seemed to be a humanoid rabbit, dressed in a red onesie and had a black N on its chest. I had already spent three years working for Domino's in a Shambly, Georgia branch before the character was introduced. I recall seeing the character everywhere as it became pretty popular. Numerous advertisements were made for the character and the catchphrase, avoid the Noid, was coined. This was because, at the time, Domino's promised a 30-minute delivery guarantee, and in the televised ads, the character was known for trying to interfere with or delay the pizza delivery. Throughout the next three years, the character gained more popularity as toys, merchandise, and video games were created. As a Domino's employee, I remember being constantly surrounded by this new character called The Noid, and it didn't take long before I eventually grew fond of it as I bought and collected any toys or video games that I could get my hands on. The affinity I had for this character just grew from there as I was always waiting for new Noid related items to drop. But all that love came to an abrupt end on the 30th of January, 1989. That Monday morning started out like the rest of my mornings. I wasn't actually supposed to work that day, but one of my fellow employees called in sick, so I had to fill in for him. I got there by 9 a.m., and I was greeted by my coworker. I will not be able to give out her real name, so she will be identified as Katie in this story. After exchanging pleasantries, we immediately got to work, and it wasn't until 11 a.m. that our morning took a drastic turn. A strange man had just walked into the restaurant, and I remember opening my mouth to greet him before I saw him point a gun at my face. I had seen scenes like this in the movies numerous times, but nothing could have prepared me for that moment. No words can explain how I felt when I found myself staring down the gun's barrel. The armed man then slowly looked at me and Katie as he said, If you don't want to know what the inside of your heads look like, I suggest you walk towards me with your hands where I can see them. You're both going to be my hostages. Me and Katie didn't say a word as we did exactly what he asked us to do. Our attacker then grabbed us as he said, Don't look at me like that. You're all his accomplices. Him and everyone here. You've all ruined my life. Katie, who was far braver than me, managed to stutter the words. Please, sir. You've got the wrong people. We don't know who you're talking about. Enraged, the man then screamed. Don't lie to me. You all know Tom Monahan. Shut your lying mouth. The name Tom Monahan did ring a bell, as he was the creator and owner of the Domino's Pizza Restaurant but we had never actually met him in real life. Katie then started to say something about us never meeting him when the strange man cut her off screaming. He stole my name without my permission and used it to create a useless mascot. I remember being so confused as I had no idea what he was talking about. But as I traced his eyes, I realized that he was looking at 
the Noid figurines that I brought in that morning with a lot of hate in his eyes. I then watched as he threw them off the table and smashed them into bits. When he was done, he had a pained look on his face as he said, My life has been a living hell ever since those commercials came out. He's been telling people to avoid the Noid, to avoid me, and no one has done anything about it. The man then noticed the Noid-themed wristband that I had on as he said, So you're one of them? You're one of the numerous bullies who support this character? Well, guess what, you bastard? You're gonna die for liking the character that took everything away from me. And with that, he punched me in the mouth. I hadn't been in many fights throughout my life, so I didn't know how to take the punch. The impact of the blow made me fall headfirst into a pile of the now broken Noid figurines, and I can never forget how I felt that day as I saw the blood from my busted lip drip onto the broken head of a Noid figurine. I remember asking myself, what had I done to deserve this? Up to that point in my life, I always thought that I would die of old age. But never in a million years did I think I would be killed for something as trivial as supporting or liking a mascot. The man then pointed the gun at my head as he told me, But before I kill you, I need you to do something for me. He ordered me to stand up as he forced me and Katie towards the restaurant's phone. He then pointed the gun at my head as he told me to call Domino's headquarters. I immediately dialed the number, and when the call went through, he took the phone from me and said, I currently have two of your employees as my hostages, and I'm ready to blow their brains out unless you bring me $100,000 in cash and a white limousine to get away from this dump. And just to show you how serious I am, I'm going to give you a little show. The man then lifted his weapon and fired four shots into the floor. The sound of gunfire alerted the people listening to the call, and the cops were called. Within minutes, the restaurant was surrounded and attempts were made to negotiate for our freedom. The cops called the man on the restaurant's phone and asked who he was and why he was doing this. The man then responded with, My name is Kenneth Lamar Noyd, and I'm doing all of this because of everything the owner of this filthy restaurant has done to me. The cops who were shocked now asked the man what the owner supposedly did to him. Mr. Kenneth then responded with, the man gang-stalked me. I know because I saw him doing it and he broke into my own home without my permission. So you better bring what I ask for or I'm going to kill them. The man then threateningly pointed his gun at my head and I remember for the first time that day, I wasn't scared by the gun that was being pointed at my head. No, what frightened me was actually the insane look in his eyes as I knew then and there that this man was mentally unstable. My assumptions about his mental state were further proved, as when he was asked what he wanted to be given in exchange for our freedom, the man said, I'm willing to give you one of my hostages, the woman called Katie, if you can provide me with a book called The Widow's Son. The officers, who were clearly shocked at his request, said nothing as they agreed to get the book. After a while, the book was retrieved, and when he was asked to release Katie, the man said, I don't want the book anymore. So the deal's off. Confused by his erratic behavior, the cops tried to reason with the man, but nothing worked. Over four hours had passed now, and things had remained the same. I remember how heightened my anxiety levels were as I struggled not to pass out. As I watched things play out, my fear began to rise higher as I knew being held hostage by an insane person was far worse than a normal hostage situation. I could tell Katie was scared, but she was much more composed as she knew we couldn't both break down. It had been six hours now and we still hadn't gotten anywhere. That's when Mr. Kendrick looked at us and said, No, it's been a while and I need you both to be good hostages. So go and make me two special pizzas. At first, I was shocked at how calmly he made that request. It was as if he had forgotten the fact that he was still pointing a gun at our heads. We didn't argue as we did exactly what he asked for. Looking back on it now, I'm pretty sure that I made the best pizza ever as I knew my life depended on it. When we were done, we handed him the pizzas and I watched as he set his gun on his lap before starting to eat. We could tell he was pretty hungry as he solely focused on those pizzas and for a split second, 
a crazy idea ran through my mind. I looked at Katie, and I could tell that she was thinking the same thing. So with no hesitation, we ran. As I bolted for the door, I remember making my peace with God as I thought he was going to shoot me in the back. But it took Mr. Kenneth a while to get himself together by picking up his gun. And before he could do that, we were already out of the door. We ran into the arms of the cops who immediately took us somewhere safe. It took a couple of minutes, but now that he didn't have any hostages, Mr. Kenneth had no choice but to give up. The morbid incident shook everyone in the city, and investigations were carried into Mr. Kenneth's life. It was then revealed that Mr. Kenneth Lamar Noid, who shared the same name as our mascot, the Noid, had been a target of light mockery and bullying ever since the character gained popularity. And while everyone knew it was just a silly coincidence, Mr. Kenneth believed he was being specifically targeted by the owner of Domino's, Mr. Tom Monahan, as he made up scenarios claiming that they were both spying on his house and keeping him under surveillance. He also claimed the catchphrase, avoid the noid, was specifically created to make his life even worse. His family said that he would be enraged any time the noid advertisements were shown on TV. And as the character grew more and more popular, he eventually couldn't take it anymore. So he decided to get his revenge on the Domino's Pizza Restaurant. Mr. Noid was given numerous charges during his trial, namely kidnapping, possession of a firearm, and extortion. After the trial, Mr. Noid was deemed insane and he was sent to a mental institution for rehabilitation. It was there that he later killed himself on the 23rd of February, 1995. I quit my job after that and I had to undergo extensive therapy to help with the PTSD. Night after night, I found myself having nightmares about that day, and it didn't take long before the Noid character started appearing in those nightmares, as I would have dreams of a bloody red rabbit coming to shoot me in my sleep. It was then that I was told I had masculophobia. The psychologist told me the Noid character was a triggering element and that I should stay away from anything that would remind me of that day. Due to the bad press from the incident, Domino's pulled back all the advertisements for the Noid, and within the next decade, the Noid became Domino's forgotten mascot. It's been over 33 years since this all happened. I thought I had gotten over the incident, but when I saw Domino's had revived the character in the year 2021, I had a terrible panic attack. It took me a while, but I've finally come to terms with the truth. As I know, there's nothing I can do to overcome this fear and it's going to be with me for the rest of my life. On the bright side, I do find it ironic sometimes, as I know the only thing I can do now is to spend the rest of my days avoiding the Noid. Hi guys, my name is Alex, and believe it or not, I was one of the famous Burger King employees who worked in one of the most infamous Burger King branches. The bread that, although no one ever knew it, mistreated its employees the most. It all started when our old manager, who we'll call Jerry, was fired. We had a great time with Jerry. We were so relaxed, and he was so undemanding, we could hardly consider it a job. Yes, customers sometimes complained that we were late in shipping orders, but most of them left happy because they knew we made the food with a lot of love and effort. The bosses were not happy about this because they fired Jerry. At first, we all wondered if one of us would be the next manager. But since they felt that because of Jerry, we were all pretty lazy, they decided to look for someone from the outside. That's when Jean showed up, and that was the beginning of the end of our relaxing days and the beginning of a nightmare that seemed like it would never end. You see, Jean was obsessed with time. The man was always seen with at least three watches, always looking at them. Burger King executives loved this quality about him because whatever franchise he touched, that franchise radically improved his numbers. They were so obsessed with his accomplishments, no one stopped to think about how he did them. In the beginning, Gene was constantly rushing us. He didn't want us to rest for a second. The moment a customer arrived, we all had to soldier on and not let him wait five minutes. He couldn't stand us preparing the food on the spot. All the food had to be previously prepared and assembled according to the client to deliver it much faster. It was hell. Every time one of us would relax, Gene would appear from behind and yell wildly at him to get to work. It was as if he were everywhere at once, as if he had eyes on us all the time. 
In the first few weeks, he pushed us to the limit. Most of us thought for sure he was going to calm down, that he was probably trying to make a good impression, and that he didn't want to give up in these first few days that he was still new. But needless to say, we were wrong. As time went by, Gene became more and more demanding. He got to the point of standing next to us and timing how long we could make a burger. Many of us complained about him at the end of working hours, but no one ever dared to confront him. Not because he was our boss, but because he was terrifying. The man had a dark presence and he looked at us with such hatred, with such disdain, that we felt that if we said anything to him, he would probably rip our heads off. As time went on, Gene's rules became more and more illogical. Once a week, he would force us to flip burgers next to him. If we took more than 20 seconds, we were financially penalized and part of our salary was taken away. Naturally, some of us started to quit. And this is where the really scary part began. Every time someone quit, Gene would get frantic. That day, you couldn't even look at him or he would scream at you with all his fury. The next day, Gene would go to work and the day after, he would come in in a very strange mood. As if something had happened the day he was absent. We tried to communicate with the guys who quit, but we could not. It was as if the people and their families disappeared off the face of the earth. We couldn't confirm it and we had no proof, but we knew Gene had something to do with it. Meanwhile, back at the shop, everything started to get worse. The time to make a hamburger was getting shorter and shorter. The only day we saw Gene happy was when a co-worker managed to do it in eight seconds. But that only made him even angrier at those of us who didn't make it. In the beginning, people were happy because the food was coming fast, but then the complaints started. We were making the food so fast that we forgot to put in ingredients or did it wrong. Every time this happened, Gene would wait until after work hours to yell at us and hit us. We were all too afraid to say anything to him or to quit. We were sure that something terrible would happen to us if we fought back. And not doing so, not standing up for ourselves, would make it all end in the worst of ways. I remember on the worst day of all, Gene met me outside work. He told us that this would be his last diamond, so he wanted to make sure the staff was prepared. We all smiled and thought that if we would never see him again after this, we would put up with anything. None of us imagined what Gene had prepared for us. Out of nowhere, the maniac pulled out a revolver and pointed it at all of us, who fell back in fear, raising our hands in the air. You see, guys, I can't allow any efficient personnel to remain on my last day. So, that's the way it's going to be. My shift ends at 9 p.m. You have 15 minutes to flip burgers without stopping. Whoever takes longer than 12 seconds will be fired. Quickly, he pointed the gun at us and made us pass one by one to make hamburgers. Meanwhile, he pointed the guns at our heads, insulted us, and even slapped us in the face. In the beginning, we all managed to do it in less than 12 seconds. But before it was my turn, one guy took a second too long. <laughs> Please, no! Without saying anything to him, Gene simply pulled the trigger and blew his head off. No cleaning the corpse! The rest will work here, in the blood and with her boyfriend by her side. Next! And after that, we all kept making burgers. The condiments were full of blood, but that didn't matter. That couldn't matter, because if we made them wrong, we would end up being another corpse. At that moment, we had to reveal ourselves. We should have all jumped against them, but can you blame us? We were just a bunch of scared teenagers. We just wanted to go home. Little by little, my companions began to fall and die. It was getting harder and harder to make hamburgers. The smell of blood was too much. Some of them started to vomit, but they couldn't even afford that, as Gene threatened to kill them if they took too long. When it was my turn again, I tried to go make the hamburger, but something was happening to me. My legs, they weren't working. I wanted to move, and I wanted to make the burger, but... I just couldn't walk. Furious, Gene came up to me and grabbed me by the hair, putting my head on the counter full of blood and rubbing it as if it were a rag. Is that why you can't move, Alex? You better get used to the blood because if you don't make that hamburger, yours will be here too. You understand? Gathering all my energy, my body started working again and I could answer him. 
Yes, sir. I started to make the hamburger as fast as possible, but it was very difficult. My hands were shaking. I felt like I was doing everything wrong, as if I was putting all the ingredients in automatic mode. I couldn't concentrate on my work. I just cried and begged to see my family one more time. Meanwhile, I felt the cold tube of Gene's gun on my head, squeezing me with disdain, as if he couldn't stand the urge to blow my head off in front of everyone. As soon as I finished the hamburger, Gene stopped the stopwatch and with a huge smile, showed it to me. The stopwatch read, 12 seconds. I had made it. Well, guys, it's 9 p.m. It was a pleasure working with you. I know I'm leaving the place with capable people. After saying these words, Gene put the gun to his head and simply pulled the trigger. He fell dead instantly. After something so cruel and sadistic, you can imagine that this was news all over the world, right? Well, it wasn't. Burger King put up a huge amount of money so that this story would never become known. The victims' families were bribed and threatened. No one made a fuss. Burger King was too powerful, and everyone knew they were going to lose. My other co-workers and I quit immediately after that, and we even didn't give them time to look for replacements. Sometimes, I walk by the restaurant and see that it's open again, with kids like us, having fun. When I sit down to eat, I never again get nervous about how long the food will take. I appreciate that they take their time, because every time food comes quickly, I am reminded of the stacked corpses of my co-workers and how close I came to being one of them. My name is Timothy Malone, and this is a story about how a fast food restaurant I barely went to nearly ended my life in just one visit. One night, about four months ago, my girlfriend Monica and I had been out with some friends until around 11 p.m. On our drive, we both talked about how we were extremely hungry and would like to find something to eat. Not long after, we found a Wendy's close by, and although I had only been to Wendy's a few times, we parked and walked in to get some food. Now at the time, there was no one else in the restaurant, except one single employee who was working that night. The employee was a middle-aged man with a beard. He looked extremely skinny for his age, and his eyes were glassy and looked like he had been on some sort of drug. After we walked in, my girlfriend decided she was going to use the restroom, leaving me alone with the man to order. As I ordered our meals, something about the man seemed frightening to me. He uncomfortably held eye contact, and not once did he say a single word. I figured I was just being paranoid as strangers always seemed creepier to me at night. About 15 minutes passed and I began to worry as my girlfriend still hadn't come back from the toilet, so I decided to go check and see if she was okay. I knocked on the door, but there was no response from Monica. I was about to go in when I noticed flashing lights coming from the crack under the door, and not long after, Monica walked out, pale-faced, with dead eyes. Hey, what took you so long? Are you okay? I said. Monica simply walked past me and back to where our food was. I immediately followed her and stood in front of her to make sure she was fine. Monica still didn't respond to me. She simply looked over at the man, and they both shared an eerie strange look as if they had an understanding of sorts. That's when Monica suddenly grabbed a knife from across the counter and swung it at me, cutting my chest. I was completely shocked and in pain as I let out a loud scream. Monica then began to swing the knife frantically at me, cutting me on my arm a couple of times. I eventually managed to grab her arm and hit the knife out of her hand before hitting her on the head and saying, What are you doing? Me hitting her seemed to snap her out of whatever trance she was in, and before I could even begin to contemplate what had just happened, the Wendy's employee quickly ran to the back and out of the store. After talking with Monica and explaining what had happened, Monica informed me she couldn't remember even walking out of the toilet and decided to look in the toilet. We walked in to check what was in there, and I discovered the source of the flashing lights I had seen earlier was an old box TV that had a weird video on loop. The video displayed different random shapes, colors, and images. We quickly called the police, and in a few minutes, they arrived. The head officer in charge was shocked by our story. He explained that in the first place, that particular Wendy's was supposed to be closed throughout the week, and the man we had described did not have any prior records that might lead them to him. He also explained some form of hypnosis had been used on Monica, but until they took the time to look deeper into that, there was nothing much he could do. We drove back later that night, paranoid and worried about the strange man following us. Ever since that day, 
Neither my girlfriend nor I have been to another Wendy's fast food restaurant. And quite frankly, we never will. Although it is quite well known here, in the rest of the world, there are very few franchises. And in fact, no one talks about them as much as you might think. I'm a big Hortons fan. There is nothing nicer than the smell of good coffee in the morning. But as you can imagine, this is not a story about how much I love coffee. This is a story of the worst day of my life. And yet, I am thankful for it, because by a miracle, it was not the last. It all started when I turned 18. Right out of high school, I needed a part-time job to pay for college, and Horton's was my first choice. The people at the cafeteria already knew me. I was always going with my father, and I lived a few blocks away, so they hired me almost without hesitation. My first few months were very good. Everyone told me I was too dedicated for a simple coffee shop, but what was wrong with that? I enjoyed it. Everything was going great until one Tuesday in winter. I remember it was a cold, rainy morning. Our place was a bit small, so there were very few people attending it, especially in the morning. We had no security personnel, but we could call the police if something happened. But the place was very quiet, generally. That Tuesday, it was very quiet. There were very few people in the place. One man stood out among them. He was very tall and muscular, but for some reason, he looked absolutely terrified. He was looking everywhere without stopping, and he was already on his third cup of coffee. I wanted to ask him what was wrong, but I didn't want to be too intrusive. Anyway, the answer came on its own. Some men entered the place. Two of them were in suits and were very tall, even taller than the one sitting at the table. Behind them was another man with a cigar, much fatter and shorter than the rest. But nevertheless, he was the most terrifying of them all. The other men looked quiet, but the shortest one, who looked like the boss, had all the appearance of a mobster. As soon as they walked in, I was cleaning up near them and said hello. But not only did they ignore me, but I could see how the boss made a face at one of them in the suit, mocking me, and he chuckled under his breath. The men walked straight over to where the muscular man sat, and as one of the men in the suit grabbed him by the shirt, the boss said something I couldn't hear. In response to this, the muscular man started to cry, but the only thing he managed to do was to get the boss to throw the boiling coffee in his face. The man fell to the floor and began to scream, and the few customers that were there began to leave Hortons. I couldn't take it anymore. I couldn't take any more of this, so with my broomstick, I put myself in the middle of the boss and the victim threatening them and telling them I would call the police. <laughs> Aren't you a bold one? After saying those words, the man motioned to the men in suits and the three left. After that, I and other employees called the police and took care of the victim in the back. The man didn't tell us much, but he was clearly terrified. My boss stayed with him in the main office and asked me to go take the trash out back. He would take care of everything. Much calmer, I gathered up the trash and went to the back. What I didn't know was that as soon as I opened the door, there were people waiting for me. The mafia man was in the rain with his two bodyguards who grabbed my arms and pulled me towards him. I struggled to escape, but when I tried to open the door, it was locked. What? Come on, kid. Do you think it was a coincidence that I knew you'd be taking out the trash? Before I knew it, the man had stepped behind me and with one violent movement, grabbed me by the hair and threw me to the ground. You see, kid, I could have left. In fact, I was about to leave. But you know what? I remembered something. I don't like boldness. I tried to crawl away, but one of the men grabbed me by the hair and dragged me into a small garden where we had some plants. I felt helpless. Please, don't be angry with me. I only wanted to defend the poor person. You threw hot coffee on him. Oh boy, don't cry. I think you misinterpreted the situation. I am not angry with you. You're not? Of course not. I don't get mad at anybody. I pay people to do that for me. The man snapped his fingers and immediately, the other one of the men stepped on my head in the mud. The ground was wet from the rain and my head was sinking as the man stepped on it and moved his foot as if he wanted to squeeze a cockroach. My head was sinking deeper and deeper. 
I could hardly breathe and I was swallowing a lot of dirt. I could feel a worm walking on my face. Luckily, I got to a part where the dirt was dry and the man stopped. I stuck my head out quickly to breathe and immediately received a punch in the face from the boss. Not gonna lie, sometimes I do get a little angry. <laughs> Suddenly, the man pulled out a gun and pointed it at my head. Well, kid, I had fun, but you have to go. Boss, there's people watching us. This is a kid. Maybe we're crossing the line. Angrily, the boss put the gun away and laughed. See, I told you guys you should talk a little more. Both of you are actually right. Sorry, kid. I have some anger issues. I'm treating them with a psychologist. The men walked away from me, walking slowly almost disinterested. Hey, kid, tell your boss I'll expect him for dinner on Friday. Tell him I'll bring him some nice wine. Confused, I stood in the rain crying, not believing I was alive. The police came for me, and I warned them that the three men were escaping. The officers ignored me and told me to drop the subject. That was the last time I visited Horton. Soon after, I moved in with the help of my family. After that, I was terrified for years. Years afraid that this man would come to kill me for no reason. But it never happened. Several years later, I found out that I was incarcerated while doing an interview. I swear that prison had more luxuries than my house. Life is sometimes very unfair, but I am thankful to be alive. I am thankful to smell the coffee every morning and not to have died that terrifying rainy day. Have you ever been to Wendy's? In general, it is a good restaurant. The food is pretty good and they have more variety than the rest of the burger places. Like McDonald's with Ronald, they also have their own mascot. She is a very cute red-headed girl. I never knew if she is based on a real person or if they just created her for the logo. But what I do know is that once, Someone disguised as she tried to kill me. It all started one normal night. On weekends, I have to babysit my son, and his favorite place to eat is Wendy's. He used to throw a big tantrum when I didn't take him, and over time, it had become our favorite father-son activity. Everything was going well until one day, I noticed something strange. As we left the place, a person disguised as the Wendy's girl greeted us. There was nothing strange about this. What did scare my son was that the whole costume was covered in blood. After we passed her, she walked behind us, still waving at us. My son started to get really scared and started to speed up his pace. I thought about confronting this person, but to tell the truth, I'm a pacifist. I don't know how to fight and I don't want to. I would if it was to defend my son, but what would that accomplish? I would only put him at risk. I decided to pick up the pace and get into the car as soon as possible. Just a few steps away, the girl was still waving at us in a terrifying manner. Several weeks passed and my son was somewhat reluctant to return to the restaurant until one day. I talked to his mother and she convinced him. I was sure nothing would happen. Maybe that was a one-time thing. If this person was stalking all the customers like that, she had probably already been kicked out. With many doubts, my son went with me to the restaurant. Little by little, I could see how the spark began to return. There was no trace of the strange woman and he began to feel more and more comfortable. We spent a great night together eating. It seemed like everything that had happened would be in the past as a bad and bizarre memory. We made our way to the car and the parking lot was empty. But this was a good thing since our stalker from that time wasn't there either. We got into the car and I started it up. But at that moment, the thing I was most afraid of happened. In front of the car, Preventing us from moving forward, the woman in the costume was waving at us. Her costume was still bloody, and just like last time, looked like fresh blood. Her greetings were much more frenetic than the previous time. This time, she was waving her hand violently. As soon as he saw her, my son began to cry as if he had recalled an event that had kept him awake at night for many nights. I knew it had affected him, but this was much worse than I thought. I honked at her to run, but instead of listening to me, she only came closer, walking in front of the car and even standing on top of it. 
I quickly put on the seatbelt while I listened as this terrifying woman walked on the roof. I took advantage of the situation to try to speed up the car, but as if sensing that I was going to do it, she laid down and stuck her head inside of the window, showing us a big knife in the process. I accelerated the car. But in a matter of seconds, we lost control and crashed into a pole. All the car's tires were flat. The woman had fallen from the accident, so I took the opportunity to grab my son and run back to the Wendy's. On the way, the woman caught up with me in a matter of seconds and threw me to the ground. My son fell away, and as I yelled at him to go to the restaurant to report what was happening, the woman tried to press her knife against me. She was very strong. Somehow, her strength was equal to mine, which in itself was not much. My arms began to give way, and the knife came closer and closer to my throat until suddenly, it was all over. Some security men threw the woman away from me, and I, terrified, stepped back. I took a deep breath because it was all over, but a battle cry brought me back to reality. The woman was running at full speed, and in one leap, she lunged towards me to plunge her knife into me. The security men caught her in mid-jump, grabbed her knife, and held her until the police arrived. When they took off her mask, my son started crying, and I was shocked. That person was not a Wendy's employee. She was my ex-wife, my son's mother. After a while, she confessed that she was dressing up to scare my son so that he would no longer want to spend time with me or have a bonding activity like she was doing. She had no intention of killing me, but that night, everything went out of control. She had taken drugs that took her out of herself, and because of that, all the subtlety in her plan was gone. She went into a state of euphoria and with the knife already in her hand, tried to kill me and give my son a trauma he would never forget. After that, I kept custody of my son. He still goes to see his mother in prison, but he doesn't want to. I always convince him to do it, to forgive her, but I must tell you the truth. I will never do it. Since that day, every time my son and I go to Wendy's, we are afraid. The food tastes much more bitter, and we are just thinking about leaving. But we keep lying to ourselves that everything we went through didn't affect us. At the end of the day, even though she ended up in jail, my ex-wife, the woman dressed as the little girl at Wendy's, got her way. Hey, my name is Angela. I've been a doctor for a few years now. And believe me, I've seen it all. I've seen people die, people beaten, people burned. You could say, I've seen the worst of humanity. I always try to save as many lives as I can, but sometimes it doesn't matter how much I intervene. I can't do miracles. You know, I always try to take the best care of all my patients, but I have special empathy for victims of bullying. I guess everyone has empathy for women who are stalked, and they would have more if they knew how some of those girls get to the hospital. But for me, dealing with a victim of harassment is personal. I was a victim of harassment when I was young and worked at Hooters, and it was there that I learned about absolute evil. When I learned how obsessive and cruel a bully can be. I'll tell you the story from the beginning. I had worked at Hooters for years. From the moment I got the job, I knew it wasn't going to be easy. The customers could be more than a little pushy, but the money was good, and the atmosphere, while sometimes a little uncomfortable, was usually friendly. Some friends and family advised me not to work at Hooters, but I really needed to. Nowhere else where they were so flexible with schedules and paid well. I really needed this, since I was going to medical school, and my parents couldn't help me enough to pay for and support me. Other than what every girl worries about before working at Hooters, the job was pretty good. I felt very cared for, and aside from the occasional drunk customer, I felt protected. But that night, everything changed. It was a summer Friday night, one of the busiest. I was busy waiting tables, carrying chicken wings back and forth, 
trying to keep a smile on my face, despite the heat and the noise. I couldn't help but notice a guy sitting at the bar, staring at me. At first, I thought he was just another customer who found me attractive. But something about his gaze was wrong. Over time, I had been looked at in many ways, but never in such obsessive, calculating, and intimidating way as this. I tried to ignore him and go back to my work, but every time I turned around, there he was, with those piercing eyes staring at me. I decided to ask one of my coworkers to take over the bar for a while. I needed a break from that person, even though I hadn't even interacted with him. I headed to the back of the restaurant, trying to calm down. I thought maybe I was overreacting, that the guy was just having a good time and had no bad intentions. But I knew I was lying to myself. There was no way a person looking at me like that was just having a good time. After a few minutes, I went back to the front, hoping that the guy had disappeared. But to my horror, he was still there, staring at me with a sinister smile on his face. I tried to keep my composure and keep working, but every time I approached him, I felt a shiver run down my spine. Finally, I decided to talk to my boss about the situation. I explained what was going on and asked him to call security or to do something about it. But to my surprise, he just shrugged his shoulders and said he couldn't do anything unless the guy actually did something threatening. I felt abandoned and vulnerable. I couldn't believe that no one was willing to help me. I decided to finish my shift as quickly as possible and to get out of there before something bad happened. I was ready to go home when the man was no longer there. I remember guessing that maybe he had gotten bored and left. Or maybe it was all in my imagination. I didn't care what happened. I was just glad it was over. Before leaving the restaurant, I looked around and saw no one. Neither my boss, my co-workers, nor anyone from security offered to take me home. But I understood them. For them, nothing bad had happened today. And for my boss, I was overreacting. I started walking home at an accelerated pace, almost running. And that's when I realized something terrible. Once I started looking around, I realized that the guy was still there, waiting for me outside the restaurant. I tried to stay calm and look for an open place to hide, but nothing. It was very late and there was no one on the street. I started to run, feeling the fear taking over me. I didn't know what the guy wanted, but I wasn't going to stick around to find out. I ran through the dark streets, trying to lose him in the darkness, but he was faster than I thought. I saw people in the distance and realized that this was my only chance to escape. I started screaming and running even faster, thinking that the worst was over and that for sure the man was going to be scared by the screams and the presence of other people. But nothing of the sort happened. Suddenly, I felt a hand grab my arm pulling me into the dark alley. I screamed and struggled, but he was stronger and more determined. He dragged me into the dark corner, his eyes glowing with a sickly light. I realized that I was in danger, that I was completely at the mercy of whatever this man had planned to do to me. I was ready to fight. I was going to give up everything I had so this man couldn't do anything to me. I resisted as much as I could. I tried to escape by kicking, punching the air and screaming. At my scream, the man put his hand on my mouth and covered it with a lot of force. I tried to react quickly and ah! bit his hand. And that's when I heard his scream in pain for the first time. Before my bite, I was free for a second and I took the opportunity to run. But the man grabbed me by the hair and pulled me hard into the ground where I fell and hurt myself. Back in control of the situation, the man kicked me in the stomach and I spun around on the floor in pain. 
Again, flashing his smile, I could see the psychopath pull out a small knife and show it to me as if to indicate what was about to happen to me. I braced myself for the worst, praying that someone would find me before it was too late. But just when I thought all was lost, I heard sirens in the distance. The man looked at me again, as if hesitating about what to do. And with a look of hatred and resignation, he fled into the shadows down the alley. I breathed a sigh of relief as the policeman approached asking me what had happened. I told him everything that had happened, describing the man and explaining how he had been following me all night. They took me back to the restaurant, which had not yet finished closing, where my boss apologized to me, almost in tears of guilt, and finally took the situation seriously and called security to check the surveillance cameras. After a long night of statements and questions, they finally let me go home. I was exhausted, but at least I was safe. I promised myself that I would never again underestimate the power of fear or ignore my instinct when it told me that something was wrong. I never went back to work or even visited Hooters. I decided to start looking for a job at the hospital and to my surprise, I quickly got it. It was not what I expected, but that experience helped me to become a physician today. I never heard from the man who stalked me during that hot summer night, but I hope my former boss was very careful because if I wasn't there, the stalker could set his sights on one of the other girls. Hi, my name is Jake. Although my tastes have changed as an adult, as a child, I always went to Wendy's. As my father told you in another story, I almost fell victim to my own mother. You see, since my parents were divorced, she dressed up as the Wendy's girl to scare me. She did it with the firm motive of ruining my happiness by going to Wendy's, all so I wouldn't enjoy being with my dad. But in trying to scare us, everything got out of control. What started out as an attempt for me to spend time with her ended up leaving her in prison and me with a horrible trauma. But you know, the worst had not yet happened to me. My mom may have been behind bars, but the Wendy's girl would continue to haunt me. It all continued a few months after the incident. My father was working and I was on vacation with a lot of free time at home. It was hard to adjust to the new school after what I experienced that night. I had a hard time trusting people since my own mother tried to kill me and my dad. I had taken a short nap and when I woke up, it all came back to me. I couldn't believe what I was seeing. It was the girl from Wendy's. In my room, I rubbed my eyes. This had to be a dream. This couldn't be real. She had already been arrested. My mom was in prison. If this wasn't my mother, who was it? The girl from Wendy's slowly approached me with a knife in her hand. I was paralyzed with fear. I couldn't move. I could only cry from despair. Once this person was next to me, he slowly approached me. And face to face, he spoke to me. Did you think it was all over, Jake? I won't leave you alone. I'll come for you soon. And with that said, he just left. I didn't run away. I didn't scream for help, and I didn't even close my door. I just stayed frozen on the bed, crying. I felt something wet on my bed, and when I looked, my bed and my pants were soaked. I had peed. This person may have been disguised just like mom, but he was taller and more imposing. Plus, he had a man's voice. But who could he be? A few minutes later, I heard my dad come home from work, and the energy returned to my body. I ran to him and told him everything, hoping that we would go to the police or that he would do something to stop this person. He seemed concerned, yes, but he didn't believe me. He just checked the house and told me that it was normal for me to be so scared. It is normal for me to see the Wendy's girl in my nightmares as it had all been very traumatic for me. After telling me to talk about it in therapy, he gave me a hug of concern. I was not pleased. The days went by and I couldn't stop thinking about my encounter with the girl at Wendy's. I was terrified. I was terrified this person swore to come back, swore to kill me, but what could I do? 
My father didn't believe me and I couldn't just run away from the house. To make it worse, I felt very strange, as if I was being watched all the time. Many times, I would fall asleep and see someone's shadow watching me from the dark. Sometimes I would hear footsteps in the house when I shouldn't have, and other times, I just felt like I wasn't alone. But of course, my dad would deny everything, since he was never around at the same time as my stalker. I was desperate and didn't know what to do, but soon, everything would get worse. One day I heard the sound of someone at the top of the stairs. My dad wasn't there, so I knew there was definitely someone invading my home. Being a kid, I made the worst possible decision. I grabbed a knife and decided to take care of the situation myself. I walked slowly towards the source of the noise. It was in my father's room. With the knife raised, I decided to investigate. The room was empty. The man was probably gone. I saw some papers on dad's desk and when I tried to put them away, there it was. It was the mask of the girl from Wendy's. At that moment, I understood everything. Why wasn't the man ever there at the same time as my father? Besides, they both had the same height and a similar voice. My father was disguised as the girl from Wendy's. But why? After that day, everything changed between me and my father. I felt that everything he did was suspicious. Little by little, we began to distance ourselves. He tried to talk to me and told me that he didn't understand what was wrong with me. I admit that he made me doubt, but even so, it would have been dangerous to trust him. All this came to its worst on a Sunday. That day, I was at the table, waiting for my father to come and eat with me. The food in the oven was almost ready, but he wasn't coming. I got up from the table to see what was going on, and as soon as I took a step... I saw her. The Wendy's girl was standing in front of me. Now that I saw her in person, she really had my father's height and build. Again, she started walking towards me. Terrified, I could only retreat backward, crying until I bumped into a chair and fell down. We both know you know who I am, Jake. So why pretend? You know, things have been bad between us lately. Why don't we resolve them with a big, big hug? The Wendy's girl approached me with her knife raised. She was ready to kill me, and there was nothing I could do. Just watch my father in disguise get rid of me. When she was a few inches away from reaching me, the unthinkable happened. My father rammed the Wendy's girl from behind. He was tied to a chair, and his mouth was taped. But it looked like he had somehow untied his feet. My dad started kicking the Wendy's girl on the floor while pointing at me, crying and telling me to run to the neighbor's house. Not knowing what to do, I listened to him and ran as fast as I could. I told the neighbors everything and while one of them called the police, two others went to help my dad. I didn't understand what was happening. One minute I was fine, but all of a sudden I heard a loud noise and someone was holding me. It was the girl from Wendy's. She had caught me. She ran as fast as she could and headed for a white van. But suddenly, I felt another impact. The neighbors who had gone to help my dad had knocked her down and were holding her back. I fell to the ground, crying, while another of my neighbors hugged me. When the police arrived, they arrested the Wendy's girl. When they took off her mask, I was shocked by the surprise. She was a tall, sturdy person with very marked features. It was a person I didn't know. Why was he doing this to us? Why was he impersonating my father? At the same time as the police, an ambulance arrived. The ambulance drove to my house and after a while, they took someone away in a black bag. A short time later, I found out that it was my father, that he had died. Shortly after that, I moved in with my father's sister and partner. Today, after 10 years, they are like parents to me. The police made the man who killed my father, the man dressed as the Wendy's girl, confess. I may not have known him, but he knew me. He was my mother's lover, and everything that happened was a plan gone wrong. They wanted me to believe that my father had gone crazy and that he was the new girl at Wendy's. They wanted me to distance myself from him. They wanted me to distance myself from him, and that day when it all happened, my mother's lover was going to give me the scare of my life. And then he was going to kill my dad, making it look like a suicide. 
What they did not plan was that my father was going to untie his feet and attack him, giving his life for me to escape, again saving me. I never saw or spoke to my mother again. Eventually, I was encouraged to go back to Wendy's. Make no mistake, every time I see the Wendy's girl, I feel dread. But that was my favorite restaurant and I had to overcome my fear. My mother's obsession had already taken too much out of me in my life. I wasn't going to let it take anything more out of me. This happened to me the final summer I was working at Pizza Hut. I picked up some shifts to earn a little extra money here and there. I used to work for three to five hours either working in the kitchen or delivering pizzas. It had been a difficult day for me, and I was tired. It was almost nighttime, and I had to deliver my final pizza. I picked it up from the shop and got in my car. I put the address into the GPS to check how far it was. It turned out it was 20 minutes away, so I started driving. I was exhausted, so I just wanted to deliver it and go to my apartment to rest. As I got closer and closer to the location, the area was getting less and less crowded. This person didn't live in a crowded neighborhood. That's what I thought to myself. When I got there, the house seemed to be old. It was the quietest neighborhood I had ever seen in this area. Anyways, I took the pizza out of the car and went towards the main door. I rang the doorbell, and an old man came to open the door. As soon as he had opened the door, he told me to put the pizza on the table and that my money was there. After saying this, he left. I was a little confused, but I entered the house. The hallway was dark and quiet. I had to turn on my phone's flashlight. This place had no light bulbs, which was odd to me. There was a table located in the middle of the living room. I reached for it and placed the pizza box there. My money was also on the table. I quickly pocketed it. Suddenly, the door shut behind me with a loud bang, and I heard a click as if someone was locking it. I was startled. I pointed my flashlight towards the door and ran for it, but the door was locked. My cell phone had low charge, and it was about to die. I attempted to open the door, but it wouldn't budge. Just then, my smartphone began to ring. I looked at the screen to see it was an unknown caller. I answered the call to listen to a hoarse whisper on the opposite end. If you don't do what I say, you're dead, son. He whispered. I asked who was speaking. You don't ask questions. Don't worry, I will help you across soon, said the man. I asked him what he wanted, but he just stated that he desired to have fun. He instructed me to look underneath the table. I did so, and found a phone there. My phone started to heat up, to such an extent, it was burning my hand, Ow. and I had to throw it away from me. I got a video call on the phone underneath the table. I pressed answer and noticed an ordinary guy wearing a mask. I told him to let me go. I didn't do anything. In response, he informed me to visit the bedroom. I walked there slowly, and my hand shook as I held the smartphone in front of me. I opened the door to see that there was a timer on the side desk. What is this for? I requested in a manic state. That's how long you've got left in this world. He started to chuckle. I hung up on him and desperately tried to look around the room for something I could use as a weapon. There was nothing. Feeling helpless, I went to the window, only to find it was barred from the outside. I ran to the bathroom. I only had an hour and a half left. I looked around the walls and found a small exhaust window in the upper corner. Of course, it wasn't very large. I stood on the brink of the bathtub and turned on my phone's flashlight, directing its beam at the window. 
I waved my hand for someone to notice me from the outside. Help! I shrieked at the pinnacle of my lungs. I screamed until my throat got sore, and I couldn't shout anymore. I heard beeping, so I raced to the bedroom to find the clock counting right down to the final minutes of my life. I was panicking, not knowing what to do, and thinking about what would happen as soon as the timer ended. There were a lot of horrible things running through my mind, and I just prayed to God to save me. I have my whole life ahead of me. It shouldn't end here, dying so soon. At least not in this creepy old house, I said to myself. I didn't know what to do. I anxiously paced back and forth in the room until I heard a dragging sound near the door. It opened with a creak, and the masked man entered. He had an axe in his hand. I ran far from him, as far as I possibly could. I got cornered. He came near me with an eccentric snicker, elevating the axe while we heard the sirens wailing from outdoors. The beams of flashing red and blue indicated it was the police. The guy retreated and ran from the room. Open up! Police! I heard them shout. The sound of the door breaking down echoed through the house. They rushed in to rescue me. I wasn't hurt. However, the incident left me traumatized. It turned out that someone had seen my flashlight and heard me yelling for help. They didn't come to help me themselves, but they called the police. Thank God the police arrived. Otherwise, I would have died in the most horrible way imaginable. I still get goosebumps when I think about that day. The man had fled into the woods as soon as he saw the police, and I saw two policemen chasing him. One of them had asked me if I could describe his appearance but I told them he was wearing a mask. I told them the whole story, and when I left from there, I waited as they searched the entire house. The other officers returned, with the masked man apprehended. I was glad they caught him. After they unmasked him, he turned out to be the same older man who had opened the door for me. Gray, greasy hair, wrinkles on his skin, dark skin tone, front teeth broken. He was wearing an old long overcoat with dirty blue jeans and black snow boots. It turned out he was mentally ill and had escaped from the mental asylum a few months back. I wasn't the first who had encountered him, but fortunately, I was the first to escape him. According to him, the only reason he did this was because he liked the look of fear on the faces of people he used to kill. I quit my job the next day, and I never worked delivery again. Hi, I'm Jordan Boatman. I'm a nurse and a part-time pizza delivery boy. As I'm studying medicine, working in a hospital as a nurse and also delivering pizzas at night, I barely get time to do anything else. My job as a nurse is to gain experience, whereas my job delivering pizzas for 24-7 Pizza House is to earn money. I have to pay my student debt and also continue studying medicine. I mostly work from 11 p.m. to 4 a.m., which means I'm all night driving around town delivering pizzas. Now, it's surprising how many people order pizzas at odd times. In a nutshell, it's too many. And if you work at the only 24-7 restaurant in town, it means... You work a lot at night. It's mostly partying teenagers, people who do remote jobs for foreign companies, or sometimes people craving a midnight snack, or should I say a meal. However, whenever I have a rough day at my college or in the hospital, I prefer to operate the phone and the order app instead of driving around town delivering pizzas. I've been working in this restaurant for over two years, so it's safe to say I can do everything here, right from delivering pizzas to making them. Recently, we hired a new kid. He must be, what, 18 or 19 years old. He's new in town and drives pretty well, so we decided to let him do the night deliveries. He insisted he would be okay with driving around in order to get to know the town. For the last two months, he's done a great job. Not a single complaint. No late deliveries, just happy customers. 
he'd quickly become everyone's favorite. Mine personally, as he more often than not let me study at the counter and did my deliveries for me. However, a week ago, everything changed. That night, as I was on the counter picking up the phone and checking the apps for orders, the phone rang. Hello, SSG Pizza Palace. What's your order? I said. Hi, I'm Stacy, and I'd like to order a large pepperoni pizza, a regular cheese pizza, and garlic bread and mustard dip on the side. Sure, your delivery will be there in 30 minutes. If it's late, it's on the house. Would you please give the address where the food is to be delivered? Yeah, house number 87, near the post office, on 4th Street. When I heard her say 4th Street, I was a bit worried, but quickly concealed my discomfort and replied, Thanks, your order will reach you shortly, and hung up the phone. I forwarded the order to the kitchen and decided to deliver this order myself. It was clear that there was no point in letting Luke, the new boy, deliver this order. Although I had a few assignments pending and was exhausted after my shift in the hospital, the order was ready in about 10 minutes. Hey, is the order ready? Luke asked. Yeah, it is, but I'm taking this one. Uh, you can wait for the next one. Why? Do they tip well? Luke asked me playfully. No, it's not about the tip. Let's just say you'd rather not go in that part of town at night. Or ever. Oh, why is that? Do they sell drugs there? Luke said, almost hopeful. But I wasn't going to tell him the real reason. No, they don't sell drugs there. Oh, then why shouldn't I go? Let me deliver this order. You have a ton of homework anyways. I mean, he was correct, but still, it was too risky to let the new kid do this. No, Luke. I'm taking this order. A few minutes of delay won't set me back on my studies. But you have an assignment due tomorrow, and I'll deliver this order. Don't worry. After that, Luke kept begging and whining for a while, so I finally let him take the order, but on one condition. Luke, you have to promise me that you will drive straight to the address and back. At no point will you get out of the car. No matter what happens, you will not get out of the car. He looked at me as I was stressed about this delivery, and I instructed him about the route. Luke sensed that there was something I wasn't telling him. Why are you so worried about this? Is there something I should know? I know I should have told him, but I didn't. I didn't want to scare him. Moreover, he had to be ready to deliver anywhere in the city when I became a full-time medical professional. No, there's nothing you should know. Just be careful and remember my instructions. Sure. Okay. Bye. With that, Luke drove away. I returned to my counter and continued working on my assignment, with one eye on the app screen to check for new orders. Around 20 minutes later, the phone rang. Hello, SSG Pizza Palace. What's your order? I said, as usual. Hi. Hey, it's Stacy. I'm calling from house number 87, 4th Street. Why is my order not here yet? Wait, what do you mean? The delivery guy left almost 20 minutes ago. He should have delivered your order and returned by now. Well, I haven't received my order yet. Now I was worried, almost panicked. I knew something was terribly wrong, but... I was still hoping that maybe there was a rational explanation as to why he was late. I picked up my own cell phone and dialed his number. It rang a few times and then went straight to voicemail. That's when I knew for sure something was wrong, as the kid always picked up his calls. I ran towards my car, got in, and drove towards 4th Street. As I was driving, I was constantly looking everywhere on the way to see if I could spot Luke's car, but I found nothing until I reached the place I most dreaded. I didn't want Luke to be here, and definitely not at two in the morning. But as I pulled my car on the crossroad, I saw Luke's car, parked beside the phone booth. I knew it was foolish of me to get out of the car at that spot, but I was hell-bent on saving Luke. As I got near the phone booth, I saw a figure leaning against the blur and stained glass of the phone booth, and I instantly knew what, or who it was. I opened the glass door, and Luke fell into my arms. He was struggling to breathe and drenched from head to toe. He couldn't talk, but he looked at me as if I just saved him from an extremely painful death. I immediately called 911, and within minutes, there were paramedics there to take him to a hospital. 
Later, I delivered the order that was still somehow warm in his car. I knew what had happened to him, and I blamed myself for putting him in that situation. The next day, I visited him in the hospital, and he was in critical condition. His family was there in the lobby when I met him. His mom thanked me for saving his life, but little did she know, I was the one who put him in that condition. The doctors predicted that he was in that condition because his lungs were full of water and he was drowning from the inside out. No one knew how so much water got into his lungs, and he didn't have any lung diseases. But I knew exactly what had happened there, as a long time ago, the same thing had happened to me too. You see, a long time ago this town wasn't too big, and there was a small lake where 4th Street is now. And in order to expand the town, the government and the mayor had forcefully evacuated people living there. But some people who refused to give up their lands and their houses were tied by the cruel mayor and drowned in the lake. As revenge, it's believed that the spirits of those people haunt that area. I myself never believed in this story. Until one night, I was 17 and driving home from the library at around 3 a.m., Although there was hardly any cars on the road at that time, I stopped my car at the red light on the same crossroad. While I was waiting for the light to turn green, I saw the phone booth, and as soon as my eyes landed on the old green booth, the phone inside started ringing. It was odd at first because no one calls a random phone booth, and secondly, not at three in the morning. So I decided to get out and pick up the phone. As soon as I entered the booth, I picked up the phone. There was static coming from the other end of the line. Hello? Who is it? I spoke into the line, but no reply. I figured someone must be joking, so I hung up the phone and pushed the door to get out of the booth. However, the door wouldn't budge. I tried to push it open, but nothing. I was stuck in the booth. I tried to break the glass, but it seemed bulletproof. I banged on the door, but... At that time, it was highly unlikely someone would pass by me to even notice I was stuck. Nevertheless, I kept on trying. Suddenly, my lungs started to fill up, and it was like I was drowning. I gasped for air, and it felt like I was drowning in a lake. That's when someone yanked the door open, and I collapsed into that person's arms. To this day, I have no clue who it was, but all I knew was that the next day I was in my bed. I had not suffered as severely as Luke, but I know the dread that fills you when you feel your lungs filling with water. I researched what this was. The next day in the library, I found an urban legend about the town. It said that that phone booth was a portal used by the spirits of the people killed by the mayor to communicate with the living, and they want to punish the people living in this town. The phone rings at random hours mostly at night and when someone enters the booth to pick up the phone, that person's lungs fill with water and he drowns from the inside out, the same way those people died. Although I never shared this with anyone to date, but throughout the years, multiple people have died in the same booth and in the same way. I don't know whether Luke will survive or not, but I hope he does. Please. Pray for him. As a chief magazine editor, I am always working extra hours in my office. I enjoy my work and hardly ever complain about work pressure. However, this also means I barely get time to cook lunch or dinner. There is a McDonald's a few blocks ahead of my office. I usually visited it at least four to five times a week. I mean, who doesn't love a cheesy burger on a weekday? But... I've always had this odd feeling of being watched since the moment I stepped in. Until today, it's not stopped. So, it all started three years ago when I took up this position. I knew it was going to be a demanding role, but it promised the professional exposure I wished for. I still remember the first time I walked through the double doors of the McDonald's. The distinct smell of freshly brewed coffee cheeseburgers, and a set of eyes followed me throughout the room. I ordered my food and sat at the last table beside the window, looking at the hustle and bustle of the street while I enjoyed my snack. Sometime later, I was sipping my Coke when the hair on the nape of my neck rose 
and I felt the weird stare again. From the moment I entered the McDonald's, I felt as if someone was keeping a watch on me. For the first time, I scanned the store and spotted an old, creepy-looking man sitting on a table near the fire exit. He was not eating anything, just sitting at the table and staring at me. He never blinked, just stared straight at me. His eyes were red and had dark bags under them. It looked as if he had not slept in days or had a hangover. However, nothing seemed to face him. He just kept looking at me, following my every move. I was a bit spooked, but tried to ignore the whole ordeal with the man. Soon I finished and walked up to the exit. He followed me with his eyes and gave me a creepy smile as I stepped out of the door. A few days later when I went there again, I was immediately greeted with his creepy stare. No doubt, the man was sitting at the same table scanning me with his eyes and keeping an eye over my every action. I ignored it, ate my food, and left quickly. Just as last time, he smiled at me, displaying his rotten, crooked teeth. But this time, he waved at me. Spooked, I moved out as quickly as I could and sped walk to my office just in case he followed. But he never did. Later that week, when I went to grab a bite again, the man was sitting at his usual table, staring at me and smiling. I knew this was odd, so I approached the girl at the counter and pointed at the man and asked about him. To my utter surprise, the girl looked at me funny and said in a very plain tone that the table was empty and no man was sitting there. I was certainly very shocked, but kept my cool and described the man. I asked her if a person with a similar appearance had visited the store ever. The girl said no and took my order. The worst part was, while I was conversing with the girl, the man was sitting at the table and smiling his creepy smile at me. It felt as if he was amused by my panic. I was stressed and scared. It was confusing. Only I could see the man and the girl on the counter couldn't. I blamed it on stress and the lack of sleep. I collected my order and decided to eat it in my cabin. When I stepped out of the door with my purse and food in hand, the man smiled, waved, and winked at me. Every time I walk out, I felt like he did something more. It scared me, and I decided not to visit the place for a while. A few weeks passed, and the incident at McDonald's had totally flown out of my mind. It was late, around 9 in the evening, and I was driving my car out of my parking lot. When I spot the same man standing across the street, at that moment, all I could think about was getting the hell out of that deserted parking lot. The man stood there and looked at me with a creepy expression. A ton of questions ran across my mind, but I had no time to find the answers to any of them. My whole body was in flight mode as I drove past him straight home. Once I was settled in, my mind was going round and round about all the possibilities. Had he followed me to my office? Did he know any of my personal information? Why was he following me? Did he know where I lived? And more importantly, why was I the only one able to see him? It was all so scary. I again thought this was a side effect of my busy schedule and stressed lifestyle. Before I saw a doctor, I decided to take a few days off to relax and calm my mind. Over the next few days, I spent my time cooking, reading, going to the park for walks and relaxing. Not once did I spot the man on my week off, and I was convinced that I was seeing things due to stress. However, it all changed the night before the day I was supposed to get back to work. I was sipping tea on my balcony when, on the sidewalk, right in front of my home, stood the creepy man from McDonald's. I was shocked and scared to death. The teacup slipped out from my hands and I ran inside shutting all the windows and blinds. 
I turned off all the lights and decided to peek out to check if he was still there. When I looked out, the sidewalk was empty. There was no sign of the man. The next day, I decided to visit the McDonald's again to confront the man myself as I was certain he would be there. When I entered the place, his usual table was empty and the manager of the store was standing at the counter. I approached him and narrated the incident. After hearing my story, the man revealed a shocking truth that cracked the floor beneath my feet. Mr. Dudley, the manager, told me what had happened in the McDonald's a few years ago. He said, When this place was newly opened, we had a few factory workers visit us regularly for lunch. The man you described was one of them. One afternoon during the lunch rush, we had three masked men come in and rob this place. The workers tried to unarm the masked robbers, but by the time the cops were called, one of the robbers had shot this man, and he died on the spot. It was a hit-and-run case. The masked men were never found. The worker never got his justice. Many customers before you had claimed to see the man smile and follow them around. I had no idea what to say to him. What should I do, Mr. Dudley, for the man to stop following me? Honestly, I don't know what you should do. The people who had claimed to see the man never visited here again, so I know nothing of this matter or what happened to them. The spirit of a dead worker was following me. It seemed to get one step closer every time I saw it. What do you guys think I should do? Why did the spirit choose to follow me? What must have happened to the people before me? And most importantly, how will this end? As it still follows me, I sometimes see it in the lobby of my office, in the park, below my window, and many other such places. What should I do to make it stop? When I was a little girl, my mother told me that fear was an emotion that required to be conquered. But in case it was impossible to fight against it, the best solution would be to flee. I never seemed to understand what she meant until three months ago, when I finally came across a fearsome situation. But before I start telling you my dreadful story, I would like to introduce myself. My name is Mary. When I graduated from high school, I got accepted to a college in another state. I was happy to move out of my family's house as I did not have any patience to put up with my parents' unending fights. At first, I was really happy. I have never felt that free in my life. However, as years passed, I started to face the consequences of my lack of attention to the classes. They warned me over and over again, and eventually, kicked me out of the college due to the classes I kept failing. I never had the courage to tell my parents about it because I was afraid that they would force me to live with them again, and that was something I did not desire. Because I was not able to stay in the dorm, I had to find a place to live, and to be able to pay the rent, I had to work. I searched for a job and was desperate to find one. I searched the internet, hoping to find a suitable job, but I could not find any. After a couple of days, I ended up being a server in Wendy's. It was my first working experience, so I had a hard time to adjust to having a career. A couple of months passed, and I realized the fact that I got used to working there. Of course, I would get tired time to time, and sometimes rude customers would piss me off. But other than that, I was quite happy working in Wendy's. I was not aware that this beautiful first job experience of mine was about to turn into a nightmare. The day that horrible event occurred was three months ago. It was a busy day and we were all exhausted as the time of closing arrived. Me and two other co-workers of mine stayed to close the restaurant. One of them was an old man who very rarely spoke to any of us. We did not know anything about him, but he would always gently smile and thank me whenever I helped him. His name was David and that was actually all the information I had about him. The other one was Liam. He was an extremely thin man in his 30s. He had black bags under his eyes. His skin was dirty and pale. He smelt like a wet dog that had been living inside a trash bin. Even though he was not too wretched looking, looking at him would still give me the creeps. He was a talkative person, 
who enjoy telling the same stories over and over again. As we were about to close the restaurant, Liam approached me and started to speak as if I was eager to listen to one of his stories. A great sense of boredom filled my heart. I told him that I forgot to clean the bathrooms and walked away. Of course, it was an excuse to get away from him. I went inside the bathroom and started to wait. The bathroom did not need to be clean as I had already done it a half an hour ago. But unfortunately, with Liam around, the bathroom was the only place I could find some peace. As I waited for five minutes, hoping that the others would finish their duties quickly so that I could go home as fast as I could, I heard footsteps coming towards the bathroom. The sound stopped and I heard a knocking on the bathroom door. It was Liam. He told me that he was bored and that he wanted to speak with me. With a frustrated voice, I said, I am busy. Why don't you go and talk with David? He seemed to not understand or care about my frustration as he replied. Everybody knows that David is not the chatty type. I tried talking with him but got bored immediately. Also, I really enjoy having conversations with you. I sensed a sudden shift on his tone as he said the last sentence. His voice became unsettling. I did not respond. He started to talk about his life, but his speech topic quickly changed into a sexual life and how good was his performance in bed. While talking, I could hear his deep breathing sound. Obviously, I was disturbed by his speech, and I told him to leave me alone. With a devilish voice, he said, I can show you how good I am in bed if you like me to. Once again, I screamed, leave me alone. My voice echoed in the bathroom. After a couple of seconds, I started to hear banging sounds, as if he was trying to break open the door. Thankfully, I was smart enough to lock the door, but this insane man was still trying to open the door. I cried for help. I screamed as loud as I could, hoping that David might come to my aid. After a while, Liam managed to break the door as he stood there right before me. He locked his eyes on my breasts and grinned. He opened his eyes so wide that I thought they were going to pop out of their sockets. Of course, of course, you want me to please you, my love, he said as he started to approach me slowly. At that moment, I heard the breaking sound of glass, and when I looked behind Liam, I saw David with a broken bottle in his shaking old hand. I realized that David had broke the glass bottle on Liam's head. Although blood was pouring from his head, Liam was acting as if nothing happened. He continued to walk towards me. He grabbed hold of me with the skeleton-like hands. His grip was way more powerful than I expected. I wanted to fight back, but my body was totally frozen. David jumped on Liam and tried to pull him away from me. Liam pushed him so hard that he fell to the ground and hit his head on the floor. I felt like my body was paralyzed. I could not move a single muscle. When I thought everything was over, I heard the sound of my mother in my head telling me to fight back or run away. Following the virtuous advice she gave me when I was a child, I found the strength to snap out of my paralyzed state. I pushed Liam back. He tried to grab me again, but I managed to run away from him. As I ran outside, I heard the police sirens. Seeing the blue and red lights shining as the police car arrived in front of the building, I felt a sense of relief. Two officers rushed toward me. Still shook by the recent incident, tears burst out of my tired eyes. I cried and told them what happened. While I was telling them the story, one of them looked behind me and shouted, He is running away! They started to run, and I watched them chase Liam. I watched them as they disappeared into the darkness of the night. After a moment, I heard gunshots. The policeman came back and told me that they got him. Apparently, the police had to shoot Liam nine times before he fell to the ground. I told them that David was lying inside, unconscious. They rushed inside and came out of the restaurant carrying David. He seems to be okay, one of the officers said. They told me that after David heard my screaming, he called the police, and that was the reason they were able to arrive so quickly. I thanked David. I thanked the officers, and I asked them what they knew about Liam. They told me that 
considering the way he resisted to the bullets, it was possible that Liam was under the influence of a substance. I resigned from my job at Wendy's the very next day. I called my parents and told them what happened. My father demanded me to return to them immediately. Normally, this would bother me. But after everything I went through, the idea of going back to my parents' house seemed good. I do not know why Liam was acting that way, but according to the police investigation, it is likely that he was a drug addict with an unstable mind. Although I know he is dead, I still wake up at night, seeing him in my nightmares, approaching me and saying, of course, you want me to please you. What was the most dangerous work accident you have ever experienced? I must admit, I am a bit clumsy. Several times I dropped oil or got electrocuted for a second for not drying my hands properly. All were normal things that could happen. All except one. That time it wasn't an accident. And it almost cost me my life. To be honest, this was not a one-day thing. I had to have seen the signs that I was in danger over time. But to tell you the truth, my innocence and impulsiveness worked against me. The first day it all happened, I was walking into my job at KFC. I was a relatively new employee, but there were a few newer employees than me. I nonchalantly got out of my car and headed towards the restaurant until I saw him. There was a man dressed as Colonel Sanders sitting in one of the chairs outside eating from a bucket of fried chicken. Upon seeing me, the man just stared at me, offering me a piece of chicken with a tetric smile. Somewhat uncomfortable, I ignored him and kept walking. I told my boss, and he, although surprised, said he was probably a joker. I decided to listen to him and continue working. The next day, the man was still there. Again, he was eating chicken, but this time, there was something different. This time, he was waiting for me, looking at me with his eyes. When he found me, he put down the bucket and stood up, walking towards me slowly. It may have just been a man disguised as Colonel Sanders, but the way he walked, the smile he had on his face as he did so, the whole combination was genuinely theatrical. Frightened, I ran inside the restaurant. As I reached the door, the man stopped, turned around, and went back to his chair to continue eating chicken. I ran to my boss's office in a panic and told him everything that happened. Unlike last time, this time he did react, and I watched as he called the police from his cell phone. I must admit that at first I thought that maybe this was a publicity stunt by my boss, but I noticed in his eyes the fear for me. He was as terrified as I was. I continued working normally and heard the police arrive. I couldn't watch as they took him away because I was cleaning the bathrooms, but the boss told me that the problem had been solved. And that made me feel much calmer. Knowing that the man was probably not happy, I continued working normally until it was time to leave. My boss asked me to stay until the last minute, and I had accepted. At least I could leave the restaurant with him and not alone, and I admit I was still a little scared. When it was time to leave, I should have noticed all the danger signs, but I didn't. First, my boss didn't go out with me. He had told me a few minutes earlier that he had to leave urgently. I walked to the exit as I was locking up alone, and as soon as I closed the door, he was there. The man dressed as Colonel Sanders was standing in front of me. The only difference was that this time he didn't have fried chicken. He had a knife. I ran as fast as I could to my car, but before I could get in, he put his hand on the door and wouldn't let me open it. This time, I had him face to face, staring at me with those horrible white contact lenses and that insane grin. The man raised his knife, ready to cut me, when a shadow came out from behind him and pushed him. It was my boss. The two began to fight, and with one push, my boss escaped and got into my car with me. I accelerated the car as fast as I could, while Colonel Sanders just watched us. Out of danger... We both relaxed. I realized I didn't have my cell phone. I must have dropped it while running. I wanted to let my family know I was safe, so my boss lent me his cell phone. 
I was about to call, but something made me curious. How had this man escaped from the police? I went into my boss's call history, and I couldn't believe it. There was no 911 call. At that very moment, I began to question a lot of things. Why hadn't my boss called the police? Why did he leave me on that last shift? Why did he say he had to leave early if he was really there? Why didn't Sanders chase us after we struggled with him? At that moment, I realized that somehow my boss was involved in what was going on. I turned and looked at him. He was staring at me, terrified. He noticed that I noticed. In a split second, he pulled the gun out of his pocket. But before he could do anything, I braked the car and he flew out the window. After that, I accelerated the car as fast as I could, while from behind, he tried to shoot me without success. I never went back to that job, but I filed a report with the police as soon as I got home. That same day, they arrested both my boss with the exposed shooting at me on the street camera and the man disguised as Sanders. My boss never revealed his motives, but Sanders did. The man confessed to the police that he had been hired to give me the scare of my life, but he didn't hold back and tried to kill me, so my boss interceded. Apparently, he wanted that KFC place to be famous for having a scary man surrounding it, and he wanted to use me to tell the story. He didn't mind me dying, but it would have gotten the restaurant shut down. Today, I am at the trial with him for attempted murder. I didn't have to resign from KFC until a year later as he was fired the moment I filed the complaint. During that last injury, I was calmer, but I must admit, I was very afraid. I would always ask someone to walk me to the car, just in case that scary man decided to come back. Back when I was a teenager, I had a girlfriend named Olivia. Although she was a teenager too, she was in college, two years older than me and much more mature. She was the nicest human I'd ever known. We lived in the same neighborhood, played together, went to the same school until she graduated, and had the same group of friends. So it wasn't a surprise to our parents when we both announced that we were dating. She was 19 and I was 17 when we both decided to work at our local Wendy's. It was a small outlet and mostly the college and high school crowd frequented that restaurant. We wanted to buy a car so I could drive the four miles out of our town to visit her at community college. We were both very excited about the prospect of having a car and not having to borrow our parents' cars to see one another. Most weekends we worked late in the restaurant and often offered to close the restaurant. This would allow us to spend more time together. Although Olivia was older than me, she was a short petite girl whereas I was a six foot tall football player. Also working late for an hour or so paid us more, which meant we could add more money to our collection to buy a car before the summer break was over. I was very happy to get so much time with Olivia. Little did I know that that's all I was going to get with her. At that young age, we had planned our whole lives together. I was excited to join her in the community college, though I could easily secure a spot in the Ivy League colleges with my sports background. However, I wanted to be with her, so I decided to go to the community college. One evening while we were working in the restaurant as usual, a group of my high school friends came in to have a quick bite. I was quite popular in the college, so they all greeted me and ordered their food. That evening, it was again just me and Olivia and the Wendy's, as our co-workers had some emergency. The kids from my school were enjoying themselves in one of the booths when Olivia and I were getting their orders ready. Hey there. Sam had walked up to the counter. Hey Sam, anything I could get you other than your order? No, Jack. I'm here to tell you guys something. You know my dad is a cop, right? So, he received intel from one of the other sheriffs that there's a killer on the loose in our county, and he is targeting shopkeepers, workers, waiters, etc., who are alone in the shops and restaurants at night. You guys work pretty late. Just take care, okay? Olivia was listening too, as Sam warned us. Okay, buddy. Thanks for giving us a heads up. We'll take care. With that, Sam returned to his table where my other friend sat. After my friends left, there were no more customers, so we decided to head home. A week later, Olivia and I realized that we had collected the required amount to purchase the car we both wanted. With the help of my dad, 
We bought the car and were super happy to drive to and from work every day. It was a black Toyota, nothing fancy, but at least it was a first step towards our future together. I remember we were both so happy. In early July one evening, the other workers had left early to enjoy some movie that had just been released. Although now we didn't need extra money to save up for the car, we still enjoyed working late. So that evening too, we were more than happy to cover up for our colleagues. Our car was parked right in front of the entrance to the door in the parking lot. Olivia was cleaning up the inside counters and I was setting the tables right. That's when we heard the alarm of our car go off. It was so loud that for a second we were confused. No one was in the restaurant except us, and in the past hour or so we hadn't spotted anyone in the parking lot as well. This happened back when there were no CCT cameras, so we couldn't even look into the camera feed to see if anyone was there. The alarm was still going off. Someone had to do something to stop the noise. A few minutes later, I saw the most horrid scene of my life. I don't remember why I looked up, but when I did, I saw him there. He was standing with his face pressed against the window of the restaurant, and his eyes were pitch black, without any pupils or anything. His face looked demonic, and he had a silly grin pasted on it. I was terrified just looking at him, but when I realized that Olivia was still cleaning the counters, my fear spiked sky high. She was unaware of this person still busy cleaning the damn counter. The man and I stared through the glass at one another. His smile didn't waver an inch, and his dark matted hair was pasted to his face. His skin was yellow and unnaturally textured. He had a big butcher knife in his hand, which he raised and showed me through the window. I was helpless at that moment. I watched the man run towards Olivia behind the counter as I stood there beside our new car in the parking lot, looking at them from outside. No matter how fast I ran, I was sure you would kill my girlfriend. I was truly, utterly helpless. I sprinted towards the doors, nonetheless, and yanked the front door open. I jumped behind the counter and saw the lifeless body of Olivia, covered in blood and with knife marks on her neck and torso. She was dead, and the knife was lying beside her. I knelt and held her body in my hand and sobbed. However, one thing I noticed was that the killer was nowhere to be seen. There was no back door to the restaurant and no other exit either, and he surely didn't walk out of the front exit. So, where did he go? I don't remember what happened next how the cops got there and for how long I was holding my girlfriend's lifeless bloody body. The next thing I remember was the detective saying that it was an open and shut case, as I was the killer. They had found my fingerprints on the murder weapon when in fact I would never touched it. Also, they didn't find any footprints other than mine and Olivia's behind the counter, which concluded that I was the killer. No matter how much I tried to convince them that I wasn't the murderer and there was a man who did this, no one believed me. Not my parents, not the cops, nor my friends. Now, I stand before the same Wendy's restaurant that I and Olivia worked in, after being out of prison 35 years later. Till this day, I could not find the proof of the black-eyed man who killed my girlfriend and ruined my life. Was it I who really killed her? Or was there another man, or ghost perhaps? What do you guys think? Have you ever worked at a fast food place? I haven't, but a friend of mine used to work at KFC. He worked in the front booth taking the orders. So every weekend, a few friends of mine and myself would go to this particular KFC to support our friend. This KFC had been there for a few years, so even when our friend Zach wasn't working there, we visited this fast food restaurant to grab a quick bite. However, we didn't know any of the staff except for Zach. One day after his shift, Zach came straight to my house where we were having a boys' night. He brought a few burgers, fries, cokes, and some other food with him. Josh, one of my friends, had just arrived before Zach from his mechanic shop. He was super hungry, so he was the first one to start eating the food. The moment Josh took a bite, he made a weird face. 
Hey, Zack. Why does this burger taste different, man? Is the meat old or something? Uh, what? No, man. I saw the cooks open a fresh bag of meat right before I placed the order. Really? Because these taste funny. Try it, guys. We all ate the burgers, and yep, they did taste a bit different. Not in a bad way, but just a bit chewy. Nevertheless, we boys didn't mind a little bit of taste difference, and we ate the food anyways, and got back to our video games. A few days later when we visited the KFC, there were cops parked outside the restaurant and all the staff was being interrogated by the cops. We entered the restaurant and only one girl was at the order counter and a single cook was inside. The rest of the staff was speaking with the cops. So I asked her what the matter was and why were the cops there? She told me that one of the cook's wife was missing for a week. The wife's sister filed a complaint, and the cops were here for the investigation. They wanted to talk to them about the cook's wife who went missing. That night, we were having a cookout in one of our friend's backyards, and Zach arrived there after his shift. Hey, Zach, what was that all about? Why were the cops in your restaurant? There was a cook named Mario. He looks literally like a real-life Mario with that bushy mustache and all. He's a little weird, you know. Never really talks to anyone much. He does his work and leaves. Never interacts with the other staff beyond what's necessary. We all thought he might be one of those broody types, so we too kept some distance from him. Until last week, when he didn't come into work for three days straight. The manager tried to get in contact with him, but it was to no avail. When he showed up on the fourth day, he was acting in the same way. No explanation for his disappearance. The manager didn't bother either. Until today, when an entire task force showed up at our doorstep asking about Mario. They say his wife disappeared around the same time Mario was absent from work. They suspect him to be behind the disappearance. No one clearly knows what happened to his wife, and the cops didn't tell us much. They just asked us about Mario and his behavior at work, and we told them what we knew. If you ask me, I think his wife might have left him. I mean, look at the guy. He looks boring and is a weirdo. Who'd want to marry that guy in the first place? We all made some jokes about the incident and continued our cookout. Suddenly, while eating the burger, Zach said to Josh, Hey dude, forgot to tell you that day you complained about the taste of the burger? Turns out, some more customers were complaining about that weird taste, too. Maybe the meat sent by the company wasn't that great. Nevertheless, just wanted to let you know. Yeah, man, no problem. Not the first time I've eaten some bad meat, Josh replied, laughing. And that was it. A few weeks later, a news article was sent by one of my friends on our WhatsApp group. That article was about a missing woman whose bones were found in a trash pit near the local KFC. Now, this article didn't have names or any details. It was just a big article about how could the bones of a woman who was missing for over a month get into a place like that. I don't know why, but I had a suspicion. A weird feeling in my bones after reading that article. So instead of waiting for further news, I called Zach. Hey man, what's up? Hey Zach, do you have some time to talk? Yeah man. What happened? So, remember you told us about a weird cook, Mario, whose wife was missing on the day of our cookout? Mm, yep, I remember. There was a sudden edge to Zack's voice, as if there was some information he didn't want to share or was trying very hard not to spill. But I continued as if I didn't notice. You saw the news article that's on our WhatsApp group about the missing woman's bones, right? You know anything about it? He left a long breath on the other side of the line, like he was about to tell me something he was trying to hold in. You remember the time when I got the burgers from KFC, and Josh said they were weird? Yeah, I do. What about it? Yeah, so, the cops visited the KFC a couple of times, and once they came with dogs, and that's when they found the bones. But the crazy part is, the investigation that followed... The cops had a suspicion that Mario was behind all this, but they had no clue what they were about to find. Mario and his wife had a big fight, and she threatened to leave him. The dude couldn't bear the thought and stabbed her with a knife 
38 times. The sad part is he didn't stop at that. He chopped her body into pieces, took all the bones and wrapped them in a trash bag. That's when he took the three-day leave. He froze her body parts. When he returned to the job, he dumped the bones in the trash bin. But the next thing he did was truly horrifying. He put the frozen bags of his wife's body in our meat freezer and then used her as meat in our burgers. By then, Zack was gagging himself just thinking about it. Is that why Josh was complaining about the taste? Yeah, and not just him. Almost over a hundred people ate that woman thinking it was their regular burger patty. God, truly disgusting shit. Now the cops haven't made this information public in order to not freak the people out, but the staff knows about it. We were asked by the cops to check if there were any more bags full of her body parts. Please don't tell this to anyone, especially Josh. We're trying to keep this as low as possible. I don't want anyone to freak. Yeah, man, that's okay. Later that month, the whole story was out and Mario was convicted of murder and other charges. But now, every time I go to KFC or any other fast food restaurant, all I can think about is if the meat is chicken, beef, or am I being fed a human? Hey, stop! You're pouring a liter of soda on my car! Stop it! You're what are you doing? Legally. I, I told you to move it! You didn't move it! I was just delivering it. a pizza! Oh, that's my pizza! No, it's I not! Hey, stop! The following story is an animated, dramatized version of the footage. Over the past few years, a lot of delivery services have opened doors of opportunity. It's been really convenient when you want something, but don't want to or can't get it yourself. Not only does it benefit customers, but it's been an amazing side gig when you want that extra cash. I was a graveyard security guard at night, so during the day, I would make a few DoorDash deliveries. I'm Kenny, and I loved my side job doing DoorDash until I came across this random woman on a street I frequently delivered on. For the past year, this is a woman who works from home and orders from DoorDash frequently. She took full advantage of this service by ordering from anywhere and everywhere. Most of the time she ordered healthier foods like salads and iced tea. But once in a while, girlfriend indulged herself on Little Caesar's Pizza. Her name was Alyssa and she was easily a decade older than me, but I had a crush on her. Delivering to her is a bit out of my way, but one day, I decided to go the extra mile for that bigger buck. That's when I saw her, and I knew the next time this address placed an order, I would be the one to take it. For the past year, we've had an ongoing flirtatious interaction between us. I wanted to ask her out, but I was too damn shy. I swear she was attracted to me too, but I could never work up the courage. I saw Alyssa two times a week, and I finally worked up the courage to ask her out. I rang her doorbell and she answered in her Zoom meeting attire. Business on the top, lazy on the bottom. Her hair was up in a slick ponytail, a blouse, and my god, she usually wore yoga pants, but that day, she had no pants. Kinney, my DoorDash hero. Alyssa smiled as she leaned seductively against the doorway. I responded bashfully. Uh, hey, Alyssa, I got your chicken Caesar salad. I held up the bag and her iced tea, and she took them with gratitude in her eyes. Delivered in perfect condition. Thank you, Kenny. I can always count on you. You're very welcome, Alyssa. I flashed my signature flirtatious smile at her, and I swear her cheeks turned a shade of pink. You're not seeing anyone, right, Alyssa? Of course I'm not, silly. Why do you ask? I'm hoping to take you out on a date sometime. She smiled at me as though she'd been waiting for me to say something along those lines. I'm free this weekend. Pick me up at 8 o'clock, Friday night? Yes, absolutely. Can't wait. Until then, you better text me. I walked away with a pep in my step. I got in my car and shot her a text. She responded with a winky face and I felt my body warm with happiness. I get a date with Alyssa. It was a Tuesday afternoon, so I had a couple of days to prepare for our date. That week, she was ordering DoorDash every single day. It made me feel weird delivering her food as she avoided talking about the date unless we were texting. I tried not to think of it much, but it bothered me. 
Even on Friday, she ordered DoorDash and got a Little Caesars pizza with a two-liter Diet Coke. I found it odd she got a soda as she usually got some sort of iced tea. Even if the restaurant didn't serve it, she'd order it from a gas station in a bottle. I shouldn't have been surprised as she was acting weird since I asked her out. I parked in front of her house as usual and I pulled up the app to show I had arrived. With fall approaching, I had my windows rolled down in my truck that day to enjoy the oncoming crisp air. I heard a bang on the hood of my truck and looked up to see this elderly woman shouting profanities at me. Move your fucking truck, asshole. You can't park here, you son of a bitch. She continued to pound on the hood of my truck as she yelled at me. Ma'am, I... Can you please stop hitting my truck? I'm just making a food delivery and I'll be gone. She walked to the passenger window and snatched the two-liter Diet Coke out of the seat. Excuse me, that is not yours. Fuck off, prick. I told you to leave. You can't park here. Now get out. Ma'am, I'm just making a DoorDash delivery. If you'd let me get this done, I can be gone. She ignored me, opened the soda bottle, and proceeded to dump it all over my windshield. Do you understand now? You can't park here and you need to leave. Stop dumping that fucking soda all over my truck. Get out of here, fucker. She went back up to the passenger window. Oh, look. It's a pizza. Don't you? She reached in and snatched the box, and I tried to grab it out of her hands, but she jerked it away. Damn it! I cursed as rage built up inside me. I looked up to see that old woman getting away with Alyssa's food, and I don't know what came over me. I've had to go through anger management before. I started to channel my inner coping mechanisms and took deep breaths. It was a $5 pizza and a soda. Nothing I couldn't replace. I sat there gripping my steering wheel. DoorDash is how I paid for this damn truck, and I was not about to let myself screw it up with my rage. I sat there, seeing nothing but red, trying to change my thinking and calm myself down, when suddenly a slice of pizza hit the windshield. I jerked in response to being startled and saw the cheese, pepperoni, and sauce oozing slowly down the windshield. Next thing I knew, a slice of pizza hit me square in the face. It was still very hot, and it boiled against my skin. I screamed out in pain as I shook off the pizza and peeled the cheese away from my cheek. I looked over and rolled up my window in time before another slice collided with me. That old bat was back harassing me. I told you to leave. That had done it for me. I don't know who this psycho, wrinkly bitch thought she was, but I'd had enough and nothing was going to hold me back from showing this old bitty that she was messing with the wrong guy. I put my truck into drive and peeled out after her. She screamed at the top of her lungs and dropped the pizza, running as fast as her frail legs could carry her. I revved up my engine as I rammed my truck into her. Her body flew up onto the hood of my truck and hit the roof, rolling back down and hitting the ground. The cracking sound of bones shattering echoed through the street. You wanted me to leave? You just got your way, you crazy old bat! I could hear her screaming out in pain as I put my truck in reverse and ran over her again. Her flesh squelched under my tires as I dismembered her. I put the truck in drive and went to run her over again, but this time, another body flew up over my truck and landed with a crashing thud on the pavement. I heard a familiar voice scream out, and I put the truck in park, getting out. I ran to the person lying on the ground. Alyssa. Blood was sputtering out of her mouth, and she was choking. Oh my god! What have I done? I grabbed my phone and called an ambulance. I knelt down and cradled her head in my lap. Alyssa, I'm... So sorry. K Kitty, you just killed m my Aunt Faye. That was your aunt? I'm sorry. She was crazy. My vision began to blur. The girl I'd been chasing for a year was now dying in my lap next to her aunt that I single-handedly turned into roadkill. Alyssa was gone by the time the ambulance arrived, and I was arrested on the spot. It's... Not that I won't do DoorDash anymore, it's that I can't. If you're wondering if I regret my choices, I don't. That wasn't the first time I've killed doing a DoorDash delivery. They've yet to find out about the others. I knew Alyssa was slipping her aunt some food, which she personally asked me to slip some poison into to drive her to the point of insanity. I never intended to run over her, but... Collateral damage happens. Next time you trust a family member to order DoorDash for you, I recommend you double-check your food. 
You never know what someone's true intentions are. Even if you think you know them. Panera Bread is a famous place, known for serving comfort food year-round. They have their signature way of making sandwiches, soups, breakfast food, and pasta. It is good food, but it can be a bit overpriced. I work at my local Panera Bread in Cleveland, Ohio, and honestly, it's a decent place to work. People understand that it's a place where you have to pay a little more. Customers have always understood that. Until one day, someone didn't, and it nearly cost me my life. It all started about three months ago. This customer came into our establishment. She looked as though she was out of place. Along with serving comfort food, Panera prides itself on its elegance and calm atmosphere for customers to dine in. This customer seemed too irate and eccentric to be here, but I put on a customer-friendly smile and called her forward. I can help you over here, ma'am. What can I get started for you? What can I get started for you? Do you assume I'm going to pay these prices? I don't make the prices. And if you're not here to eat, our restroom is in the back. The first door on your right. I don't need to use the restroom. I want to eat. I'm happy to serve you. Here are our cheapest meal options. I showed her the menu where our cheapest items were and she had a look at it. She simply scoffed and walked out. My manager Jake came out just as the woman left in a huff. Is everything okay? I shrugged. She didn't want to eat here, I guess. Weird. Yeah, it was. Hey Allison, I wanted to tell you that my vacation is coming up in a couple of months. Would you be interested in training to take over for me while I'm gone? Seriously? That would be great. Will I get a pay increase? Only for the time. You're the manager. I'm definitely interested. Perfect. I'll mark you down and we'll start next week. Even though it was while Jake was on vacation, I was excited to take over for him for an entire month. I was saving up for this expensive makeup collection that I wanted. And the manager's salary would help me get it quicker than I thought. I was a fast learner. And thanks to the knowledge I had already acquired, everything was going to be a breeze. Once a week, the same lady would come in. Each time I saw her, she grew more irate and more haggard. She always wanted to come in and eat, and she did the same thing every time. She would tell me she was not paying these prices, and then walk out. One day, I even tried offering her a meal, and she huffed at me kicked the counter, and stormed out. At that time, Jake had told me that he wouldn't let her back into the restaurant. The next day, when she came in, if I wanted to prove myself ready to take over, I had to be the bearer of bad news. Ma'am, you've been coming here every week, and you're starting to damage our property. We haven't done anything to you. So we have to ask you to leave this establishment and not come back. Her eyes widened, and one twitched out of anger. Are you banning me from coming in before I can even order? That's the problem, ma'am. You don't order. You come in, you have a fit, and when you leave you upset our other customers. But today I want to buy something. Okay. Then what can I get started for you? I want the broccoli cheddar soup, two dinner rolls, and a cup of coffee. All right, that's going to be $12.95. Will you be paying cash or by card? She raised an eyebrow. Does it matter? No, I only ask so I know whether to hit the cash or the card button. She pulled out a $20 bill and gave it to me. I put it in the system and gave the change to her. We prepared her food and we gave it to her. She looked at it and threw the tray onto the floor. Hot coffee and soup splattered all over the place and the dishes shattered. One of the glass fragments scraped a little boy while he was walking by with his mother. 
He began to cry as his poor little cheeks started to bleed. You hurt my baby, the woman cried out. Jake, call the police, I hollered. As I went around the counter, the woman was grinning ear to ear. You can't ban me from this establishment. Take this as a lesson. The police are on their way, and you will never set foot in this place again. I turned to the woman and the little boy. I am so sorry this happened. Please sit over there, and I will get the first aid kit. Thank you. Our customers gathered around, asking the little boy if he was okay. Many people offered to pay for their meal. That psycho woman ran out of the restaurant. The cops came, and the mother gave her statement. But they couldn't find the psycho anywhere. The little boy calmed down. When I offered him a free cookie, and we bandaged his wound. I also gave her a gift certificate to bring back with her son to get a free meal, and she took it with gratitude. The woman left with her son, and I truly hoped we'd see them again. They were just sweet, innocent bystanders, and a grown woman's tantrum. I finished out the rest of my shift, and went to go take the trash out before I left for the night. If only I'd known offering to take the trash out for Jake would nearly cost me my life. The sun was going down, and I went back to the restaurant into a dark alley where the dumpsters were. As I approached the large metal box, the lid opened, and out jumped a person who hit me hard in the face. I stumbled backwards, and suddenly, I was slammed into a brick wall. The wind was knocked out of me, and before I could catch my breath, I felt my face starting to burn, as if being slashed by fingernails. She moved so fast, and my brain was trying to process the trauma of everything. I was frozen. I couldn't put up a fight against her. She pushed me to the ground and began kicking my stomach repeatedly. All I could do was double over in pain and cough. A metallic taste began to form in my mouth as blood came out. With a few kicks to my face, stomach, and back, I began to feel nothing. My consciousness was fading. And the last thing I heard was a shriek and the sound of a metal object hitting something. I blacked out, thinking I was officially beaten to death. I woke up in the hospital. I didn't know how much time had passed, but I was hooked up to all kinds of things, from breathing tubes to a heart monitor to an IV. I heard a voice say, she's awake, and then a few minutes later, my parents and my older sister came in. They told me I had been out for a couple weeks. I had suffered severe brain damage and had broken a few ribs, causing internal bleeding. I was taken to the hospital just in time. I had to stay in the hospital while my body continued to recover. Jake and my other co-workers came to see me. Jake told me that he was leaving and he heard a commotion in the alley. When he checked it out, he hit the woman over the head with a crowbar and instantly killed her. He wasn't prosecuted, and it was proven an accident. Tears welled up as I thanked Jake profusely for saving my life. A few days before I was cleared to go home, I had a surprise visitor. The woman and her little boy came to see me. We heard what happened, and we wanted to come see if you were okay. Oh, that's very sweet of you. I'm glad you woke up. We were so devastated to hear that you had been assaulted. I'm glad that your cute little guy made a full recovery too. Yes, he talks about you all the time. Really? Her expression changed to something more sinister, and I had a horrible feeling in the pit of my stomach. Yes, about how you should have died instead of his grandmother. What? What are you talking about? She explained how it was all an act to get free food from Panera Bread. Her mother would come in and start acting crazy, refuse to buy food and all that. Then when the restaurant was ready to ban her, she would give in and buy something. She would throw everything and do something to hurt the boy. And then the mom would get upset and gain sympathy from the other customers and employees. 
They'd done it at multiple Panera Bread restaurants. While she had me distracted with her confession, her devil of a son was by my IV tube, injecting it with air. But at that very moment, my mother came into the room, and they both left. I was safe once again. Hi, my name is Phil. This week has been the absolute worst in my life. And to top it off, I am now faced with a decision that will affect my life and that of my loved ones forever. I simply don't know what to do. I work in an illegal business. To avoid incriminating myself, let's say I help move merchandise from one party to another. I give my customers the ability to purchase substances that aren't exactly legal and cannot be found anywhere else. I think you can connect the dots as to what I do. With that being said, from day one, I knew the dangers that came tied to my line of work. I knew what I signed up for, and I don't regret it. I have seen friends killed, co-workers disappear overnight, never to be seen again. And I myself had close calls with competing gangs. But as long as I stayed a step ahead of others, I have always been okay. Until this week. This horrifying week's events began Monday in my usual place of business, Dairy Queen. I know it might sound like an odd location to conduct my illegal business, but really, it's perfect. First, it's extremely public, so our competition will never target us in such a highly visible venue. Second, our customers feel safe in Dairy Queen. A lot of my clientele are first-time buyers and users, and we try to make the whole experience as seamless as possible. They usually contact me through phone and we meet up inside for the transaction. Third, Dairy Queen has some delicious ice cream. So, I am able to conduct my business and indulge in some delicious treats. <laughs> it's the little things. <laughs> On Monday, I sat in my usual booth just as a customer had left. I sat counting my wads of bills when a feeling of being watched came over me. I stared forward as a shadow began to form in front of me. Someone stood directly behind me. Dread filled me. Had they been watching my previous customer and me? How would I explain having $700 in my hand? The shadow grew and a cold hand touched the back of my shoulder. I suppressed the urge to jump and tried to act natural. Hello, came a high-pitched voice. I turned slowly, expecting the worst, only to find myself with a toddler not much older than seven. He waved at me and handed me a small slip of paper. I'm so sorry, exclaimed a woman. She hurried over. I looked away for a minute and Jimmy got away from me. I'm, I'm so sorry. She scooped up the kid like a football and walked away. From over his mother's shoulder, the little boy's head bobbed with each step she took, staring at me. He smiled cunningly and waved. I began to relax again and glanced at the small slip of paper. It read, I saw you. The handwriting was shaky and uneven. I glanced forward again, but the boy was gone. Was this a joke? Was he sent by someone to deliver a message? The handwriting looked like that of a child, so maybe I was being overly paranoid. You can never be too careful in this line of work. So I packed my things, grabbed my ice cream cone, and left the Dairy Queen. I drove through a secluded dirt road, trying to avoid the eyes of policemen and other law enforcement. At a distance, an old 1970s muscle car appeared to be stranded on the side of the road. But as I drove past it, I glanced at my rearview mirror and saw a cloud of dirt that had materialized from the muscle car's acceleration as it joined the dirt road, gaining speed towards me. Shit, I thought. I accelerated, but so did the old car behind me. He drew closer and closer, now inches away from my rear bumper. I was sure I wasn't being paranoid now. This man was out to get me. I observed him from my mirror, now close enough for me to notice distinct tattoos on the driver's bearded face. He reached to his glove compartment, lowered his window, and I stared as his arm extended out the window. He was gripping a pistol in his hand, aimed directly at my car. 
I floored the gas pedal. But even over the car's engine's straining noises, the first bullet rang loudly into the old dirt road. The bullet whizzed over my roof. There was momentary silence, broken by the sound of the second bullet. My left mirror shattered an explosion, sending glass and pieces of metal in all directions. His shots were getting closer. At a distance, a stoplight shone green, marking the first signs of reaching the downtown area. Surely if I made it downtown, he wouldn't continue shooting among so many pedestrians and law enforcement, right? Sure enough, as I passed the first stoplight, the car swerved, turned back, and disappeared into the sunset. I was safe, but for how long? The rest of the week, as a measure of precaution, I moved around and conducted business in various Dairy Queens around town. Each day took me to a new location, but I couldn't shake the feeling that I was continuously being watched. Yesterday, I entered the DQ, ordered my large ice cream cone, and sat in a booth next to a window in front of the parking lot. I began glancing at my phone, waiting for my customer to arrive. Footsteps approached. I stared forward as a man approached my booth. He stood right in front of the booth, but didn't say a word. Uh, can I help you? I asked impatiently. He stared, the edge of his mouth curling. I noticed the tattoos on this man's neck. Look, man, I don't want any trouble, I said, beginning to feel afraid. The man looked out the window. In the parking lot, an old muscle car in excellent condition stood. The driver and the man next to me locked eyes. They nodded a quick bob. The man patted my shoulder and walked away. Shit, I thought. They found me. Should I leave now? Will they follow me? I began collecting my things, but in the commotion, I didn't hear anybody approach me. He slithered quickly into my booth. Listen, Phil, said the man in a cool and calm voice. I hope you're not planning on leaving just yet. We're here to help you. A similar smirk overcame his face. How do you know my name? I asked, hiding the fear in my voice. I wouldn't worry about that as much as... He began but was interrupted by a loud voice. I turned wildly, blood pumping with adrenaline. Sorry, said the teenager in a Dairy Queen uniform. I asked if you needed anything else. She smiled kindly. I shook my head, indicated I didn't want to talk to her. The man in the booth laughed. <laughs> You're on edge now, aren't you? What would an innocent man as yourself have to fear? He asked, his voice heavy with sarcasm. Fuck you, I responded, standing up to leave. I told you, I wouldn't leave if I were you, he said, but he was behind me now as I made my way outside the door. I exited, absorbing the hot sunshine. Okay, I have to be extra careful now, I told myself. I cannot be followed. What should I? In that instant, a body tackled me to the ground landing heavy on my side. I heard a crack emitted from my shoulder as it came down hard onto the concrete. Stay the fuck down, the voice whispered sharply. If you know what's good for you, stay the fuck down. Before I had a chance to respond, the Dairy Queen's parking lot became a war zone. Automatic rifles peeked from the windows of various cars in the parking lot, showering the area with stray bullets. Various customers who I had assumed were regular police, pulled out pistols and began firing back. FBI, drop your weapons! I covered my head and recoiled with every loud blast. I glanced up and noticed various men, tattooed and not, laying lifelessly on the ground. On one, a small river of blood trickled from his mouth and nose. The sun glistened off the blood from another lifeless body. A small bullet-sized crater in the center of his head oozed blood and pus. They all laid among bullet shells, blood, and debris. After what appeared to be hours, the firefight ended. Silence filled the Dairy Queen parking lot, broken only by the gasping of a tattoo man that grasped at a bullet hole in his neck. Our eyes met momentarily. He stared, pleading, gasping like a fish out of water. After a few seconds, life left his eyes. He laid there, just like the rest of the corpses. Phil Mendoza, came a deep, hefty voice. Are you all right? 
I am Special Agent Michael White of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. You are under arrest. In the police station, a group of officers comprised of FBI agents, local policemen, and sheriff deputies explained the situation. My hometown had grown to be a hotspot for illicit activities involving my group and three other gangs that competed for the territory. The FBI had caught wind of the situation and had been observing me, tailing me, and bugging my phones. For the last months, the FBI had been fully aware of my activities, following me to lead them to the competition. I was their bait, and it worked. I am now at a crossroads. The FBI has offered me a deal. I can inform them with everything I know of my group's operations and that of any competitor in exchange for my freedom, or spend the rest of my life in prison. I am afraid if I inform and walk out of here, Competitors on the outside will target my family and me. If I do not inform, I will never see my family again. What would you do? Hello, viewers. My name is Arthur. I am 31 years old now. Today, I am going to tell you a story that is very creepy and disturbing when I worked at Arby's Restaurant seven years back. I was working there as a receptionist, and I loved my job. I used to see new people there every day. I love meeting new people and mingling with them. Well, let me tell you, three beautiful girls also worked at Arby's. Among them, I liked Jolly Clarkson. She was 24 at that time. She was gorgeous and was very tall too. Her eyes were blue and her hair was dark red, which was always short and made her even sexier. Apart from this, she was very hardworking and she loved to work every time. She hardly used to take leave from her work. My coworker at Arby's named Robbie had become a good friend. He used to share everything with me, and he also told me everything about his ex-girlfriend. He was a bit funny and flirty type of guy, and he used to flirt with every girl at Arby's. Maybe because of this habit, his ex-girlfriend left him. He was also brilliant to see, and girls used to fall into his trap easily. But Jolly was a girl who didn't fall for his hoax at all. One day, suddenly, Robbie came to me and told me many surprising things about Madam Courtney. At first, I could not believe his words, but when he explained it to me, I felt that Madame might be looking for a new boyfriend. As she was 34 and her husband was 45 then, perhaps she was not getting what she wanted from her old husband. He said, Man, you can't believe. Dude, you won't believe how sexy she is. Man, she is completely in my heart and my mind is blown. She likes me a lot. And you know what? Today she called me for some work inside her office room and suddenly she held my hand. I couldn't believe it at first like you. Our boss Thomas was getting old. That's why he could not handle everything at Arby's alone because of the heavy workload. That's why his wife Courtney started coming to the office most of the time. She was young, beautiful and hardworking and her height was quite tall. She had a fair complexion and brown eyes. She loved wearing tight clothes and used to come to the office mostly wearing them. At the same time, she always liked to apply red lipstick. She looked very sexy and hot. On the contrary, her nature towards employees at Arby's was excellent and polite. She spoke to the boys at the restaurant very openly as she was an open-minded and independent woman. That's why it was spread in the office that she was looking for a new boyfriend Maybe all these things were lies. Whatever it was at that time, my focus was only on Jolly. After some time, Valentine's Day was about to come and I had prepared for Valentine's Day also. I was about to propose to Jolly. But before I could propose, a guy had proposed to her first and his name was Emerson. I was a little sad to see that, but I loved her and my happiness was in her happiness. As Robbie told me that Madam Courtney was interested in him and sometimes called him to the office also, actually, I found it true. One day, it was 10 p.m. at Arby's restaurant. There were not many customers or employees. Only me, Madam Courtney, Jolly, and Robbie were there. I was exhausted from work, so when I went to the bathroom to freshen up, I heard a sound from Madam's office. It was as if someone was taking a slow breath and kissing someone. I got inquisitive and thought to check there. And when I went to check, I saw Robbie and Courtney 
were making love together. I was shocked. He was right. It means... A few days later, the police came to Arby's restaurant. They said that our boss Thomas's health was terrible, and his health has not deteriorated naturally, but his health has been intentionally spoiled. Someone had mixed such a chemical in his daily food, due to which he was slowly dying and all the doubts were going on Madam Courtney. Then, all the employees of Arby's started talking filthy and nasty things about our madam, but I could not believe it, because I have always believed that no one should be accused without proof. The police started coming to our restaurant again and again, except for two or three days. Due to the frequent visits of the police, our restaurant was also getting a lot of defamation. But what was the truth? No one knew anything. After a few days, very bad news was heard, and it was the news of the death of our boss, Thomas. He was a humble and polite man. After his death, the case had become even more robust. Along with this, it became imperative to catch the culprit. Our madam did not come to the office for some time, but later she started coming to the office again to handle the business. Even after the death of her husband, her affair with Carrie continued. I got very angry with Robbie, but he showed anger on me instead and told me not to speak much, and I also kept quiet. Jolly's boyfriend used to come to the restaurant to meet her. He used to read primarily medical books. The police said that Thomas was given a chemical. Only then did I suspect that Jolly's boyfriend was involved in all this work. But I had no proof. Yet, when the police came to inquire, I told this to them also. The police started following him, and after that, a new secret came out. After a lot of investigation by the police on him, it is revealed that Jolly is the woman who killed our boss, Thomas. He said shocking things ahead. He said, I have not done all this alone. Jolly was also with me in this crime. She had all this planned and she knew that Madam Courtney was a lesbian. That's why she trapped her in her fake love affair and got her a few properties in her name too. Courtney was very much in love with her and would do anything for her easily. But everything went wrong. One day, when Jelly had gone to Madam's house for some office work, I had phoned her that time. Only then, Thomas listened to our talk. He came to know about the truth between both of us. That's why it became necessary to kill him. At that time, Jelly joined hands and feet in front of Thomas and asked not to tell all this to anyone. And she also told the boss that she would leave Courtney's life and he forgave her, which was the greatest mistake of his life. Jolly always made a burger for Thomas before Courtney left the restaurant, which was poisonous. After two days, he could neither speak nor do anything by himself. And on the other hand, Courtney loved Jolly very much, so she didn't suspect her at all. A few days later, Robbie was arrested as he was with them. Both of them asked her to defame Madam, but Robbie took more advantage of this. He had made an MMS of her and he used to do wrong with her with the help of that MMS. I had never really been a family person. I'd spent most of my life with my family and during that time, all I could think about was leaving. Don't get me wrong, my family wasn't really bad or anything like that. I just constantly felt smothered anytime I was with them. So when it was finally time for me to leave for college, I left and never looked back. I ignored their constant calls and texts. I always made an excuse not to come for the reoccurring family gatherings, and I didn't even send them gifts or messages during their birthdays or holidays. Now, as I said, I didn't do this out of spite. I just wanted to keep my distance from them. And while I didn't know this at the time, it was a decision I would come to regret dearly. If I'm remembering correctly, it happened on the 30th of November, 2015. The Christmas holiday was coming up, and as usual, I made excuses not to come home for the holidays. My mom spent an hour trying to convince me on the phone, and I remember telling her that I had to work and I wouldn't be able to come home. Now, I worked at a nearby joint of the popular Denny's restaurant. Most of my co-workers had gone home for Christmas, and it was just a few of us left. I remember my manager being shocked when I told him I was going to work throughout the holidays, even on Christmas. He asked if I was sure about that, and I told him that it was fine. After my conversation with the manager had ended, I quickly got back to work. I was taking the night shift that night, 
so it was just me and my coworker Jill. Jill lived in the area, so she normally worked the night shifts with me. It was a very slow night, and I knew it was because of the holidays. With no customers around and not much going on, Jill and I just talked to each other. During our conversation, I remember her asking me, Why didn't you go home for the holidays, Todd? So I responded with, Well, I weighed my options, and it was either going home and spending time with some overbearing people or making a couple of bucks. She laughed before responding with, Overbearing? Your family is really that bad, huh? I then told her, To be honest, they aren't that bad, but sometimes they just get a little too much for me to handle. Besides, there's no other place I'd rather be. I was about to say something else when a strange couple walked into the restaurant. The man was wearing a black shirt with three-quarter denim shorts, and he was holding a green bag in his right hand. His wife, or at least the woman I thought was his wife, was wearing a black and white shirt with black shorts. We immediately stopped our conversation to attend them, as I looked at the man and said, Welcome to Denny's, sir. How can I help you? The strange man totally ignored me as he started to make his way behind the counter. Confused, I said, What are you doing, sir? You're not allowed back here. But before I could do anything, I felt a gun pressed against my skin. I was about to scream when the man said, Don't you dare make a sound. Jill soon arrived at the scene and she screamed when she realized what was going on. The man then looked at her with cold eyes as he said, I'm going to paint your floor red with his insides if you don't stop screaming. His menacing threat worked instantly as Jill stopped screaming. He then told her, now, I'm going to take your friend here to the back of the restaurant and keep him hostage. And if you want to see him again, all you have to do is take out all the money in your cash register and give it to my partner here. When he was done speaking, I was then ushered to the back of the restaurant. I remember being so scared that it was hard to breathe. I felt myself getting an anxiety attack, but I tried my best to keep it under control. I could tell Jill was also panicking, but she did everything they asked her as she started to clear the cash register. My eyes started to dart around now as I checked to see if there was anyone nearby that could help us. My assailant noticed me doing this, so he said, I don't think you've ever been shot before, because if you had, you'd think twice about doing anything stupid. I don't need to tell you that anything you do or whatever it is you're thinking of doing won't work. Don't be a hero, kid, because the heroes always die in the end. I really don't give a crap about your pathetic life, and I'd kill you without a second thought. His words pierced through my soul, and it didn't take long before I smelt urine. I had peed myself, and my assailant, who had noticed this, started to laugh. The cash register was empty now, as Jill had given the woman all the money. The man then ordered her to go hide in the back of the restaurant before saying, You better do as I say, or I won't let your friend go. Jill didn't complain as she did exactly what he asked. I was still crippled with fear, but I managed to stutter the words, We've done what you wanted, so please, can I go now? The man who was shocked that I was able to speak looked at me and said, I see you found some courage, but it's too late for that now, and I'm afraid we won't be able to let you go. We aren't done using you yet. When he was done talking, the woman who was working with the man quickly walked out of the restaurant. The man then ushered me towards the door, and with my hands raised in the air, I walked out of the restaurant. When I was outside, he brought out his gun again and told me to face the wall. I did what he asked me to do as I held on to some hope that I'd come out of this alive. The man then whispered the words, Now, I want you to close your eyes and count to ten. Do as I say and hopefully, at the end of that countdown, you won't wake up in hell. I started to count and my heartbeat increased with every number I said. It was the longest 10 seconds of my life, and numerous thoughts began to fly through my head. I cursed myself for not taking the holiday break to spend time with my family, as I knew I wouldn't have been in this situation if I did that. I also knew that if this crazy man shot me here, no one would care, as I had constantly shunned the only people who would have cared. I then felt nothing but immense fear and regret as I prayed to come out of this situation alive. When I was done counting, I waited for something to happen, but all I heard was silence. It took a lot of courage to do it, but when I finally opened my eyes, they were gone. After the incident, the police were immediately called and we were asked to give our statements. We told them everything that happened 
and the hidden surveillance cameras were checked. The footage corroborated our stories and a manhunt was set up to find the thieves. He was trying to hide it, but our manager was more worried about the money that was stolen than the well-being of his employees. The news of the small case soon spread around town and it didn't take long before my family heard about it. They all came to visit me the next week and I could tell how worried they were. That incident became a real eye-opener for me as I realized that I had no one that really cared about me apart from them and no matter how overwhelming or overbearing they got sometimes, they were still my family. So I made a pact with myself to always try harder to get closer to them and ever since that day, I never missed a family Christmas again. My wife and I have recently moved into a new town due to my transfer. I'm a software developer and my previous company decided to send me to a new location. Although this job pays well, I have to work longer hours. My wife is a stay-at-home housewife and our life is pretty perfect. However, since we've shifted here, we didn't get much time to ourselves. The other week we planned on going on a date. However, I was stuck in an emergency meeting and couldn't make it to the date. My wife knows how important my work is to us, so instead of being upset, she visited me at my office. It must have been no later than 9 in the evening, although our dinner reservation was for 7 p.m., which meant it was gone. She still insisted we go to eat out after I'm done working. Unable to deny my sweet wife, around 10 p.m. I wrapped up my work and we both stepped out of my office. We drove around town in search of a good restaurant, and finally we found one. The food was great. We had such a great date, we decided to do this at least once every month. A month passed, and we decided again to go on the date. Instead of making a reservation in any restaurant, my wife showed up in my office, and just like last time, we drove around town talking and looking for a new restaurant to dine in. However, this time, we were a bit late. It was almost 11.30 p.m. by the time we stepped out of my office, so most of the restaurants around town were closed. I was a bit upset that due to my work, I couldn't take my wife on a date. However, suddenly she had an idea. Hey Dave, why don't we just go to McDonald's? Like the old days. You know I can never resist a good cheeseburger and fries. When we started dating, I wasn't making much and neither was she. That's why we couldn't afford fancy dates. McDonald's was our go-to destination back then, so I couldn't deny her when she asked me to take her there. Sure, darling. Let's find a McDonald's nearby. We looked up our car's GPS and found one a few blocks away. I drove us there, and as we started to see the yellow and red lighting of the McDonald's, it was like deja vu for us. The only issue was this particular McDonald's didn't have a designated parking spot, nor did it have a drive-in. As I slowed down the car in front of the McDonald's, which was on the opposite side of the street, I could feel my wife's hand squeezing my forearm. When I looked at her, her eyes were as big as saucers, and she was pointing a finger at the entrance of the McDonald's. She looked unusually scared, more like petrified of something. When I turned to look in the direction she was pointing, I did not waste a single moment thinking. I just pressed my foot on the gas and raced the car home. I managed to get myself and my wife into the house. Finally, I asked my wife. Do you think it was a homeless person? He did not look like a homeless person. Besides, why would a homeless person be wearing the McDonald uniform? Not to mention he was extremely creepy. I think it is more sinister than we think. I grabbed my laptop from the tea table and we both started to look up the McDonald's. We entered the area and the exact address of the McDonald's. The search results that popped up scared us both to death. There was a before and after image of the same McDonald's. The first image showed the restaurant the way we had seen it just a couple of minutes ago, but the after image told a different story. We saw a McDonald's that was totally burned down to the ground, and a pair of medics were carrying a dead body on a stretcher. There were links to several news articles about the fire, 
Apparently, it had started due to the negligence of a worker who had not turned off the gas knob before the end of her shift. The gas leak had led to the fire, and more than five people lost their lives in the fire, including three employees, a manager, and a few customers. Many people were severely injured, too. We kept on scrolling, and the last search result was something we had to check out. The headline of the article read, Ghost Sighting at the Town's Famous McDonald's. It was written by a group of college kids who had not known about the fire in this McDonald's store either. They went there to grab a late-night snack and saw a creepy-looking man wearing a McDonald's uniform waving at them from the glass door. This was exactly what I and my wife had witnessed when we slowed down our car before that McDonald's. As we kept on scrolling, not just one but many people witnessed the creepy man waving at them. Multiple reports and articles were stating that. Most people had just brushed it away as an urban legend, but some local people had confirmed that the waving man was the manager who had lost his life in the fire. After that day, whenever we passed that street, we saw the burned McDonald's. We never saw the ghost of the manager again. But now we think twice before entering any McDonald's. The face and the creepy expression of the man are itched into our brains forever. If you have ever been a food delivery person, you might know the consequences of being late. It means you have to give the food to the customer free of cost. And the expense of the meal will be cut from the salary of the delivery person. Anyways, I was overworking myself to make ends meet. I could not bear the thought of losing any money due to late delivery. That's why, whenever I had to deliver food, I made sure I was on time. I worked at the local Wendy's fast food chain and had been working there for a year. Most of the deliveries were easy, just a few blocks away from the restaurant and nothing else. However, one of my fellow colleagues abruptly quit his job and left the city. I don't think it had anything to do with the job. Rather, it was a personal reason. I often worked in the late hours of the night, as the pay was slightly better and the roads had less traffic so I could reach my destination on time. However, I had no idea what I was risking for this shitty job. The receptionist, Kelly, took orders at night on the phone, and then the kitchen staff prepared it and I delivered it. Most of the time, it was pleasant on the road, and the tips I got from mostly drunk people craving some late-night fast food was good. All in all, my life wasn't good, but it wasn't miserable either. But everything took a turn for the worst that night. Hey, George, there's an order you need to deliver. It's by the old lake. Should be ready in five minutes. You good with that? Now, anyone who knew the old lake will at any cost avoid going anywhere near it. And the fact that someone lived by it was astonishing in itself. However, thinking about the hefty tip I would get for the delivery, I was willing to do it. Sure, Kelly, I'll go. Let me know when the order is ready. All are a bunch of wussies if you ask me. I laughed at her comment. Kelly was a friendly person, and honestly, it was a delight to work with her. And it did not hurt that she gave me most of the delivery so I could make more money. Hey, George, the order is here. You ready? Sure I am. When I saw the order, it was evident that there was a lot of food I had to deliver. Looks like a monster lives by the lake. Kelly said what I was thinking, and we had a good laugh about it. However, little did we know that I was about to encounter a monster in a few minutes. I packed the food in my delivery bag, placed it on the passenger seat, and started driving. The drive to that area of town was a pretty smooth one. Almost all of the town avoided that part. From the horrible incident that happened by the lake, it was as if the townspeople boycotted the lake and its surroundings. The drive would not take more than 15 minutes to reach the address. It would mean that I'd be five minutes early if I continued at this speed. I decided to just keep driving when I reached the road that ran parallel to the lake. It was extremely cold and foggy in an instant, as if I had entered another dimension altogether. I shivered, but kept driving. I thought it could be cold because I was so close to the lake. Amidst the fog at a distance of 20 feet, I could see someone standing. It looked as if it was a woman, but she was unnaturally huge, like a male bodybuilder. She was easily seven feet tall, but it was still so foggy, so I slowed down my car. Suddenly, the woman, or the female-like figure, disappeared. It was as if she wasn't even there. I thought I may have imagined it, so I kept driving. The house I was trying to reach was nowhere in sight. 
I kept driving at the same slow pace. Second, I could hear a loud thud sound on the roof of my car, as if a branch had fallen on it. But no trees were lining the road. So what must have fallen on my car's roof? I sat behind the wheel, just thinking, not daring to go out and look. But there was some sort of movement happening on my roof. As it was night, there was no chance that it was a bird. Plus, suggesting from the dent I could see from the inside, it was unlikely that it would be a bird. The dent was massive. Suddenly, my phone rang. Hello? Hi, is this George? Yeah, who is this? That's not important. Just listen to me, George. You need to do as I say. I did not recognize the voice. It was a man speaking from the other end, and his voice was very strange and very unfamiliar. Just get out of your car and walk towards the main road. You will see the light from my car's headlights as you get closer. Do it now and stay on the phone as you do it. The urgency in his voice was quite compelling, so I decided to follow his instructions. I was still on the phone with this guy, and I could hear his breath on the other end. Before I could give up the safety of the car, I decided to look back through the rearview mirror. I could see the yellow lights of his car's headlights. So this man wasn't kidding. He was actually there. I still had no idea what was happening. The food I had to deliver must have gone cold by now, and Kelly must have got a call from an angry customer. But none of that seemed important now. Get out, what's taking you so long? The man barked from the other end. Yeah, I I'm getting out now, just a sec. I took the car keys and got out as slowly as possible. Leave the door open and just walk. Do not look back at your car at any cost and just listen to me. Do not reply. Walk faster, but don't run. I was out of my car and my feet were wobbling. But from the periphery of my eye, I caught a dark figure sitting on the top of my car. The figure, or whatever it was, moved rhythmically. I just kept walking, and as I walked closer to the car behind me, I saw a silhouette of a man on his phone. He waved his hand at me when he spotted me coming closer. Yeah, that's me. Keep walking, and don't look back. Yes, sir. When I was a couple of meters away from the man's truck, my curiosity got the best of me, and I turned around. In that instance, I saw the same woman sitting on the top of my car. I could not see her face as it was covered with long black matted hair. But what she was doing was enough to give me nightmares for the rest of my life. She had an animal in her hand. Must be a rabbit or a baby deer. And she was constantly banging the head of the animal on my car's roof. Then she proceeded to eat the animal alive and all the blood spilled in the back glass of my car. I was so shocked that I could not do anything. Slowly, everything just blacked out and I felt myself free falling to the ground. Strong arms grabbed me and said, I got you, kid. It was the same man. The next thing I know, I wake up on the porch of my own home. I have zero recollection of how I got there, but I could clearly remember everything up to the part where I fainted. I lived alone, so there was no one to tell me how I might have got there. My car was nowhere in sight. I just went home and decided to sleep and think about what happened the next day. When I woke up, the first thing I did was to call the number that had called me last night, hoping the man would pick up and explain what happened to me. But the number was not reachable. I tried my best to ask around if anyone saw a car dropping me off, but none of my neighbors had seen anything either. There was no clue I could find to find out what happened to me last night. Defeated, I decided to visit the church. I spoke to the father and told him what I had experienced. He heard what I had to say, and then with a smile on his face, he said, Son, the Lord saved you from the demon. Don't think much about it. Just pray at the altar and go home. And I did just that. To date, I don't know who the man was or what the evil woman was, but I am insanely thankful for the life I have. One of my favorite memories as a kid happened during a particular sleepover. My friends came over to spend the weekend, and I always remembered how we ordered a Papa John's pizza every night during that weekend. That precious memory stuck with me as I grew older, and what happened that night eventually became a habit, as I always order a Papa John's pizza every night during the weekend. Most of the time, I'd invite some of my friends over, and it didn't take long before they coined the term Papa John's Weekends. It had become something we always looked forward to after a long week of work, and we always had a good time whenever we did it. Now, 
a strange thing recently happened during one of our fun weekends. I had some friends over and, as usual, we ordered a couple of pizzas from Papa John's. When the pizzas arrived, I answered the door to take our order, and that's when I noticed something strange. The delivery guy, whose name was Jace, had a very disturbing look in his eyes. It looked like he was angry about something, and for some reason, all that anger was targeted at me as he intensely stared at me with a malicious look on his face. My friends who were there noticed this strange behavior and asked me if I knew him or the reason for his rude demeanor, but I was just as confused as I told them I had never met that man before in my life. We decided to brush it off that night as we didn't want anything to spoil the mood, but the same thing happened the next night when we ordered our usual pizza, as the strange delivery man came back with the same attitude that he had had the night before. It eventually became a reoccurring problem for me every time I ordered a pizza, as it was always the same angry delivery guy who delivered my order. Things got worse from there as I noticed him following me around during the week and hanging around my house. My friends also noticed this, and they told me to call the cops, but I decided not to as I didn't want things to escalate any further. One Friday night at around 12.02 a.m., someone started to incessantly ring my doorbell. Shocked, I wondered who could be visiting me at this hour, so I went to the door to check. As I looked through the peephole, my heart dropped to my stomach as standing there with bulging red eyes was that strange delivery man. He rang the doorbell for a while, and when I didn't answer, I heard him making his way to the back of my house. Terrified, I wondered what he was going to do now, and that's when I realized my bedroom window was still open. I rushed to close it, but by the time I got there, I was too late, as I saw him standing in my bedroom. Scared, I screamed, What do you want from me, you psycho? He then calmly looked at me and said, I just want to talk. I looked around for my phone to call the cops, and I realized that I left it on the counter. I made an attempt to reach for it, but he was faster than me as he grabbed the phone saying, Please, just hear me out before you call the cops. I knew I had no choice now, so I listened as he said. My brother Matthew went missing a couple of months ago. He was a pizza delivery guy like me, and we both worked at Papa John's. The cops still have no leads to his whereabouts, so... I decided to check out the locations of the last deliveries he made that night. As he spoke, I realized he was telling the truth, as the cops had come over a few months back to ask me if I knew anything about the disappearance. So I told him. I heard about that, but as I told the police officers that day, I don't know anything that might have happened to him after he delivered the pizza I ordered that night. Jace, who now had tears in his eyes, then said, He isn't the first one of our employees to go missing. And I can't help thinking that it's my fault because I got him this job. That's why I felt I needed to do something, which is why I've been following you around to see if you had anything to do with it. I was still scared, but I started to sympathize with the strange man. So I said, Look, man, I understand. I'd probably do something crazy too if I lost a family member, but... That's what the cops are for. You can't be breaking into homes and taking matters into your own hands. When I was done talking, Jace then said, I'm sorry, but I just had to check and make sure. Either way, you seem like a nice person, so I apologize for all the inconvenience and trauma I've caused. I'm going to leave now, so please don't call the cops. I promised him I wouldn't and offered him any help in finding his brother. But as he stood up to leave, I found myself staring at his neck. I really didn't want to, but it had been a while and I couldn't help myself. So I picked up my pocket knife and stabbed him in the neck. As he fell to the floor bleeding, I found myself getting excited at the sight of his blood. The mixed look of terror and confusion in his eyes made me feel a little bit sad, so I decided to give him an explanation. I'm really sorry, dude, but I had to. You see, Jace, from a very young age, I realized I had something called hematolagnia. It's basically a blood fetish, as I always find myself getting excited and aroused by the sight of blood. Jace was struggling now as he tried to stop the blood that was gushing from his neck, so I continued with. When I was ten, I cut my dog open with a kitchen knife because... 
I wanted to see his insides, and I told my family that he'd run away. When I was 12, I pushed a girl off the top of a high jungle gym. The impact crushed her skull, and I can never forget the amazing feeling I got from seeing her blood spill out. As I got older, I found myself wanting more, so I picked my victims off in parks or in the street at night. I mostly killed homeless men and women, in addition to late-night walkers, but doing that was a bit too risky, so I decided to work smarter. And around last year, Jace, I had an amazing epiphany when I ordered a Papa John's pizza, as I realized that the men and women who worked in delivery were the perfect prey to satisfy my urges. I mean, these are people whose jobs take them all over the city, so accurately tracking down their last locations prove difficult, even for the cops. It's not like I had anything against the delivery people at Papa John's Pizza. Matter of fact, I love your pizzas. But sometimes, Jace, the urge is so strong and I just can't help myself. You understand, right? As I looked towards Jace's motionless body, I realized that I'd been talking to a corpse. He was dead now, but there was still fun to be had as I repeatedly stabbed his body with my knife, and, similar to a fun piñata, I shrilled in excitement every time his blood spilled out. When I had my fill of fun, I decided it was time to get to work. I moved his bloody corpse first before I cleaned out my room with bleach. I then took off his clothes before taking his corpse to the basement. After putting on some protective gear, I put his body into one of the four barrels of sulfuric acid that I had. And just like his brother, I knew there'd be no trace of him in a couple of days. When I was done, I put on the Papa John's restaurant uniform that I'd gotten from one of my victims, and I went outside to Jace's car. I did this in case any eyewitnesses had seen him break into my house. I then drove the car deep into the nearby forest and made sure to use gloves when touching the steering wheel so that there wouldn't be any prints in the car. There were no cameras in my neighborhood, so when the cops come over to ask their routine questions, it is only my words they'll believe. Doing this was hungry work, so when I got back home I decided to order another Papa John's pizza. The delivery girl's name was Abby, and as I paid for the pizza, I smiled, because... I really couldn't wait to see what her insides looked like. I used to enjoy my work at Denny's. I would wake up by 8 and get to work by 9, serve customers and leave work by 4.30, but everything changed when the boss introduced the 24 hours policy. Workers would have to work on shifts. Some workers would work in the morning, everyone would work in the afternoon, and some would stay behind at night till the next morning. Everyone disagreed with the boss's decision at first, but... After he offered to increase our salaries, we yielded to his offers. Many of us didn't have options. Things were hard enough, and we couldn't risk being jobless for any period. A duty roster was introduced, and everyone knew when they would be working during the 24 hours that our Denny's branch operated. It was a Friday afternoon, and my co-worker and friend John called me to the back of the restaurant to inform me about his mother's illness and how he planned to visit her the next day. She stayed very far away, so he would have to spend at least a night at his parents' house. He asked me if I could cover for him and work his shift in his stead. He had asked the boss for permission to leave, but the boss refused to permit him to leave for even an hour. I thought about it for some seconds, but I yielded to his request when he offered to cover for me whenever I needed help too. I agreed and told him not to worry. We went back into the restaurant. A few hours later, John told me he was leaving and exited the restaurant. It was four o'clock, and the day shift was finally over. Those who worked the day shift with me were preparing to leave, and those who would work the night shift, I checked the roster to see when John would be getting a break. It was then I realized that John was supposed to be working during the midnight to dawn shift. I panicked for a minute, but gathered myself and decided to go home and come back to work the midnight shift. A promise is a promise, I thought to myself. I went back home did the needful stuffs and came back to work to cover for John. I arrived at 11.30 and was ready to work as soon as I got to the restaurant and reached for the door. A gang of people came, pushed me to the side and walked into the restaurant. They were all dressed in similar black t-shirts with a white design on the shirt. The design looked like an anchor. 
I walked in after them and finally took a good look at them. There were five men and a woman. They all had tattoos and their faces looked scary too. The lady in their midst was wearing very ridiculous looking makeup and was chewing gum very loudly. One of the men had his hand around her neck and they would smooch each other every minute. You could tell they were in a gang of some sort. I kept staring at them as I walked towards the kitchen. I took my uniform and put it on and went on to take orders. There were only three people in the restaurant apart from the gang of people that sat in the booth by the window at the extreme end of the left side of the restaurant, very close to the door. The other people were already attended to and I didn't want to be the one to take orders from the scary looking people but I didn't have any other choice. I went ahead and took their orders. I'm here to take your orders. What would you like? I asked with a shaky tone. They all burst into laughter and I wondered what was wrong. They started to mimic the way I asked the question. Looks like server boy over here is scared of us, said the scariest looking of them all. He was the one who had his hand around the lady amidst them. You could tell that he was the leader, and they all burst into laughter again. I felt humiliated and asked again, this time more courageously. Can I take your orders? They stopped laughing and looked at me. Their glares sent shivers down my spine, and I took a step back. It felt like they wanted to attack me. The leader looked at me and said, Don't worry, you'll take our orders soon. I went back to the kitchen to assist my co-workers. Thirty minutes had passed and the gang refused to order anything. Nobody was willing to go and ask again. We were scared of them. An hour passed and many of the customers had left, even those that came in after the gang. A few moments later, every customer apart from the gang had left. Suddenly, one of the gang members stood and went outside. He looked around suspiciously like he was about to do something really bad. He came back in with a canvas messenger bag and my co-workers and I looked at each other and wondered what they were up to. What do you think is in the bag? I asked Layla, who was beside me. We were both behind the counter. Honestly, I don't want to know, she answered. The gang member placed the bag on the table and immediately the entire gang got up. The leader opened the bag and instantaneously they all brought out guns from the bag. Everyone panicked and bent to the floor. They took the guns and walked over to the counter. Some of them went to the door to check out for the cops. Hey, server boy, the gang leader called to me. I'm ready to order now. He pointed the gun at me. He told me to get up and passed me the empty canvas bag and told me to fill it with all the money from the cash register. I began to shake as I stood up and reached for the cash register. I started to fill in the bag with the money, as if that wasn't enough, he commanded everyone take off every item that they had on them, valuable or not. I didn't have anything important on me, just a broken wristwatch. I filled in the bag with all the money and the gang leader pointed his gun directly at my head. I froze up at that moment. The blood-curdling feeling of the gun against my head made me weak. All I could think of was if he was going to pull the trigger or not. But he used his gun to push my head slightly and told me to take the bag around and collect the items from my co-workers. I collected the bag from him shakily and moved away from the counter to collect everything they had taken off. I went around collecting items from the others and when I was done I placed the bag in front of the leader. He looked at everyone and pointed his gun to Layla. I said everything, directing his focus to the necklace on her neck. No, please, no, Layla begged. The leader grabbed the necklace from her neck and tried to yank it off, but Layla fought back and tried to stop him from taking it. It meant a lot to her. She had told everyone about how her grandmother who raised her gave her the necklace. It was the only belonging of her grandmother that she had left. The leader would not have it, and he shot Layla multiple times until she lay flat on the floor right beside me. All I could do was stare at her as she bled out and lost consciousness. Everyone began to scream and cry after witnessing the shooting. You weren't supposed to shoot anyone, the lady in the gang said furiously to the leader. You, he pointed the gun at me again. Take the necklace off and put it in the bag, he said. I crawled hurriedly in fear to Layla's dead body and removed the necklace from her neck. Tears rolled down my face as I took the necklace off and placed it in the bag for the gang leader. He raised his gun at me and looked at me with a mortifying glare like he was about to shoot me. Suddenly, we heard sirens. 
Police sirens. A police car was headed in the direction of the restaurant. One of the gang members who was by the door on the lookout for the cops signaled the leader, and he quickly grabbed the bag, passed it to the lady, and they all left. The police came in about a minute after they had left. We informed them about the robbery and shooting that took place, and they chased after the gang. The gang members were eventually caught. After that night, I quit my job at Denny's. It was better to remain jobless than lose my life. I still have nightmares about the robbery and Layla's dead body. I wish I had refused John's offer on that sad day. How many of you go to Hooters? I'll tell you the truth. Nowadays, it's not my favorite place. I used to think it was a very dangerous place for women, especially the ones who work there, but over time I realized that there is no such thing as a safe place. When something bad has to happen to you, when you have to meet the wrong person, it just happens. And this story is proof of that. It all happened when my friend Jake and I decided to go to Hooters to have a few beers and watch the game. It wasn't something we did often, but sometimes it's nice to have a change of scenery and enjoy some chicken wings while watching sports on TV. Truth be told, I used to be a big fan of Hooters, but unlike the rest of my friends, my favorite thing was the chicken wings. I'm not going to lie to you, the girls were really cute, but I was just coming out of a pretty long relationship and didn't want to meet anyone else for a while. Anyway, we walked in and sat at a table near the bar. The waitress who waited on us, let's call her Stacy, was a light-eyed blonde. She was fit and seemed to be feeling pretty good about herself. It was easy to notice that everyone was looking at her and that she wasn't really interested in anyone, which didn't surprise me. Hooters customers aren't usually the nicest. Once she arrived at our table, she set down the food menu and welcomed us. She was very friendly and, as I noticed later, very quick with the drinks. I tried not to pay too much attention to her, but I also couldn't help but notice how her eyes were on me a little more than usual. I thought maybe it was a part of her job, you know, making customers feel good and all, but I couldn't help but feel like I was being watched by her, and not in a normal way. Wow, I became the third wheel. What do you mean? Don't you see? <laughs> She's obsessed with you. She does nothing but look at you. <laughs> nah. It must be her job. Girls at Hooters do that all the time. If it's her job, she's doing it very badly with me. She's only looking at you, man. I decided to just laugh and ignore what my friend was saying. But every minute that passed, I felt like I had to agree with him more. As the night progressed, I began to notice that Stacy was getting closer than a waitress would ever get. It was as if no other table existed. To be honest, at first I found it flattering but it soon became a little uncomfortable. Her looks didn't seem to be looks of simple, innocent flirtation. Her eyes were wide and her body seemed to be trembling with anticipation. This girl scared me. I gave her a few polite responses, but nothing more, trying to make it clear that we were just there to watch the game and have a good time among friends, but she didn't seem to understand. Every time I ignored her, her eyes got bigger, her smile more pronounced, and her body more nervous. Jake noticed the situation and started joking about it, saying that the girl needed a vacation. I tried to laugh, but deep down I was completely and utterly scared. The night continued and Stacy's attitude became more and more intense. She approached our table more frequently. Her words became a little more suggestive and her touches a little more insistent. I was starting to feel a little trapped in the situation and Jake could tell I wasn't having a good time anymore. Do you think we should leave? I nodded, but before we could get up, Stacy came over to me and placed a hand on my shoulder. Where do you think you're going, honey? I tried to pull away, but her grip was surprisingly strong. I think it's time for you to go, Stacy. Hey, I understand what you want to do, but you have to understand the clues. You're making me uncomfortable. I don't want anything to do with you. Please, just leave me alone. Let's just say the girl didn't take this well at all. Her whole body turned red. Her gaze became more obsessive. Her fists clenched. It's because... 
Is it because I'm ugly? What? You're not ugly. How can you say that? You're the prettiest girl in the place. But I just came out of a tough breakup, and I'm not ready to meet anyone. <laughs> the oldest trick in the book. How low of you to use that excuse to not call me ugly. Hey, you can't... I tried to be a good waitress. I tried to be nice to you. I tried to make you feel at home. And this is how you pay me? But I just told you that... With just one hand, the woman grabbed my neck and squeezed it violently. That's when I realized that this was no ordinary girl. Her arm was full of muscles, which justified her enormous and inordinate strength. You're going to pay for this. As the woman threatened me, she was taken away by two members of security. Next to them, a man was claiming that she'd lost her mind. The man was clearly her boss, but she ignored him as if only I existed. After that, we stayed a while longer to make sure the psycho didn't come back. But even after waiting a while, nothing was going to stop what happened outside a few minutes later. As soon as we walked through the doors of Hooters to leave, a person in a black hoodie violently smacked me upside the head. I didn't have to wonder who it was. I immediately knew it was Stacy. My friend couldn't react in time, and between hesitating between helping me and attacking her, he started getting hit in the legs and back, so he had no choice but to run for his life. Meanwhile, I began to scream in pain, asking her to stop, but there was no chance. Her face had changed. I, I didn't know if her face had changed or the blow to the head was making me look bad, but she no longer looked like that cute girl I rejected. She looked like a monster. Her face was wrinkled, her makeup smeared, and her hateful expressions made her a totally different person. I could also tell that what she was wearing before was a wig since she was bald. None of this was really important, but she looked like a monster. Maybe by rejecting her, I awakened some trauma she had, and she ended up going crazy. I tried to crawl to my car, but it didn't make any sense. She walked beside me slowly, hitting me in the back with her back with every inch she took. You didn't have to tell me no. I've been told no my whole life. Do you think you're better than me? You think I'm worthless? In that moment of anger, Stacy pulled out a small knife and got on top of me. I knew what was going to happen. I'll make you as ugly as me, pretty boy. Let's see if you can afford to turn anyone down for the rest of your life. In the face of the attack, I used both my hands to keep her from cutting me. Both of us were straining with the knife, but since she was coming at me, if my arms gave out, she was just going to leave a mark on my face. If the knife went forward, it was possibly going to pierce my forehead. Maybe even go into my brain and kill me. My arms began to give out. She was clearly trained and much stronger than me. It was a matter of seconds before this girl would kill me. I could see her angry face getting more and more distorted to the point of looking like a monster. She gave a little more force and my hands gave up. I was dead. I knew I couldn't survive that. I strained my eyes, but something was wrong. The knife wouldn't reach my face. I opened my eyes again, and both my friend, who clearly had a broken leg, and a bunch of Hooters employees were on top of her, stopping her before the police arrived. When the police arrived, she was arrested, and both my friend and I were sent to the hospital. I complained to Jake that he left me alone, and he laughed in confusion. That's when he told me that she was only a few seconds away from me before she came back and that the Hooters staff acted pretty quickly. It was at that moment that I understood the whole situation with Stacy lasted only a few seconds, but to me, it felt like centuries. I will remember those seconds for the rest of my life. Those seconds when a psychopath almost murdered me just for telling her that I didn't want to go out on a date with her. This story of mine comes from perhaps the worst period of my entire life so far. I grew up privileged. Summers in the Hamptons and winters in the Bahamas kind of privileged. My dad was an investment banker, and a good one at that. So much so that mom never had to work after they got married. I had it all. Fancy private schooling led into what I thought would be a free college education. Well, not exactly free since dad was footing the bill, but... 
I'd never be saddled with any kind of crippling student debt that would turn my peers into wage slaves for the rest of their lives. At least, that's what I thought was going to happen. Until the 2008 financial crash. A lot of other financial companies got government bailouts right out of the taxpayer's pocket, but my dad's didn't. For whatever reason, they didn't qualify, so he lost his job. Long story short, one day I was in college, living the good life. The next I was on the phone to my mom, being told I'd have to drop out and find a job if I ever wanted to be able to support myself, as they just didn't have the spare cash anymore. It was devastating. I'd never worked a day in my life before, and there I was, traipsing around town with a folder full of resumes, trying to find something, anything, to get some cash in my account. And that's how I ended up working at Burger King. It was really hard at first. Although I didn't necessarily feel like it, I obviously gave off some major rich girl vibes as the rough, tough, working class staff members detected it immediately. They didn't go easy on me, not in the slightest. But if I'm honest, that's the best thing that could have happened to me. In the space of about three months, I learned the meaning of a hard day's work, and the more I threw myself into the challenge of full-time work, the more my colleagues started to respect and appreciate me. In the end, we were incredibly tight, and I still keep in touch with a few of them via Facebook and stuff, but anyway, now they have a bit of background, on with the story. So I was working the late shift one night, which is generally the hardest shift of the day. The manager only ever put the most competent, most capable workers on that shift, and I know it sounds dumb, but the fact that I'd proven myself enough to be put on that cycle was a huge compliment to me. We used to stay open until midnight on weekends, and at about 11.30, we get this pretty regular-looking dude coming in, standing there at the counter whilst perusing the menu behind me. I gave it my best. May I take your order, sir? He looks down at me. Without skipping a beat, he's like, Two double cheeseburgers, please. I could have plugged the order into the register when he interrupts me with an addendum into his order. Could I have those without the bun, the bacon, or any cheese, and hold off on grilling them for me, would you? Thanks. I stopped plugging his order in and looked up at him. Excuse me? It took a moment for me to really process what he was asking for, and he smiled as he began to clarify what his order was. Is there a problem? Uh, yeah... I'm not sure we're allowed to serve raw hamburgers. It's against food safety regulations. You've heard of steak tartare, haven't you? Yet another guy who immediately detected something in my mannerisms or accent that suggested I was upper class. I didn't even justify it with a response. I just asked him to wait a second while I talked to my supervisor. So the supervisor comes out and basically tells the guy no, just like I had. Even if you can eat raw beef, it's just not something we're able to serve our customers, or that's what I thought anyway. Because as my super is talking to this guy, calmly explaining that as much as he's sorry, it's just not something we can do, the guy like rolls his eyes and pulls out a wad of high denomination bills from his pocket and is just like, how much would it take? Now the place is pretty much empty at this point, but... All eyes are on this guy and his wad of bills. I'll never forget the moment my supervisor stopped talking all calm and professional before turning to me and telling me, Go to the back and clean something. I was stunned. I knew the guy well enough to know exactly what he was doing. He was going to clear the floor of potential witnesses, then actually get this guy's order. I pretended to clean something all the while spying on him as he collected two raw patties from the fridge and sort of went through the motions of cooking them, so that if anyone watched the camera's back, it would look like he had done his job to the letter. A couple of minutes later, he comes into the back, telling me to take over the register, but not before he slides a few crisp hundred-dollar bills into my hand, telling me not to say a word to anyone and to just forget about what had happened before people start running their mouths about it. As far as the rest of the team knew, he had told the guy no, served him some regular burgers, then simply gone about the rest of his shift as normal. But I couldn't let it go. I had to get some closure, 
even if I had a few hundred bucks worth of tips, I had to know what this guy's deal was. So being the sly fox that I am, I ducked my supervisor and hit up the manager in his office, asking him if, since it's so quiet, it'd be okay if I took a cigarette break. He looks at me all confused, turning in his chair before saying, like, You don't smoke, do you? Uh, yeah, I just started. Stresses of the job. Well, I'm sorry to hear that, but if you're entitled to your five minutes, just make sure you get your station covered. So I did. I got a buddy of mine to man the register, bummed a smoke off of one of the fire guys, then stood out back trying to get a look at the guy as he headed for his car. So there's me, standing there, pretending to smoke while I pretend I'm not watching this dude climbing into his driver's side. Then the thought hits me. It's late. Stores might not be open. In fact, they definitely weren't open, and the dude probably wanted something to cook with, right? Wrong. I distinctly see him unwrap the dripping wet burger wrapper before he raised the raw meat to his face. He doesn't take a bite, not like I expected him to. In fact, it looks more like he's smelling the meat more than anything else. I really couldn't believe what I was seeing. Literally, though, I thought the perspective had me seeing something that I wasn't, so I made the awful decision to edge a little closer to the car, angling out so I could see through the driver's side window. All without considering that his side mirror would reveal me as the peeper that I was. And oh my god. The way he looked at me through that window. This wild look in his eyes after breaking from what looked so much like he was making out with that chunk of meat. He was furious. Gunning his engine before ripping out of the parking lot as fast as he could move. I just tossed the cigarette. Ran back inside. And went straight to the super to tell him what I'd seen. He only repeated that no matter what, I wasn't to tell a soul that we'd served him raw meat, or those few hundred dollar bills would be the last money we ever got out of this place if the owner didn't opt to sue us too. We never saw that guy ever again, and no one ever found out about the raw meat we sold him. I don't suppose I was in any real danger, but it was definitely the scariest, if not the most disturbing incident I've ever had while working. At Burger King. Getting a job at Hooters was never my plan. I wanted to move out of town and get a real job, in finance or banking. But everything took a turn for the worse when my mother called me one evening. She seemed pretty drunk, and she had called me to tell me that she was leaving our home. I used to live in a rented condo with a roommate since I turned 18. When I asked her where she was going, she told me she had met a new man and that she was moving on. My mother had met a lot of new men since my dad left. Her drinking problem had gotten worse, and she even started using drugs. My mom and I never really got along, so I moved out as soon as I could. However, I was worried about my little sister Sarah. I asked my mom if she was taking Sarah with her, to which she laughed and said that she did not want any baggage and cut the phone. That was the last time I spoke to her. Soon after receiving that call, I drove home and found my little sister crying on the porch. My mom had packed up her stuff and left, leaving my sister alone in the house. That night, I moved back into the house. Thanks to our father, the house was paid off, but I still had to pay the bills and look after my sister. Her education and well-being was my top priority. That's how I ended up with a job as a Hooters waitress. Unlike some waitresses at Hooters who post their awful experiences of their time there online, I had never had one. My manager was a woman who thought the everyday inspection of uniforms was a vain rule. The other staff members were nice. And when they got to know the tough spot, I was in. They supported me in any way they could. I was just 20 back then. That's when Wayne entered my life. I distinctly remember the first time I came to the Hooters I worked at. I was his waitress, and he stared at me inappropriately. He had ordered too much food and kept on calling me to his table for no reason. I had chucked him out to be one of those annoying customers, but in the end, he had tipped me a good hundred bucks, so I was pretty happy. Two days later, he arrived again and purposely sat at the same table, which was mine to wait. 
I took his order and he started making small talk. Many folks who used to come there to eat were decent people. So, assuming him to be one of them, I started talking to him. At the end of that visit, he left me a hundred bucks in time, and on the note was a cell phone number. I never called, but that tip got me a week's worth of groceries. The next time he came, it was a busy afternoon, so I couldn't chat with him. But when I delivered his order, he asked me why I hadn't called. I acted innocent and pretended not to know what he was talking about. I left my number for you on the note last time. Did you? I did not notice. I generally fold the cash and put it in my pocket. He was pissed, but he left his number for me again. This time on a tissue paper beside the $100 tip. I chucked the tissue in the garbage as I wasn't interested in Wayne. The rest of the staff, too, had noticed his odd behavior. Sometimes he would refuse service from other waitresses if I was busy. He would just wait until I could attend his table. He used to always ask me for my number or give me his. He had asked me out on the date on multiple occasions and even asked me if I could walk him to his truck and kiss him goodbye. He had never touched me or said anything abusive to me. So my manager never took any strict actions against him. Plus, the tips he gave me were good. My priorities in life back then were to get out of town and look after my sister. Life back home was tough as it was. One evening around 8, Wayne arrived again. The Hooters was pretty empty. He sat at one of his usual tables. I took his order and was waiting for another table in the same row. Wayne was a 23-year-old young man who couldn't take a hint. While I was waiting the other table where two men in their early 30s were seated, Wayne was constantly staring at me. When I passed his table, he tried to talk to me, but I said I was busy and walked into the kitchen. He followed me and demanded to know why I was ignoring him. This caused a bit of commotion and grabbed the attention of other customers. When I walked back with the men's order, they asked me what the matter was. In a moment of weakness, I told them about Wayne and how he had been harassing me for the past couple of months. The men nodded, took their food, and started eating as if my issues weren't their problem. After a while, Wayne left, and I breathed a sigh of relief. I attended to other customers, and even the two men ordered some more food. Slowly, their crown was increasing. Half an hour later, Wayne walked in again used the restroom, and left. I was so baffled. Why would he come back just to use the restroom? I knew that he lived at least an hour away from the Hooters, and he visited this particular Hooters restaurant only to meet me. I began questioning if he had truly left or not. Then I saw him driving by very slowly, all while staring into the restaurant straight at me. I thought maybe this time he had finally left. My shift would be over in an hour and I just wanted to go home to my sister. A couple of minutes later, I saw the two men leave and they too had left me a good tip. I got busy working when one of the men walked into the restaurant and demanded to talk to the manager. Our manager walked out and he told her that she needed to call the cops immediately. My manager, along with the rest of the staff, was baffled. That's when we heard the screaming coming from the far side of the parking lot. The other man was beating the crap out of someone. When I, along with some other waitresses, walked out, we saw the man punching Wayne. The cops arrived shortly and the two men explained the whole situation. Turns out they had spotted Wayne walking into the Hooters for the second time and they had also seen him drive by the restaurant slowly. When they left, he was still lurking in the parking lot by his truck, waiting for my shift to be over. The two men had understood this and confronted Wayne. One thing led to another, and Wayne told them about some very inappropriate things he wanted to do to me. The two of them lost it and beat the crap out of Wayne. I, along with my manager and other staff, confirmed that Wayne stalked me and was harassing me for days. I filed for a restraining order against him, 
and he was put behind bars for stalking, harassment, and attempt to kidnap and sexually assault. A few months later, I saved up enough to move out of town. When I think about this evening, I still get chills. I don't know what would have happened to me if those two men had not stood up for me. Based on a true story of an ex-Hooters waitress who wishes to stay anonymous. As a chief magazine editor, I am always working extra hours in my office. I enjoy my work and hardly ever complain about work pressure. However, this also means I barely get time to cook lunch or dinner. There is a McDonald's a few blocks ahead of my office. I usually visited it at least four to five times a week. I mean, who doesn't love a cheesy burger on a weekday? But I've always had this odd feeling of being watched since the moment I stepped in. Until today, it's not stopped. So, it all started three years ago when I took up this position. I knew it was going to be a demanding role, but it promised the professional exposure I wished for. I still remember the first time I walked through the double doors of the McDonald's. The distinct smell of freshly brewed coffee, cheeseburgers, and a set of eyes followed me throughout the room. I ordered my food and sat at the last table beside the window, looking at the hustle and bustle of the street while I enjoyed my snack. Sometime later, I was sipping my Coke when the hair on the nape of my neck rose and I felt the weird stare again. From the moment I entered the McDonald's, I felt as if someone was keeping a watch on me. For the first time, I scanned the store and spotted an old, creepy-looking man sitting on a table near the fire exit. He was not eating anything, just sitting at the table and staring at me. He never blinked, just stared straight at me. His eyes were red and had dark bags under them. It looked as if he had not slept in days or had a hangover. However, nothing seemed to face him. He just kept looking at me, following my every move. I was a bit spooked, but tried to ignore the whole ordeal with the man. Soon I finished and walked up to the exit. He followed me with his eyes and gave me a creepy smile as I stepped out of the door. A few days later, when I went there again, I was immediately greeted with his creepy stare. No doubt, the man was sitting at the same table scanning me with his eyes and keeping an eye over my every action. I ignored it, ate my food, and left quickly. Just as last time, he smiled at me, displaying his rotten, crooked teeth. But this time, he waved at me. Spooked, I moved out as quickly as I could and sped walk to my office just in case he followed. But he never did. Later that week, when I went to grab a bite again, the man was sitting at his usual table, staring at me and smiling. I knew this was odd, so I approached the girl at the counter and pointed at the man and asked about him. To my utter surprise, the girl looked at me funny and said in a very plain tone that the table was empty and no man was sitting there. I was certainly very shocked, but kept my cool and described the man. I asked her if a person with a similar appearance had visited the store ever. The girl said no and took my order. The worst part was, while I was conversing with the girl, the man was sitting at the table and smiling his creepy smile at me. It felt as if he was amused by my panic. I was stressed and scared. It was confusing. Only I could see the man and the girl on the counter couldn't. I blamed it on stress and the lack of sleep. I collected my order and decided to eat it in my cabin. When I stepped out of the door with my purse and food in hand, the man smiled, waved, and winked at me. Every time I walk out, I felt like he did something more. It scared me, and I decided not to visit the place for a while. A few weeks passed, and the incident at McDonald's had totally flown out of my mind. It was late, around 9 in the evening, and I was driving my car out of my parking lot. When I spot the same man standing across the street, 
At that moment, all I could think about was getting the hell out of that deserted parking lot. The man stood there and looked at me with a creepy expression. A ton of questions ran across my mind, but I had no time to find the answers to any of them. My whole body was in flight mode as I drove past him straight home. Once I was settled in, my mind was going round and round about all the possibilities. Had he followed me to my office? Did he know any of my personal information? Why was he following me? Did he know where I lived? And more importantly, why was I the only one able to see him? It was all so scary. I again thought this was a side effect of my busy schedule and stressed lifestyle. Before I saw a doctor, I decided to take a few days off to relax and calm my mind. Over the next few days, I spent my time cooking, reading, going to the park for walks and relaxing. Not once did I spot the man on my week off, and I was convinced that I was seeing things due to stress. However, it all changed the night before the day I was supposed to get back to work. I was sipping tea on my balcony when, on the sidewalk, right in front of my home, stood the creepy man from McDonald's. I was shocked and scared to death. The teacup slipped out from my hands, and I ran inside shutting all the windows and blinds. I turned off all the lights and decided to peek out to check if he was still there. When I looked out, the sidewalk was empty. There was no sign of the man. The next day, I decided to visit the McDonald's again to confront the man myself, as I was certain he would be there. When I entered the place, his usual table was empty, and the manager of the store was standing at the counter. I approached him and narrated the incident. After hearing my story, the man revealed a shocking truth that cracked the floor beneath my feet. Mr. Dudley, the manager, told me what had happened in the McDonald's a few years ago. He said, When this place was newly opened, we had a few factory workers visit us regularly for lunch. The man you described was one of them. One afternoon during the lunch rush, we had three masked men come in and rob this place. The workers tried to unarm the masked robbers, but by the time the cops were called, one of the robbers had shot this man, and he died on the spot. It was a hit-and-run case. The masked men were never found. The worker never got his justice. Many customers before you had claimed to see the man smile and follow them around. I had no idea what to say to him. What should I do, Mr. Dudley, for the man to stop following me? Honestly, I don't know what you should do. The people who had claimed to see the man never visited here again, so I know nothing of this matter or what happened to them. The spirit of a dead worker was following me. It seemed to get one step closer every time I saw it. What do you guys think I should do? Why did the spirit choose to follow me? What must have happened to the people before me? And most importantly, how will this end? As it still follows me, I sometimes see it in the lobby of my office, in the park, below my window, and many other such places. What should I do to make it stop? As a 911 call taker, my primary responsibility is to take emergency calls and make sure the caller is really in distress. The extensive training they provide us helps us greatly to decide what type of help a person may need. Sometimes it's a kid, a woman, a homeless man, or an elderly person. It could be anyone, and we have to be alert all the time. I have handled many distressing calls and handled each one with care, keeping the safety and well-being of the caller at the forefront. Last night, I got a call that was probably the worst call of my life. Around midnight, I received a call. Hello, 911, what's your emergency? I said to the caller, from the other end of the phone, I heard the voice of an older man, along with heavy rainfall. Hello, my name is Stefan. Most of the time when older people call, it's usually nothing serious, often due to lack of sleep, hearing issues, bad eyesight, or medication. These people panic 
and call 911 even if there is no emergency. Once, I had a 92-year-old woman call 911 and say that she couldn't see with her eyes closed. Turns out, she was just out of dental surgery and was under when she called me. So, the old man named Stefan called me. I relaxed and started reciting our pre-decided script. Hey, Stefan, where are you calling from? On my screen, besides, I could pinpoint his location to be a Starbucks downtown. Was he stuck there? And since when did old men start going to Starbucks? I work as a security guard at Starbucks, the one that's downtown. I'm 60 years old, and I think there's someone outside of the shop. Was this man panicking? Stefan, are you on any kind of medication? I had to make sure he was sober. No, ma'am. I'm clean. I really need you to send some cops down here. Sure. But before I contact the nearest unit, could you please tell me in detail what's going on? Due to my age, the manager of Starbucks lets me be inside during the night to guard the store. As usual, I was sitting by the cash counters when I saw a man standing right outside the glass window. He was still as a stone and just stared right at me. At first, I thought someone was pranking me, but soon I realized that the man was planning to break in. He had a screwdriver and some sort of other tool in his hand. By the tone and voice of Stefan, I knew this was serious. Stefan, where is the man now? Do you still have your eyes on him? Yes. He is still standing right where I spotted him. He is still staring right at me while I'm talking to you. Please, can you hurry? There was fear and urgency in his voice. So I contacted the nearest officers on patrol and asked them to get to the Starbucks as soon as possible. However, I knew I had to keep Stefan online till the cops got there, or else I was afraid the intruder may harm Stefan for ratting him out. Stefan, how long has this man been standing there? I guess for more than 25 minutes now. Do you have anything to protect yourself if he breaks in? I do have a gun in case things go south, but... I haven't used it in 25 years, so I may not be the best shot. Is he still there? I'm afraid, yes. I looked at the screen beside me and saw that the cops were a few blocks away. Stefan, I want you to remain as calm as you can be. The cops are just a few blocks away. They will be there any minute. The rain was still pouring, and I could hear the thunder from the other side of the line. Stefan had handled the situation far better than anyone else. Usually, elderly people freak out if there's a break-in or robbery in the house. No wonder he was working as a security guard. A minute later, I heard the sirens through the phone. The cops are here, Stefan said. I could hear the relief in his voice. Hey, where are you going? Don't run away. Stefan, what happened? Talk to me. The intruder heard the cop cars and ran away. Do not chase after him. The officers can take care of it. It's raining. Please stay inside, I told Stefan, which he probably listened to. Yes, ma'am. The minute I heard the cops knocking at the door of the Starbucks, I disconnected the call, knowing that Stefan was in safe hands. Around four in the morning, I was done with my shift, and was just about to leave when the cops who had handled the Starbucks case arrived at the station. Elizabeth, good work today. You have no idea, but you saved the man's life today. Officer Connor told me. Who are you talking about in the Starbucks case? Yeah, the old man Stefan who worked as a security guard at the Starbucks. You have no idea how much danger he was in. What do you mean? The intruder was outside. The moment we reached the Starbucks, instead of going inside, we decided to check the surrounding of the cafe. We found no one, no footprints or track marks of any vehicle. It was as if there was no intruder at all, as there were no signs of one. But the old fellow kept on insisting that the intruder was right in front of him, beyond the glass window, not more than five feet away. He said that the guy was standing in a bush and staring at him. Well, he told me the same thing. We were convinced that probably due to his age and all the rain pouring down, the old man might have seen something. But my instinct told me that something was up, so just as we were about to leave, 
I decided to sweep the inside of the cafe. As soon as I stepped inside and moved towards the back door that opens into the alley, I noticed wet, muddy footprints. They started right from the back door and ended just a few feet away from the cash register. This means the intruder wasn't outside. Rather, he was inside and right behind Stefan. The reflection of the intruder was getting reflected in the main window. Stefan must have thought that the man was outside when, in fact, he was inside and right behind him. The intruder must have listened to your 911 call and so he decided to be as still as possible. Good thing you didn't hang up on him too soon. As soon as the intruder heard our car approaching, he retraced his steps and left the Starbucks through the back door. Fortunately, nothing was stolen, perhaps because Stefan noticed the intruder before he could do anything. The old man does have bad hearing, as he didn't hear the intruder break the lock on the back door. We contacted the manager and let him know that the cafe's security was compromised. Thanks to Stefan and you, no one was hurt and the cafe wasn't robbed or vandalized. Knowing the fact that I had literally saved a life of a poor old man made me very proud of myself and my job. Remember when you were a kid and you had a crush on someone? You would get a thrill out of walking past their house or calling them and hanging up. It was mostly girls who did that. I got a few who walked past my house then call and hang up. It used to creep me out at the time, but now I would take that over the latest girl to take an interest in me. I'm John, and this is my story of how a girl I deliver pizza to nearly took my life. It started one night when an order was placed during our final operating hours. It was my last delivery, and it was a bit of a drive, but I didn't mind. I pulled up to the respective address and knocked on the door. The person that answered it was an obese woman. She smelled as though she hadn't showered in years. Her hair was matted, and her teeth looked like they were coated in butter. I gave her my most customer-friendly smile and handed her pizza to her. Hi, ma'am. Here's your stuffed crust meat lover's pizza with extra cheese and bacon. That'll be $18.36. She took the pizza and made sure her hand touched mine. She let out a little girlish giggle. <laughs> you can call me Cindy. I nodded. A sure thing, Cindy. You can come in while I get my wallet. No, thank you. It's best for our safety if I wait uh, right out here. There had been some recent cases of pizza delivery guys going missing, so I wasn't taking any chances. She frowned. Oh, come on. I don't bite. I'm waiting here. She pouted and slammed the door shut. For a minute, I thought she was going to take the pizza and not pay. It had me wondering if I made a mistake not going inside or not. I stood there for a few tense minutes, waiting it out. About five minutes later, she finally opened the door. She gave me a 20, and she flashed her cleavage at me, a 5 wedged in it. Some of your tip is in that 20, but if you want the rest, you're going to have to come get it. <laughs> she let out another girlish giggle. I rolled my eyes. I'll just take this. Have a good night. What's your name? This is where I made the biggest mistake. John, I'll be seeing you again. I waved her off and headed to my car. I drove back to the pizza place, sorted out my tips for the day, and went home. The next night around the same time, we had gotten a call for an extra large stuffed crust with extra cheese and bacon pizza. Henry, my manager, hollered for me. John, you're taking this one. Customer's request. In this industry, people didn't usually ask for a specific driver to deliver their food. Most people ordering pizza just want their food, no matter how it gets there, as long as it's fresh and hot. Is this your fancy way of just giving it to me? I joked. Henry arched a brow at me. No, the customer really asked for you. I don't want to take it. She was weird. Time is money, John. She's given me no reason to lose her business. She paid online, so all you have to do is collect your tip. She held a five between her boobs and told me to come get it. Did you? No. Just drive the pizza to her, and maybe next time we'll work out a tip over the phone. I hoped that there wouldn't be a next time, but something in my gut suggested that there would indeed be a next time. Then another. 
then another. This customer was going to cost me more tips than it's worth. I drove out there and it was the same ordeal. Wanted me to come in so she could get her wallet. I refused and again handed me a 20. Except this time, two fives were wedged in her cleavage. John, these are yours. If you just grab them. I ignored her and went to my car. Every day for weeks, I had to deliver a pizza to this woman. I realized that this wasn't ever going to end. So on my days off, I went looking for another job. I managed to get a job as a driver for another pizza place that paid more. The pizza was gourmet and high-end, so they were more expensive. Cindy had a $100 bill wedged in her cleavage, and when I really looked at it, I could see crumbs and bits of sauce that had to be from the time I started delivering to her. The bill had some yellow residue on it as though she used it as floss. I have never rejected $100 in my life, but that night, I would. Little did I know, she would force me to have it one way or another. Cindy grabbed my face and shoved it between her breasts. She told me to lick off all the crumbs and sauce. I refused and she knocked me out. I wasn't sure how much time passed when I finally woke up. I had a tape over my mouth and my hands and feet were hogtied together. It was dark, cold, and it smelled like death. Suddenly, I heard the creaking of a rusty door opening and heavy footsteps making their way down. Great, I was in a damn basement. A light switched on and all around me, I saw at least three men tied up with chains. I recognized their faces on the missing posters put up all over town. They looked as though they had been down there for months as that's how long they had been missing. Johnny. I heard Cindy call out in a sing-song voice. She came down and smiled, seeing I was awake. She clapped her hands and jumped up and down. Every ounce of fat jiggled and the stench between each roll permeated. It was so intense, I gagged. Cindy came and ripped the tape off my mouth. Johnny, I just want you to fulfill a fantasy of mine. I just want to have sex with one pizza delivery boy. Please. Crazy bitch, let me go. She slapped me and grabbed my head, forcing me to look at the other guys. See them? They refuse to fulfill my fantasy. I won't release them until they do. Do you want to be down here like them? I looked at them. They looked so dirty and malnourished. And unless I gave this rotting cow her fantasy, I would be just like them. I looked up at Cindy. Okay, if that's all you want. She smiled and brushed my cheek. Call me baby. Yes, baby. Let's go make all your wildest dreams come true. With luck, she believed me and cut the zip ties that bound me. She looked at the other guys. See this? It's that easy to go home. We went all the way upstairs to her bedroom that was infested with roaches and a mattress covered in cat piss. She grabbed my face and kissed me roughly. Her breath was like someone took a shit in an ashtray. Baby, I am really thirsty. Can I get a glass of water so that I can perform my best? Anything for you, Johnny. She went to leave the room and turned around. Come with me, of course. With quick thinking, as we got to the stairs, I used what was left of my strength and shoved her down the stairs as hard as I could. Her body tumbled, and on the way down, her neck snapped, killing her instantly. I puked my guts out and ran down to my car, where I had stupidly left my phone and called the cops. The other guys were rescued. I wasn't criminally charged as my shoving her down the stairs was self-defense. It turned out that Cindy was a woman who had killed her husband that was a pizza delivery driver. She wanted to feel that connection to him again. I still deliver pizzas, but I now go through no contact delivery. Growing up in a rich family is not always sunshine and rainbows. You don't get to drive whatever car you want, travel wherever you want, and go and buy whatever you want. In my family, we put responsibility before anything else. In the late 80s, my father started his business, and as the years passed, 
He built a chain of seven-star hotels all over the world that me and my siblings helped him run. Right from our birth, we were told that we wouldn't be treated as pampered kids with everything we want at our disposal. We had to study hard, do part-time jobs, and were raised as any middle-class kid would be. Now that each one of us is in our 20s, Dad put us in charge of some hotels. I look after three major hotels here in the state of California, while one of my brothers takes care of the East Coast, and my other brother looks after Europe. Recently, we purchased a new hotel in Texas, and I'm supposed to look after its integration into our chain. I was very excited about the prospect, as it was my first time working with a new hotel. The previous owner of the hotel had become too old to look after it, hence we bought it from him. On my first day there, I was greeted by the staff. The manager was the most cooperative guy, and he introduced me to everyone in the hotel. It was a good place, and they even booked a room for me to live in for the time being. My job was simple. I had to make sure this new hotel was up to the standards of the hotel chain. It was a few weeks worth of work, and then I'd go back to California. Weeks after that, we completed the work I had to do in the hotel, and it was reopened for the guests once again. On my last day there, I had arranged a small party for all the staff, and my family was flying into Texas for it too. I decided to host the party in the grand restaurant overlooking the fields. This place was a restaurant most of the time, but it was also used as a hall for parties, weddings, birthdays, and any other celebration. When I picked the restaurant for my party, there was an airing silence amongst the staff members. They were commenting with their eyes and body language, but no one said anything to me. I didn't think much of it and asked the staff to do the preparations for the party. I hired an event planner and asked her to make the necessary arrangements along with the staff. The night before the party, I went into the restaurant to make sure everything was ready, and sure enough, the restaurant was transformed into a party venue, just as I'd expected. I met the manager on the way to my room and told him he'd done a great job. He just smiled at me and walked away. The next day, I got ready for the party, as I knew my family and other guests would be arriving shortly for it. I rushed to the restaurant to make sure everything was fine, but as I entered it, it looked as if I'd walked into a wedding venue. Everything was white and cream, there were flowers everywhere, and worst of all, there was an altar by the stage. What the hell? Had the manager mistakenly booked the restaurant for a wedding instead of my party? All the decoration which was done the previous day was nowhere in sight. This party may not mean a lot to others, but to me it was very important. Being the youngest son in the family, I still had to prove my worth to my father and my elder brothers, that I could support the business just as well as they could. And if any of them saw this decoration, I'd be the butt of the joke for the rest of my life. I only had a few hours in hand, and I knew I had to hurry up. I called the event planner once again and called for the manager, too. When the manager, along with the other staff members, arrived at the restaurant, none of them seemed one bit surprised to see the restaurant transformed into a wedding venue. I was furious, but I knew being angry wouldn't get me anywhere. So instead, I asked them what this was and who had changed the decoration of the place overnight. None of them had an answer. They just looked at one another and said nothing. I knew these guys had something they were hiding from me, but what could it be? I knew time wasn't on my side, so I dismissed the staff and asked them to get back to work, while I cornered the manager and ordered him to spill the tea. In a shaky voice, the man began talking. Lost was the pride and confidence I was used to seeing in the man's eyes. Last year, we had a wedding in this restaurant. It was a lavish affair one of the biggest we ever had the pleasure to host. But on the day of the wedding, before reaching the altar, the bride fell down the stairs leading to the restaurant and died on the spot. It was a big scandal, one that the previous owner couldn't cover up, hence he sold the hotel to you. But after that day, every night they say that the bride tries to walk down the aisle to her groom to marry him. And that's why every morning we find the restaurant decorated exactly as it was on her wedding day. So, no matter what you do, the decorations always change. Many staff members 
Also, I've seen a woman in a white wedding gown walking down corridors around the restaurant at night. We didn't say anything before as we knew you wouldn't believe us. This was shocking news and I didn't know what to do. Nevertheless, the staff and the event planner were able to arrange the party in time and I hosted the party as planned. Everything went smoothly and my family and all the other guests were pretty impressed with me. But that night I still couldn't believe that a ghost bride would still be lingering in the restaurant, let alone decorating the restaurant every night for the wedding she never had. So after the party around midnight, I snuck into the restaurant and hid behind the open bar to see if there was truly a woman's ghost there. I waited for a few hours, but no one came into the restaurant. The next morning, a cleaning staff member woke me up. I was still behind the bar, fast asleep. When I woke up and looked at the restaurant, it was yet again decorated for the wedding. But you know what the worst part was? I was dressed as the groom, too, with a wedding band and ring on my finger. My name is Anthony Smith, and I was an employee at the Burger King restaurant in Houston, Texas. My reason for writing this is to share with the public the horrific activities that have occurred at Burger King for the past couple of years involving the disappearance of multiple Burger King employees with no information as to where they had gone and my personal traumatic experience with the infamous Burger King. I interviewed for the job at Burger King on the 21st of November, 2017. At the time, I was 21 years old and just looking for a way to get some money while I looked for a better job. The man who interviewed me was named Donald, and since the job didn't require any past experience or anything like that, it was more him giving me the restaurant's rules and guidelines than actually asking me questions. The rule he emphasized the most was kind of odd to me. He made sure I understood the manager and manager's office were strictly off limits and any issues I had should be taken up with him, the assistant manager, as the manager was a very private man and did not like to be disturbed. Now it seemed odd to me that the manager wouldn't want to interact with the employees at all, but it didn't seem like a problem at the time and I was just glad I had gotten the job. The first few weeks working at Burger King were tiring. I was constantly doing dishes all day, and at night, when I was done with the dishes, I'd have to clean the whole place alone. I wasn't sure if I'd keep the job for much longer, but I did because I needed the money. Eventually, I got used to the routine, and I began bonding with the cooks and a girl named Becky, who always stayed late to lock up. While cooking at night, I couldn't help but always glance at the manager's door and wonder how no one had seen him or if he even cared what went on in the restaurant. One day, while doing the dishes, I decided to ask the cooks if any of them ever met the manager. Hey, this is kind of a weird question, but have any of you ever met the manager? A silence followed before Gerald, the head chef, looked at me and said, Well, I haven't met him, but I've seen him. The silence remained as Gerald continued with, It was back when I was still kind of new here. I was working the night shift when I heard his door shut. Obviously, I wanted to know what he looked like, so I stopped and had a look. Gerald paused as if trying to build up the tension. He laughed and continued. (laughs) I've told everyone already, he's a pretty normal guy. There's no mystery. There's no secret. Just a man that likes his privacy, so don't go looking for answers where there are no questions, Smith. He patted me on the back and walked away. We were open pretty late that night, but eventually everyone had gone home, and the only one I was left with was Becky. I decided to ask her about the manager as I couldn't believe Gerald's story. Can I ask you something? I asked as I cleaned down the last table. Whatever you want, Smith. She replied, so I continued with, What do you think about our manager? I stopped cleaning and looked at her, trying to see if she had any reaction like the cook's. But... She didn't seem even slightly bothered by my question. She just looked up at me and said, You mean the manager that doesn't exist? Honestly, I've never cared enough to ask questions. I just get paid and go home. I responded with, So you didn't find it even slightly strange? What if it's something illegal? She laughed and kept looking at her phone. Yeah, sure, Smith. Maybe Burger King is a drug lab or a... 
she was cut off by the sound of a shutting door coming from the back. Nobody else was with us and the only offices at the back were Donald's and the managers. Did you hear that? I said, wondering who was around this late. Becky didn't seem to care as she just replied, Relax! It's probably just Donald. He stays late sometimes. I was basically done cleaning so I decided to check it out. I walked out to the back and no one was there. So I decided it'd be better to just finish up and leave. I didn't see Donald, I said as I returned to the dining area. It's cool. I saw who it was. Becky said, still clearly unbothered. Really? Who was it? I asked. We were both pretty tired and I figured I was keeping Becky by wasting time, so I told her I was done and left her to lock up. That night in bed, I thought for a while about what both Gerald and Becky said and decided whoever the manager was, I shouldn't care as long as I did my job and got paid. As I walked to Burger King the next morning, I could see a small crowd forming around the restaurant and a couple of cop cars and police officers trying to disperse the crowd, a lot of which were Burger King employees. I figured someone had broken in and stolen something, but, but as I got closer, I realized the truth was far more worse than that. My heart fell to my stomach as I saw Becky sighted up against the door with her head tilted over. There was a large amount of blood on her head and some had run down her arms and face. The police questioned all the employees on their whereabouts last night and eventually it came up that I was the last person to see Becky alive so I was taken into custody to be questioned. I told the police everything about how Becky and I usually stayed late together every night and this wasn't a one-time thing. They asked me to think hard as even the smallest detail could be the answer to this question and it didn't take that much thinking to remember the only thing I found odd last night. There was a noise, I said. A noise? The officer replied as that detail seemed to have interested him. Yeah, a noise. It came from the back. The officer interrupted with, The back like, out back? No, I replied. Not outside. It's where the offices and stores are. At least, that's what I thought. But when I went to check it out, no one was there. I continued with, Becky said she saw someone though. The officer's eyes lit up when I said that. Did she say who it was? No. All she said was he was really tall. That's it. The officer said, visibly disappointed. Nothing else. He continued. Listen, young man, we understand you're probably very emotional right now, and we get it. But a young lady was killed right in front of your workplace. Nothing was stolen, and she wasn't sexually assaulted. Do you understand what that means? It means either your friend Becky kept some bad company, or we have a very sick individual running around killing people. So if there's anything you're keeping from us, I suggest you say it. To be honest, I was trying to understand what had happened just as much as the police wanted to, and I don't know why, but I was certain the manager had something to do with Becky's death. I told the police I didn't know anything else, and after some more questions, they let me go. I was told not to travel out of the city and that I would be contacted again shortly. I didn't think I would be a suspect, but it made sense seeing I was the last person to see her alive. I thought about what to do for a while. I was already the leading suspect in this case and would be prosecuted if the police didn't find the actual killers or any evidence proving otherwise. I thought hard and back to that night, wondering if I had missed anything. All I could remember was the noise of the shutting door. It didn't make any sense how whoever it was left without me seeing them. I laid in bed thinking for hours before deciding I had to find out for myself what really happened that night. I walked over to Burger King at night with only one thing on my mind. Who was the tall man Becky saw? It wasn't hard getting past the police tape and getting in through the back door. The place was quiet. I couldn't help but notice how being in here alone filled the Burger King with an eerie feeling. I silenced my phone and lowered the brightness before walking straight over to where the offices were. And standing in front of the manager's office, sort of preparing myself for a reveal of some sort, I got the sense of tension as chills ran down my spine. I opened the door and almost immediately something caught my eye. It was a door right at the back of his office. A door, I'm guessing, leads outside. It seemed to explain everything, but I couldn't help but still feel confused. 
I decided to look around the office and see if I'd find answers. It was quite a small office. It had a lot of paperwork and didn't have anything out of place. I figured the door was enough to prove the manager had something to do with Becky's death and would eventually help the cops figure out the rest of the story. But as I was about to leave, I heard something faint, but it got louder and I soon realized they were footsteps. I quickly turned my phone's flashlight off and hid under the desk right when the door slowly creaked open. The person walked into the room and there was silence for a minute. Fear was the only thing I could feel at that moment as I wondered if I would end up like Becky. There was no movement or sound, almost like whoever it was simply stood in the room with me. But then he said, You can choose to remain hidden, but the outcome won't be any different, Smith. His voice cut through the silence, but I remained quiet. He sounded old. I'd figured you'd be more enthusiastic than this when you finally got to meet me. Don't you want answers to your questions? I decided at this point, he obviously knew I was in the room, so there was no point hiding. I hit emergency call on my phone, slipped it in my pocket, and got out from under the table. I was met with an almost seven feet tall man completely bald with huge eyes that had completely sagged eye bags under them. He had a slight hunch forward and was skinny. You knew I'd come? I was wondering how he found out I was here. Yes, you aren't a very smart individual. He replied with no expression on his face. Why do you kill her? I asked, hoping the cops would get here before he killed me too. No, I didn't kill her, Smith. You did. He said, pointing at me. What? No, I didn't. Yes, you did. He screamed, interrupting me. You killed her, Smith. Your questions killed her. You couldn't just work like everyone else, could you? Well, that's what killed her. You know, someone like you always comes around eventually, asking questions they're not meant to. Far too inquisitive for their own good. And then... We have to kill them. I was both scared and confused at this point. Was he killing people for just trying to find out who he was and... What did he mean by we? What kind of sick man kills people because they want to know what he looks like? I took a few steps back after asking the question, as I didn't know if I would be getting a reply, he would just get bored and kill me. Look, Smith, a long time ago, probably before you could even say a word... I was part of a greater mission to keep the world how it is. To be rid of all the purges and mistakes on this earth. I was a member of the second clan of the KKK. A group with only one goal, to cleanse the world. But instead, we were seen as evil by this weak society and deemed belittling names such as white supremacists and hate groups. Unfortunately, I was arrested and put on death row. That was until some members of my clan broke me out, of course. We had to leave our home, but don't be mistaken. We took our mission with us. I am a very wanted man, and where better to hide than the place this society sees as a safe place? He continued. Do you understand, Smith? People like you are a risk to me and my clan as a whole. We tried to warn you not to ask questions, but you blatantly disregarded our warning. The sickening look in his eyes couldn't be described, but I knew he was going to kill me. I didn't want to die, so I asked one last question as my final attempt to buy time. But why Becky? I asked, crying. He wore a sickened smile on his face as he said, A part of me would like to say it's because she saw me, but that's not true. Despite her nonchalance toward the situation, she was an abomination. Her color of her skin and her supposed sexual orientation had doomed her already. My skin crawled just seeing her walk around every day. It was all just a matter of time. He paused, then continued with, Now, if you're done buying time, sadly, Smith, I can't have you around anymore. I ran for the door at the back, but it was locked. My heart was pounding and tears began filling my eyes. I turned and watched as he picked a hammer from the shelf before lunging at me. Fighting back was the only option I had and I had to take it. 
I grabbed his hands midair and we began struggling. He was oddly powerful for an elderly man, and as he hit my nose with his head, I let go of him. I was disoriented for a few seconds, and that's when I felt the hammer hit my head. I immediately hit the floor as I was barely conscious and could feel the pool of blood forming around my head as I closed my eyes. In the distance, I could hear sirens, and the last thing I saw was the manager's feet move past me as he unlocked the back door and left. I woke up days later in the hospital and was informed I was almost dead by the time I arrived at the hospital. The manager was identified to be Griffith Theodore, a notorious and wanted leader of the second clan white supremacists. It was revealed both Donald and Gerald have supported and aided him for years and were never identified by the authorities. Griffith, Donald, and Gerald had escaped the police and were reported to have already fled the state. The following years after that were difficult. I suffered a traumatic brain injury from the blow to the head and had to undergo therapy and rehabilitation for traumatic brain injury. Burger King ruined my life and there's a shiver that runs down my spine every time I walk past one. I can't help but always wonder if there's a deeper meaning to the restaurant's infamous slogan. Have it your way. I have been working in a Wendy's restaurant for the past two years, and I have been a waitress there. Now, let me tell you, this restaurant is situated in the heart of the city. That means everyone from a corporate employee to a construction worker, or even sometimes homeless people come in to grab a bite here. I love working in this place. The staff is friendly, the customers are mostly nice, and even though the workload is more than I imagined, it's a nice place to be. I usually work throughout the day and leave in the evening. However, for the last two weeks, I have been having some weird experiences. Nothing to tell home about, but I'm going to share my story because I want answers, and I think some of you may know about this. So, this started on a Saturday. I was about to finish my shift, and the Wendy's was packed. I was busy taking orders and giving food to the tables. On a table in the far back, a man was sitting alone wearing a black hoodie. He had not ordered anything, even though he was sitting at the table and simply staring at the menu for the past 15 minutes. I had my eye on him, but I did not approach him, thinking he might need some time to decide what to eat. However, I finally went to take his order. Hello, sir. I'm Stella. I'll be serving you today. What would you like to have? The moment my eyes slid from my notepad to the man, I was awestruck. The man's face was covered by the hoodie. However, the part of his face that was visible was completely scarred and burned. Moreover, he had weird cards spread out on the table. Those weren't playing cards or tarot cards. These cards had some weird demon drawings on them. Hello, Stella. The man said in a weird, low, husky voice, as if he knew me already. I'd like a cheeseburger with fries on the side. Sure. Anything else? That will be it. Although the man was a bit odd, he did not seem dangerous. A few moments later, when I got his order, the cards were still spread out in perfect sequence on the table. Sir, could you please make some space for the food on the table? I requested as politely as I could. He chuckled and then said, Then pick a card, Stella. It felt as if he had spread the cards especially for me. I was confused. Excuse me, sir? Pick a card. He repeated himself this time in a sterner voice. Why? Just do as I say. Somehow, I felt compelled to pick a card. There was something about his voice. I kept the food on a vacant table beside his and picked a random card that had a goat man-like picture on it. Hmm. Interesting choice, Stella. You pick the devil himself. With that, he collected the cards, put them aside, and then grabbed the food from the other table. While I stood there dumbfounded, holding a single card that I had picked. What does that mean? I asked the man while he was eating his food. That means... The devil chose you too, Stella. My head was starting to buzz from his cryptic talking. I walked away and started doing my work. My shift was about to get over anyways. When I returned to that man's table, 
He was done with his food. However, he was shuffling the cards. As I was about to lay the bill down on the table, he suddenly grabbed my hand, and that's when I noticed that his hands were too scarred and burned like his face. Then he looked at me, and I got to see his whole face. He must have been the most horrid-looking man I had ever seen. Not only was his full face burned and scarred, but his eyes were also red. I was so shocked and terrified that I jerked my hand out of his grip, but it was too late. He had made a weird trident mark on my hand by then. I had no idea how he had done it, but there it was on my wrist where he had held me. The man got up, threw a few bills on the table and left. But right when he was about to exit the Wendy's, he turned and said, See you around, Stella. With his red eyes glaring at me. I did not know what to make of that. I continued with my day as if nothing had happened. However, throughout the day, I had a feeling that someone with red eyes was glaring at me. I could see the shadow of a man standing through the periphery of my vision. The next day, as I was going to work, I saw the same man waving at me from across the street. For a minute, I was taken aback. But when a car passed in front of him, he disappeared. Then, throughout the day, I saw the same man waving at me multiple times. Then days turned into weeks, and now, two weeks later, I am still seeing the visions of the same man all around me, be it day or night. So I decided to do some research about the situation online. Although I didn't find anything substantial on the normal internet, I did discover a forum on the dark web that was all about the hooded man. Turns out that whoever the hooded man visits is cursed. They have a trident-shaped mark on their wrists. Later, the cursed person will see the hooded man in unexpected places. However, every time they see the man, he gets a bit closer. The day he gets close enough to touch you is the day you die. This revelation threw me off balance. For the last couple of days, he had been in the same room as me, but in the furthest corner. This means he will soon get to me. The moment I read that last sentence, I spotted the man in my living room, right beside my dining table. He was much closer than he was the day before. I ignored his imposing presence and started searching through the internet for a solution to break this curse. I found nothing for hours, all while I could see the presence of the man from the corner of my eye. Then finally, I found a separate form on which a user had successfully broken this curse and had given the solution. He said I had to pass on the curse to another person, and to do so, I had to draw the exact symbol that was on my wrist on the wrist of another person as soon as possible, otherwise be ready to die. Now, I work in Wendy's, and people from all age groups come here, but do you know who is the easiest to target? The kids. Yep, if I have to save myself from this curse, I have to transfer it to a kid or teenager, because it would be difficult to mark an adult's wrist. However. I am having second thoughts about this plan. What should I do? Please, someone help me. I need help. My name is Alexander Wayne, and like many people watching this, my favorite place to get a meal is McDonald's. And every weekend like clockwork at around 2.30 p.m., I would stop by my favorite McDonald's joint and order two Big Macs with fries for my wife and I, along with a Happy Meal for our 10-year-old daughter. This quickly became a routine for me, as everyone at home really loved McDonald's and expected these McDonald meals every Saturday and Sunday. But this all changed after my horrible experience with the infamous McDonald's restaurant. It all started on the 17th of August, 2016, I had made my way to my usual McDonald's to get our lunch for the day, but it didn't take long before I noticed something was different. The cashier I was used to seeing at the counter, named Blake, wasn't there today, as he had been replaced by a female who looked to be in her mid-thirties. 
I was curious and a bit disappointed, as I was already used to Blake, as he usually had my order ready for me before I even came in. I decided to ask the new cashier what happened to Blake, and when he'd be returning. But before I could speak, she said, Hello, what would you like today, sir? I noticed she sounded stressed, and was clearly not in a good mood, so I decided not to bug her with my questions. I would like two Big Macs and a Happy Meal with a side of fries to go. I replied as she jotted away on her notepad. She handed my order over and returned to tell me that she'd have my order shortly. I can tell you're having a bad first day, huh? I said in an attempt to make small talk while I waited. She looked up at me and smiled before saying, Is it that obvious? I apologize if I was a bit rude. I figured she assumed I was upset and was trying not to get in trouble with her manager. No, it's fine. There's nothing to apologize for. I just noticed you seemed a bit stressed. She smiled at me before I continued with, So, any idea when Blake's going to be coming back? He's the guy that worked here before you. I tried not to make it seem like I didn't like her service when asking the question. Oh, he quit yesterday, I think. So I'm sorry, you're stuck with me for now. <laughs> I laughed at this comment, and before I could say anything else, my order was ready, so I paid the bill and headed out. I was in my car about to leave when the cashier ran out to my car with something in her hands. You forgot your ketchup with those fries. I'm Chrissy, by the way. I found this strange, as I was completely sure I didn't order ketchup with my fries, but decided it was probably a mix-up and just replied with, I'm Alexander. It was nice meeting you. Before starting my car and leaving. A couple of weeks went by, and it didn't take Chrissy long before she memorized my order and had it ready for me every time I came in. We would find ourselves talking in the middle of her shifts, and she would sometimes ask me to come over during her breaks. I understood to some it would seem weird, but it was a completely platonic relationship, and I made sure Chrissy knew from the start that I was married, and she would usually ask how my daughter was doing and ask to see pictures. One day I was at work, and Chrissy called to tell me she needed to see me because she was really stressed and confused. I told her I would stop by to see her after work, but it was a rainy day, and I completely forgot and ended up just going home. We were all in the living room watching a movie that night, when suddenly we heard a loud knock on our door. I quickly got up to check who it was, and when I opened the door, I saw Chrissy, completely drenched, staring at me with this furious look in her eyes. Why didn't you come to see me? She said. I immediately remembered I had promised her I was going to see her, and felt quite bad for her, but at the same time, I was still really shocked as to why she would come all the way to my house at this time. I must have been lost in my thoughts, because I still hadn't answered her question. Chrissy didn't seem to like this at all, as she said. It's them, isn't it? Are they what's coming between us? I didn't seem to understand what she meant by them, but I knew I owed her an explanation, so I replied with, Chrissy, I'm sorry. I know I promised I'd come to see you, but I had a rough day and forgot. I then continued with, But that doesn't justify you coming to my home at this time. That's simply inappropriate. Not to mention, it's pouring outside. It wasn't until I finished talking that I realized Chrissy wasn't paying any attention to me at all. She seemed to be staring at something behind me. I turned to see what she was so focused on and realized my daughter was standing behind me. I didn't know how long she had been there, but I knew it was time for Chrissy to leave. But before I could say anything, she was already gone. My wife demanded an explanation that night, asking who the woman was and why she came to our home that late at night. I wanted to explain everything to her, but I knew it would seem odd and she would immediately think I was cheating. So I brushed everything off and told her it was nothing. But as I lay in bed that night, I wondered and hoped that it was really just nothing. For the next few days, I tried going over to my McDonald's joint to see Chrissy, but she wasn't there. And eventually, I was told she had quit her job a while back. I asked when she had quit, and surprisingly, it was the same day she came to see me at home. A couple of weeks had gone by now, and if I'm remembering correctly, it was the 19th of November, 2016. But more importantly, it was a Saturday. I headed out to get our McDonald's meals, and as I drove there, I found myself wondering if Chrissy was okay. 
I walked into the McDonald's restaurant, and the new guy, Jake, who had taken over from Chrissy, looked at me like I was in the wrong place. It was weird, because he'd been here for a couple of weeks and knew I always came in by this time to get my order. Good afternoon, sir. Was there a problem with your order? He said with a truly concerned look on his face. I assumed he was joking, so I said, Order? I haven't gotten an order to have a problem with, Jake. I then laughed and continued with, I'll have the usual. Jake, who was still visibly confused, wrote my order down and sent it over. I'm sorry, sir, but a delivery was made in your name to your house earlier today with your order. Of course, your meal will still be given to you, but are you sure there isn't a mix-up? As I heard what he said, I was more concerned than confused, as I asked, Who called for the delivery? A woman, he said. She called about an hour before you came in. I assumed it was your wife. Shocked, I then responded with, And who made the delivery? He smiled and said, Well, sir, I'm sure you'd be happy to hear this. Chrissy came back two days ago and needed a job. Unfortunately, her position was filled, but we had an opening. I wondered why he was telling me this, when all I asked was who made the delivery. But it all made sense when he said, Our delivery guy had an unfortunate accident and ended up in the hospital. Chrissy was happy to take his position, so I'm guessing she made the delivery. I immediately ran to my car and began speeding home, and the only thing that was on my mind were the words, It's them, isn't it? They're what's coming between us. So I called the cops and told them there was a possible intruder in my home. Immediately I got home and I knew something was wrong. Our front door was wide open and I could hear Chrissy screaming upstairs. Come here, you little bitch! I ran inside the house and immediately headed up the stairs when something caught my eye in the living room. I knew that hair anywhere. It was Jade's, my wife. I walked over to her slowly with tears forming in my eyes. I could tell she wasn't moving and I could see the massive pool of blood around her. But I didn't want to stop. I arrived at her body and saw multiple stab wounds in her stomach and chest. I fell to my knees and began crying. Jade! Jade! A huge part of me knew she was dead, but I refused to believe it was true. I knelt there crying until I heard Chrissy's voice again. Come here, you little bitch! Come here! I immediately realized it was my daughter she was talking to and ran upstairs. I could feel a hole in my chest and my heart beating heavily as I started checking the rooms for where she was. Suddenly, I heard my daughter scream in her room, followed by Chrissy struggling while saying, Come here! Come here! At the same time, there were sirens in the distance, and I rushed to her room to see Chrissy dragging my daughter out of her closet. Chrissy, I said, scared. Why are you doing this? Please, stop! Chrissy then dragged my daughter out and held the knife to her throat before saying, Why am I doing this? Can't you see, Alex? They are the problem. They are what's keeping us apart. Can't you see? Her eyes were wide and cynical, and I could hear people moving downstairs. Please, I said, dropping my head to the floor and crying. Please, Chrissy. She's everything I have. Chrissy responded with, No, no, don't be sad. You have me. I'm all you need, Alex. Not this little bitch, and certainly not your wife. Before I could say anything, two policemen ran upstairs and stood beside me with their guns pointed at Chrissy. Put down the blade, ma'am, or we will be forced to open fire, one officer said as they slowly walked into the room approaching Chrissy. Don't come any closer, or I will cut her, she said, stepping back before looking at me and saying, Is this what you want? Tell them to go away, Alex. Tell them you love me. Ma'am, step away from the child and put the blade down, the officer said, cutting her off. No, shut up. All of you, shut up. He loves me. She's the problem. You're all the problem, <laughs> and I can't have that. She then pushed my daughter to the ground before charging at the officer. She shot her four times, and she dropped dead to the floor. After the incident, an investigation was carried out, and it was revealed that Chrissy had no records before that and had no mental illness. 
I was told by the police that some people aren't born evil or have an excuse to be rotten, but simply decide to be. And sadly, Chrissy was one of them. It was later also proven that she was involved in the accident of the previous McDonald's delivery guy in order to take his job. My daughter went mute for a couple of weeks, only speaking at her mom's funeral, when she ran to her mom's casket, screaming, Mommy! Mommy! She slept in my bed for a few months, and I tried my best to hide when I cried myself to sleep from how much I missed Jade. My daughter had to undergo therapy after a few months, but eventually became herself again. It's been seven years now, and I always remember the first day I met Chrissy when I walked into that McDonald's restaurant. And despite all the happy days it gave us, all McDonald's truly gave me was a broken life and a happy meal. Last night, something extremely weird and scary happened. My friends and I still have no idea how to make sense of it. It was as if we were in a horror story. So, just like every month, me and my buddies, Chris, Noel, Nick, and Asha, were in our regular Tim Hortons for dinner. We all work really tough jobs. I'm a civil engineer, so I'm all the time either on construction sites or in my office. Nick is a writer, so he's either working on his book or brainstorming ideas for his next one. Noel works in a car company, so he's traveling the world making deals and signing contracts. Asha is a professor and had lectures to teach and papers to grade. Still, on every month's second Saturday, we meet at this particular Tim Horton for dinner. We usually share whatever is going on in our life and just chat and chill out. Most of the staff members know us as their regulars, but this time, there was a new waiter there. He was a bit odd. For starters, he wasn't very attentive. Nick had to call him and wave at him a couple of times to get his attention. When he finally arrived at our table for a few minutes, he didn't write down our orders. Then, when he did, Chris had to make sure that all our orders were properly written. Seems like this guy's either drunk or high, Nick said. We laughed it off. A few minutes later, the waiter brought us our beers, and luckily, the order was correct. Later, we wanted our water to be refilled, and Chris tried to get the waiter's attention, but he looked right over us, and not at us. Dude... It's difficult to get this guy's attention. What the hell is wrong with him? Asha said. I'm telling you, he's high on something. Otherwise, who would act like that? Nick said. Finally, the waiter arrived with water, but spilled some on Nick's lap. Hey, what the hell, dude? Be a little careful. I don't want a wet spot on my pants. People might think I peed myself or something. Nick said with a serious face, fed up with the waiter but the rest of us just laughed out loud. The waiter just said sorry and moved ahead. This continues for the rest of our time there. We try to get the waiter's attention and he walks right past our table without so much as acknowledging us. It was all a big joke and Asha was planning to write a one-star review to the Tim Hortons. Finally, our food arrived, although the order was perfect. He just placed the wrong food items in front of us. Instead of pointing it out, we just laughed some more and then made sure each of us had their ordered food. Thereafter, instead of giving his order for our beer, we just started telling him to surprise us, and each time he used to get us the same beer we had ordered initially. He was still in a daze as if there was a fog in his brain instead of actual working brain cells. This was definitely going to be a memorable dinner we would often joke about henceforth. When we were ready to pay, a waitress walked up to our table with our bill and apologized for the tardiness of the waiter earlier. We assured her it was no big deal, and Asha even dropped the idea of writing a negative review. She also told us that the previous waiter had finally taken his much-needed break and was out in the back. Finally, we paid the bill and walked out of the restaurant, still cracking jokes about the waiter and how Nick would have looked if the waiter would have spilled the water in his lap. I had picked up the guys from their homes and was responsible for dropping them off. That's why I only drank two beers. However, I had parked my car in the parking lot behind the Tim Hortons. As we all headed there, still laughing and joking, Asha stops in her tracks and stares to her right, straight at something. Noel was the first one to spot him. What are you looking at? Asha asked. Look there. He points right at the back door of the restaurant we just exited. It's dark out there, 
only two street lights at the two extreme ends of the parking lot. However, there's hardly any light illuminating the back door of the restaurant. So when Asha asked us to look carefully, we all stopped and looked towards the door. That's when we saw it. The most disturbing view of our life. It was weird that people watch disturbing things in a hospital when people die or in movies. And we were all looking at it behind a damn Tim Hortons. Is it real or am I dreaming? Nick asked in an utterly serious tone. I think it's real, Chris confirmed. I think so too, I said. That's when it sees, or should I say he, sees us. We're rooted to our spot when our eyes lock and no one from the group has the strength or the courage to move. Then he moves and takes a step away from the door. That's when our fight-or-flight instincts kick in and we all started sprinting towards my car. I already had the keys in my hand and as soon as I reached the car I unlocked it and got behind the wheel. My friends too piled up into the car and slammed the door shut, locking them. I started the car and began driving, the headlights illuminating the road. I drove the car at full speed as my friends huddled in the back and passenger seat beside me. All the buzz they were feeling from the beer they had drank drained out of them. I was soon on the main street connecting to the highway, going towards my home. For several minutes, none of us said a word. We were all shocked, and I focused on driving. Was it true? Noel asked, and instead of answering him, we all just nodded. We reached my home and I asked everyone to stay the night, and none of them complained. I live in a big apartment, and I didn't sleep until the wee hours. Today, when I walked out of my room, all my friends were sitting around my coffee table, just staring straight at the TV, which was showing some news. However, when I read the news, the ground beneath my body shook. The news report said that a person's dead body was found in a parking lot behind a Tim Hortons restaurant this morning, the exact Tim Hortons we had dinner at last night. The dead body was missing some vital organs like the heart, the kidneys, and the liver. It was suspected that it was an animal attack, but this restaurant is in the middle of the city, so there's no chance of it being an animal attack, as the largest animals we have are dogs, who just bite if they need to, not to eat your selective organs. The news stated that some detectives claimed it was done by a person, but most of the cops had dismissed the theory, claiming who would be so gruesome. The dead person was a waiter who worked at Tim Hortons itself. The poor fellow must have come out of the back door for his break and fallen prey to whatever it was. The whole media, cops, and detectives were baffled by the case. They also say that whoever did this is still roaming the streets. Once the news shifts to another topic, we all look at each other, wondering what to do. Because last night, we saw this poor person being killed when we stopped in the parking lot and looked at the back door. We had seen a person on all fours eating this dead waiter. We couldn't believe our eyes. When we registered what we were seeing, the man on all fours saw us and then got up. He was standing on his two legs now, but his face was red from the blood of the dead man he had just eaten. When we looked a bit more clearly, we noticed that the horrifying-looking man was none other than the weird waiter who had served us tonight. The moment he registered us, staring at him, he began running at us, and we ran. And you know how the rest goes from there. We're not sure what to make of it, but we certainly know that the waiter was the one who had killed and eaten his poor colleague. Should we report to the cops, or... Should we forget last night and move on with our lives? And more importantly, what was this waiter? Was he a demon or an animal? Hi, I'm David. And many years ago, one of my high school friends, Jack, opened a new Papa John store in our hometown. The news of his opening the pizza place was a delight to all, as he always wanted to own a fast food joint. Jack and his wife Alice had collected money and worked very hard to open this shop, and to everyone's utter delight, they had welcomed their first child, a daughter named Sharon. A few weeks before the grand opening, 
things had really started to work for Jack and his small family. As we, all his friends, were very proud of our buddy, we decided to arrange a small get-together at his pizza place itself. The date was set around Thanksgiving week, when most of us would visit our hometown for that Thanksgiving dinner. So on the 23rd of November, we all had planned to gather at Papa John's to celebrate with Jack and his family. The only catch to this gathering was everyone had to be dressed in the Papa John's uniform to show our support. On the day of the gathering, the place was overcrowded with people. Even though the pizza place was closed to customers, it was making just as many pizzas for all the friends gathered. Jack and Alice had rented a two-story place, where they had their pizza shop below and their home above it. The entrance to the upper floor was from the kitchen of the pizza shop. This is how the couple kept an eye on their newborn. As the gathering proceeded, a lot of people gathered at the pizza place. Many of us had our spouse or other family members tagging along. Alice had invited some of her friends too. All of us were in the uniform, and it was a bit tough to recognize people, especially the people we hadn't seen in a while. Everyone was busy enjoying the pizza and drinks, when I distinctly remember a woman, perhaps in her late thirties, approached the shop. She had followed the designated dress code. Alice had spotted this woman too, and welcomed her inside, thinking she must be one of her husband's guests. But I couldn't remember this woman from our high school. As the gathering went on, everyone was getting pretty intoxicated. By the end, I was helping one of my friends get into a car, when I and a few remaining guests heard an ear-piercing scream from Alice. She was screaming from her daughter's room. We all ran up to find Alice crying near her daughter's crib, which was empty, except for a shoe that lay upside down in the daughter's bedding. Being only a few weeks old, the infant couldn't climb out of the crib by herself and wander around the house, let alone outside. Alice had brought her downstairs at the beginning of the gathering to introduce us to the little girl. For the rest of the gathering, little Sharon slept peacefully while we all had a good time downstairs. After the initial panic, everyone began to look in and around the house for the infant. However, I had a feeling that Sharon did not wander off. She was taken away possibly abducted. When I approached Jack, he was holding his wife, who still hadn't stopped crying. I tried to calm her down and asked her about the woman who had walked into the party. Instantly, Alice knew who I was talking about. Jack, I, and Bill, one of our friends, checked the CCTV footage to find the woman. We immediately saw her entering the pizza place around 9 p.m., and after grabbing a few slices of pizza, she snuck upstairs to Sharon's room. The footage did have her face, which was enough to report her. Jack said she must have left through the back exit, which is not covered by any cameras. We instantly called the cops and reported the woman. We also handed over the footage to the cops. The cops immediately started the investigation, and soon the whole town was on the lookout for this woman and baby Sharon. Even on Thanksgiving, hardly anyone was celebrating. Instead, everyone was looking for the lost baby. That evening, there were three more reports of missing infants in the town, and two of the reports claimed to have seen the same woman before the abductions, confirming her to be the culprit of all the missing cases. Along with that, one common clue left behind by the woman was a single shoe of the abducted babies in their cribs. The investigation went on for months. I and some of my friends stayed in town for a couple of weeks to extend our support and to take part in the search parties. But other than the shoe, nothing was ever found of the missing infants. After a year of investigation, the police could find no leads on the case and were eventually forced to close it. The woman was never seen in town before these abductions and was never spotted again. There were many stories and theories about the abductions spreading in the town by the local people. Some said that she was a spirit, while some claimed she was a part of a cult, and others believed that she was a human trafficker who stole young kids and sold them. But I believe none of them. It was as if Jack and Alice had lost their will to live. They closed their Papa John's mere months after the abduction, and two years later, they moved out of the town to start anew. Every time I enter a Papa John's pizza place, I remember Alice's ear-piercing scream and the despair in her eyes. 
It was the worst tragedy our small town had ever faced. Nothing of that sort ever happened again, but it stayed with all the people. Now, 15 years later, there was a mall being built a few miles away from my hometown, and to lay its foundation, the land was being dug. The things that the construction team found on the site shook the entire town, and the 15-year-old mystery was finally solved. The skeletons of four infants were found wrapped in a black cloth, buried six feet under the ground. This news was made public, and the families of the lost kids, who would have been around 15 years old now, were gathered to see their kids for the last time. It was heartbreaking to know that the infants were killed, but the motive behind the killing and the whereabouts of the lady is still unknown. There's an old saying that goes, you can take a person out of a place, but you can never take the place out of the person. And to be honest, that's exactly how I felt as I sat there and watched the peculiar scene play out before my very eyes. My name is Ethan Carter, and I used to be an FBI agent. I gave 13 years of my life to that job, and I loved every second of it. At the time, I thought I'd be an agent forever, as I had no plans for settling down, but that was before I met Alice, my wonderful wife. It didn't take long before we had a son, and I decided to retire so that I could spend more time with him. I more or less became a stay-at-home dad while my wife worked. And while I did some other jobs here and there on the side, I spent most of my time with my wonderful son, Matthew. Now that you're all caught up, this brings me back to the very beginning of the story where I reminded everyone of a very popular old saying. I thought of this saying while I sat in a nearby branch of the famous restaurant called Chuck E. Cheese with my son of the 12th of October, 2016. At that time, we had this tradition called Chuck E. Cheese Thursday, as my son loved the restaurant Chuck E. Cheese. So I had set out a day every week to take him there after school. And as we sat there, I noticed something very odd. Chuck E. Cheese, or as the children called him, Mr. Cheese, was acting in a very peculiar manner. Now to every normal gem in the restaurant, nothing was wrong, because to them, they just saw someone wearing the Chuck E. Cheese mascot costume and playing a character. But to a former FBI agent, I knew something was wrong with the person wearing the furry suit. For the 13 years of my life, I learned and mastered something called nonverbals, widely known as body language, during my time at the FBI. So I could tell a lot of things from a person's body movements, mannerisms, and the way they act, without having them say a single word. And as soon as I noticed those movements, my mind reverted back to a similar groove, as even though I was sitting in a Chuck E. Cheese restaurant, my mind acted as if I was back in the FBI. I watched as my seven-year-old Matthew ran up to him with excitement in his eyes, and I carefully studied their interactions. For starters, I noticed that the man inside the costume reacted the exact same way when he met every child. It was like a broken record, as he literally did the exact gestures perfectly. Now, that wasn't what bothered me. No, what bothered me was how he acted in between intervals when he wasn't meeting any children. As immediately there weren't any children around, his whole body language changed. He pulled his legs behind him like he was extremely tired. The arched movements of his abdomen made it seem like he was having some difficulty breathing and any normal human being in that kind of situation could easily just go to the back and take a break. But he didn't. And it's not because he didn't want to. It was because he couldn't do it. All his body movements screamed that he was being forced to do this as he was literally a hostage walking in broad daylight. I was about to walk up to him to check and see if my intuition was true, but before I could reach him, he was ambushed by several kids and their parents asking to take pictures. My son then ran back into my arms with a yawn on his face. I could tell he was tired and it was time to go home. As we walked out of the restaurant, I stared directly at the man wearing the mascot and I gave him a huge smile as I told myself that I was surely going to find out whatever was going on with him next I returned. I went back the next day after dropping my son off from school. I ordered some food and I started observing the man wearing the Chuck E. Cheese mascot. As I watched him for a while, I began to notice a few things. For one, the manager watches the man wearing the Chuck E. Cheese mascot like a hawk. It was as if he was keeping him under surveillance. Another thing I noticed was that as soon as the man wearing the Chuck E. Cheese mascot stepped out of character or showed a bit of fatigue, the manager would shoot him a look of pure disgust and hatred. It didn't take long before I put two and two together. I knew something was going on, 
but I couldn't do anything about it yet, as I didn't have any proof. So I walked up to the man wearing the Chuck E. Cheese mascot, and I said, How's it going, Mr. Cheese? The man then looked at me and said, It's going great, friend. Have a wonderful day. And with that, he walked away. I stood there stunned because of what I had just heard. It was hard to tell because the muffled sound was coming out of the furry costume, but I could distinctively tell that what actually responded was a recording, as I was sure the man inside the costume didn't speak. Instead, he played a pre-recorded track as an answer. That was extremely strange, and I remember asking myself why he didn't just use his normal voice to answer instead of recording. I was still confused, but I carried out my next step. I walked up to the counter and asked for the manager. When he came out, I asked what his name was. The man then said, Christopher Harris, sir, with a huge smile on his face. I observed him and he seemed normal and kind, but I needed to see if my theory was correct. So I said, can I please ask a favor? You see, I have a seven-year-old son and he absolutely adores the person that plays Mr. Cheese in the restaurant. Is it possible if I could meet the man and ask if he would like to play the character at my son's birthday party at home? I promise I will pay him well. When I was done, I noticed that the manager's mood and mannerisms had changed as he began to stutter and give excuses like, I, I don't think he would be able to do that. You know, he's pretty shy and uh, he, he only wants to work here and maybe you could... As he continued to blubber out more lies, I noticed that his palms were sweaty now and his eyes were darting around the room like he was in trouble. All this further proved my point that there was something seriously shady going on and I was going to find out what. So I thanked him and told him that I'd find another person to do the job. I left the restaurant, but I didn't leave the premises. I called my wife and told her to pick up our son from school as I wouldn't be able to make it home tonight. When I was done, I entered my car and waited till it was evening. I stayed there till about 9 p.m., which was their closing hours. I saw all the employees leave one by one, and soon enough, everyone had come out except the manager and the man wearing the mascot. I waited till 10 o'clock before I finally saw them. I watched as the manager took the man wearing the Mr. Cheese mascot to a small storage unit behind the restaurant. They both went in, and after 30 minutes, only the manager came out. I watched as he locked the door with a padlock before going to his car and driving home. I was perplexed now as I wondered why a manager would be keeping one of his employees under lock and key. It began to seem like my suspicions were true, but I still needed a little more concrete proof. So I got out of the car and I made my way to the small storage unit building. I easily hacked the padlock as it was opened in less than six minutes. I then quietly opened the door and walked in. The rancid smell coming from the inside of the storage unit was horrible as it made my face round up. The floor was wet as a washed Chuck E. Cheese mascot costume was dripping water all over the floor. As I walked further, my eyes darted all around the small room till eventually landed on a battered man lying in the corner. He was lying on a ragged mat with his back towards me so I couldn't see or make out his face. He was in a crouched position as there wasn't enough floor space for him to lie down freely. It was obvious that he had been brutally beaten in here as the bruises on his body were still fresh. My mind didn't have any explanation as to what was going on, so I tapped him to get some answers. Startled, the man turned around, and as soon as I saw his face, I was mortified. For starters, his face was swollen beyond recognition. Whoever had beaten him up clearly hated this man with a passion, but his disfigured face wasn't what horrified me. No, what made me horrified was the fact that his bloody mouth was sewn shut. I could see the infected, perforated holes on the top and bottom of his lips. I could also see the unimaginable pain on the man's disfigured face when he tried to open his mouth to talk. It took a while for my brain to process this ghastly scene, but I calmed myself down and I managed to calm the man down too. I tried to call someone for help, but the man shook his head vigorously as he didn't want me to do that. I then asked, did your boss do this to you? Because if he did, don't worry. I can get him thrown in jail for a very long time. Before I could finish, the men grabbed me by the shoulders and looked me dead in the eyes. No words were said as tears started rolling down the man's cheek, and from the deep fear in his eyes, I could tell that if I said anything to the cops about this, he would surely be killed. Luckily for me, I had been in situations similar to this so I knew exactly what I had to do. I calmly got up and said, It's alright, I understand. 
I won't tell anyone about this. You never saw me, and I was never here. The look of relief in his eyes answered my statements as I slowly backed away towards the door of the storage unit. When I finally left, I didn't go home. I went back to my car to make some phone calls, and when I was done, I waited for the manager. It was 1 p.m. when I finally made my move. I waited till the restaurant was filled with people, as it was better that way. I walked in, and I noticed the manager going to his office. So I quickly followed him, and before he could enter his office, I confronted him. He immediately became nervous when he saw me, as he said, Oh, it's you again, sir. Did you later find someone else to entertain the children at your son's birthday party? I didn't let him finish as I cut him off by saying, I know what you did. Confused, the manager said, I'm sorry, I have no idea what you're talking about. I then looked him dead in the eyes and said, I know everything that you've done to the man wearing the Chuck E. Cheese mascot outside. I've already called the cops, so they'll be here any minute now. But before they drag you away, I would like to ask one question. Why? What did the man ever do to deserve that? A sick grin was now plastered all over the manager's face as he said, Your feeble mind can never understand why. I had a duty to perfectly bring that character to life. I needed that man to be one with Chuck, and I was going to do anything to make sure that he was, regardless of what I had to do to him. He had to be as perfect as John Weidler and Scott Wilson. These men gave that character life when the Chuck E. Cheese mascot was first introduced. They did it magically as I was amazed by their performance when I was a child. So when I was given the opportunity to be the manager, I swore to reproduce that magic, no matter what it took. After blubbering complete nonsense for the past few minutes, he then looked me dead in the eyes and said, I had to do it for the children. It was all for the children and I don't regret it. When he was done, I didn't need anyone to tell me that this man had been playing an act in public. The mask he carried around was finally off, and I came to realize that deep down, he was nothing but a messed up psychopath. I had dealt with people like this before, so I knew exactly what came next after their psychotic breakdown. I watched as he bolted to the forefront of the restaurant with a tense look on his face. Seeing as I knew how his mind worked, I already predicted that he was going to grab a kid, so I quickly tackled him before he managed to do that. And within minutes, we were all surrounded by cops. Investigations were quickly carried out, and soon enough, everything was brought to light. The abused man, after he had been taken to the hospital and cleaned up, was identified as Jose Hernandez, a 19-year-old illegal Mexican immigrant. Around two years ago, he had managed to cross the dangerous U.S. border, but his father was shot in the process, and he was eventually separated from his mother. Jose then started to explain how everything happened as he said, the last thing I was told about my mother was that she was either captured or killed. And I soon came to terms with the fact that my mother was dead now too, which made me an orphan in a foreign land. After grieving the loss of my parents, I traversed many areas on the street looking for jobs so I could make some money to eat. And that's when I met the man called Christopher Harris, as he found me on the side of the road. Jose told us the manager had picked him up from the side of the road under the lure of having a job for him. He then told us how things went from there saying, During the first few weeks of the job, Mr. Christopher began to brutally groom me into becoming the character Chuck E. Cheese. He explained how the manager hated his voice because of his Mexican accent, as Mr. Harris really hated it whenever he spoke in the Chuck E. Cheese costume. Apparently, Mr. Christopher believed he was unfit to be the voice of Chuck, so he gave him generic pre-recorded messages to play any time he was confronted by customers and children. Jose then told us, even after I was given the recorded messages, I still found it hard not to speak when spoken to, as I still used my voice from time to time. Through tears, he then explained how the manager truly hated this, as he said. Mr. Christopher really hated it when I did that, and in order to put a stop to it, my mouth was morbidly sewn shut. And the threads were only removed when it was time for me to feed. Jose told us the constant, ghastly act of repeatedly sewing and loosening his mouth had made him lose almost all sensation in his lips before continuing with. No matter what was done to me, I knew that I couldn't go to the police because being an illegal immigrant with no papers made sure that it wasn't an option. No one needed to tell me that I couldn't do anything about the morbid way I was being treated, so I had no choice but to bury it. He then revealed that after a while, to his surprise, he found out his mother was still alive and she had managed to contact him. 
I remember when I told Mr. Christopher the good news. He started to beat me mercilessly. He did this because the apparent backstory of the Chuck E. Cheese character stated that Chuck E. Cheese was an orphan, and now that my mother was alive, I wasn't able to truly become the character. He said Mr. Christopher hated unfixable imperfections when playing the Chuck E. Cheese character, so he threatened to replace him as he was now unfit to be the character. Apparently, Mr. Christopher had told him the week before that he was already looking for replacements along the border, and once he had found a suitable person, he promised Jose that he would get rid of him. Jose then finally said that if it wasn't for me finding him, he would most likely be dead now. After the police finished questioning the abused victim, more investigations were carried out and it was revealed that Jose wasn't the first person to undergo the messed up brutal method acting that Christopher Harris put him through. When asked what he did with the rest of them, the manager confessed that most of them died due to the brutal treatment that they were put through. And in order to dispose of them, he took their bodies upstate to a family-owned farm and fed their remains to pigs as that was the best way to leave no trace. The farm was searched by forensics and small remnants, traces of over eight victims were found, but it was impossible to identify any one of them. At the end of the trial, when the case was coming to a close, the psychopath Christopher Harris was given life imprisonment. As he told his lawyer, he didn't want to plead insanity. After the buzz of the case had simmered down, I pulled some strings with some of my friends in immigration, and with a good lawyer, I managed to get Jose to stay in the United States, and I also made sure that he was eventually reunited with his mother. I normally visit them every now and then just to see how they're doing. Over six years have passed since all this happened, and to be honest, this incident made me see family-oriented places and restaurants in a different light as these places were where we bring kids and families to have fun and put smiles on their faces. And as a parent, never in a million years would I have ever thought that a place like that would also be a treading ground for a deranged psychopath. So I guess what I'm trying to say is that we should all be careful out there because truly evil people look just like the rest of us. If you're enjoying this content, make sure you like and subscribe. If you're a U.S. resident, then you're familiar with the cookie bakery called Crumble. It started in Logan, Utah and blew up. They now have 300 locations in 36 states. Their cookies are famous for being the size of your whole hand and a consistently changing menu. Different flavor cookies every week so you never get the same thing twice in a row. I have been a loyal customer from Salt Lake City for the past couple years, but after my recent experience, I won't be coming back. It started a few months ago. Since the pandemic, I ordered curbside pickup and never really broke the habit as I never liked leaving the car anyway. For a long time, the service was exceptional. I would order through the app, leave them a tip, and click the here button when I pulled up. They would bring me my box of cookies and I would take them home and enjoy them throughout the week. They never got my order wrong either, which was something I counted on every time. On a typical Monday, I placed my mobile order after work. Four cookies, three of them were each of the new flavors and a chocolate chip which is on every week. Their flavors are always amazing, but there is something about the chocolate chip with their milk that they sell with the cookies that makes me nostalgic. I pull up to the Crumble store and tapped here on the app. Usually my order is out in two minutes, but that day I waited for 45 minutes before I decided to call them. Thank you for calling Crumble in Sugar House. This is the manager. How can I help you today? Hi, I placed a mobile order and tapped the here button on the app and I have been waiting 45 minutes in your parking lot for someone to bring it to me. Oh, I'm so sorry to hear that. So when you pulled up to the bakery, there's a button that you can push. I pushed that button. You what? I know what button to push. I've done it a hundred times. Did you push it on the app? Oh, for fuck's sake. That's what I'm telling you. 45 minutes ago, I pulled up, tapped here, and I have been waiting. Oh, okay. It's not showing up in our system that you confirmed you're here. I've obviously been here. Yes, I will have your order sent out right away. I hung up, and sure enough, a male employee was on his way to my car, but they were only carrying a single cookie box instead of the four cookie box that I ordered. I rolled down my window and he smiled at me. I paid for four cookies. I sincerely apologize for your wait. 
Here is your cookie. According to my bank account, I've been charged for four. Oh, our system says you just ordered one. I showed him my order receipt on my phone. Okay. And he went back inside. Within a couple of minutes, he brought out the correct order. Since they have been consistently good to me, I let the incident slide, but decided I wouldn't tip them anymore. I continued to hit them up every Monday, and things went back to normal, but I still wouldn't leave a tip. A few months went by, and they pulled the same thing. I again waited 45 minutes for my order, and we had a repeat. I was a bit shorter with them than I was last time and still refused to tip them. Because it had only been a couple of times, I still let it go. Everyone and everything has an off day once in a while. I had another incident where I worked late at the office one night. During the week, Crumble closes at 10 p.m. I placed my order at 9.30 and when I got out of the office at 9.45, I made the trip to Crumble to pick up my order that should have been ready by the time I got there. I pulled up and saw some employees still inside with the lights on. I tapped the here button and I waited. I was parked directly in front of the place so they should have known I was there to pick it up. I watched them make a box of cookies, assuming it was mine, so I waited patiently. Being 10 p.m., I was the only one there and I didn't think they could miss that. They finished frosting the cookies and placed them all in the box. Then the workers proceeded to shut off the lights and walked out the back having not brought out my order at all. I checked my bank and I was indeed charged the $14 that I usually paid for my box of cookies. To say I was pissed was an understatement. I got on the Crumble Instagram page and sent a direct message to them. I let them have it and mentioned the times that their curbside had screwed up. I let them know I was out of money and no cookies. They have over a million followers, so I wasn't even sure they were going to see it. I only sent it because I needed to bitch someone out and all I could do was get on their social media at the time. I was surprised to see that they had messaged me back sincerely apologizing for the inconvenience and they would like to make it right. I rolled my eyes and waited until the next day to call them. Thank you for calling Crumble in Sugar House. This is the manager. How can I help you? Hi, I'm Lacey, and last night I ordered a box of four cookies around 9.30 p.m. I understand it was closing by the time I got to the bakery, but your employees saw me pull up, made an order, and just left. Oh, shoot. I am so sorry to hear that. Would you like a refund? What I want is a refund and my box for free. That was completely unacceptable customer service. I understand, but all I can do is offer you a refund. Your corporation wanted to make it right but didn't say how they would, so I'm taking that as I'm making the demands. All I ask is my cookies and my money back. Ma'am, I can't just give you a box of cookies and a refund. It has to be one or the other. Fine, I'll take my cookies, but I want you to know that this is bullshit and I never want to come back here again. We're sad to see you go. I'll be there in five minutes to pick up my box of cookies and they better be fresh. I hung up and drove down to the crumble on my lunch break. They brought out my cookies and I took them back to the office and dug into my chocolate chip cookie. It was still warm and the chocolate was gooey delicious. I had nearly forgotten about crumble's error the night before and thought maybe I will give them another chance since this cookie was one of the best ones they had ever served me. I dunked my cookie into the ice cold milk and took a large bite allowing myself to get lost in the flavors. Suddenly, I could taste something metallic, and I bit into something sharp and hard. I spit up the mashed up cookie in my mouth and saw blood mixed in with it. Whatever it was cut up my mouth and I was bleeding profusely. What the fuck? I grabbed a napkin from my desk drawer and dabbed my mouth. I went to the bathroom and swished water around in my mouth to wash out the blood. I discovered that one of my teeth was missing and I had cut up the gums around it pretty badly. I went back to my desk to clock out and head to an emergency dentist to see what they could do to repair the damage. As I was on the phone with them, I was sifting through all the gunk I just spit up and pulled out a large screw. Inside my chocolate chip cookie was this thick metal screw that I didn't notice until it was too late. 
I hung up with the dentist and made a quick TikTok video of what I found in my cookie and what it did to my mouth. I went to the dentist and luckily since it was a back molar that had been knocked out, I could arrange to get an implant after my gums heal up. They gave me stitches as I was scrolling through TikTok that night in bed. I had a lot of comments and messages. There had been at least a dozen more cases of people finding screws in their cookies. The next day, I called the crumble location and told them what was in my cookie. All the manager said was, maybe next time you'll remember to leave a tip. I did bring this up to crumble's attention, but all they did was apologize and offer a free cookie, which I vehemently turned down and told them to take their business and fuck off. Personally, I think crumble grew too fast and now they think they're invincible. Selling cookies with screws inside them is dangerous and I was lucky to only have my mouth cut up and lost a tooth. If I had swallowed that screw, I could have lost my life. Hi, my name's Hunter. I will share the horrific experience I went through at Chuck E. Cheese. This story might make you and your family never visit Chuck E. Cheese anymore. The incident happened five years ago during my niece's birthday party. My sister had decided to celebrate her child's birthday in a grand style. It was her fifth birthday party after all, and her husband, a manager at Chuck E. Cheese, shut down a whole section in the arcade game center for the party. They invited many people, children and parents alike. I didn't want to attend because I was going through a phase at the time, and I thought Chuck E. Cheese was meant for kids. But then I remembered my crush works there part-time and she'd be working for the party. So, I decided to attend with some of my friends. When the day came, I dressed better than I did on my own birthday. I was trying to impress my crush. Little did I know that I would regret stepping foot inside Chuck E. Cheese. The party ended around 6 p.m. Most of the guests had gone home. I decided to stay back with some of my friends who I invited. I wanted to help with the cleanup. Why? Well, I was determined to impress my crush and take her home after. I waited for all the guests to leave. Her and I talked for about an hour while cleaning up together. Then, I felt the urge to ease myself. I went to the gents room. As I opened the door, I bumped into a man who was going out of the toilet. He seemed in a hurry. Oh, sorry, I said as I lifted my head to meet his gaze. His glaring eyes stared at me. His look was scary. He had a scar on his left cheek and a couple of tattoos on his right cheek and forehead. Weird. He brushed off his jacket and went away without making much sound. If that wasn't weird, I thought to myself. I felt the tightness in my bladder again. I almost forgot I had to pee. I tried to open one of the toilet doors. The first one seemed jammed. Nobody replied or knocked back. I assumed it was just out of order. It took me another second to notice the feet by the gap between the toilet door. It was clearly someone in a costume, one of the Chuck E. Cheese mascots at the party, I presumed. Why didn't he say anything or make a sound while I tried to open the door, I thought to myself as I was about to grab the door to the next toilet. Then, I heard a loud thud from inside the first toilet. The door opened up, and suddenly, I saw the body of a man in a mascot costume fall on the floor of the bathroom. The head of the mascot costume was missing. He was only wearing the body of the outfit. My eyes stared at the body against my will. I was in shock. His face was pale and his eyes were still open. He was not moving or making a sound though. Even a child could tell that he was dead. I let out an unmanly whimper and fell back on the floor. I was shocked. I picked up myself after a few seconds and dashed out the door to get help. As soon as I got outside the door, I saw the man I bumped into earlier while trying to get to the toilet. He was standing in front of the bathroom. He seemed to notice how petrified I was and he moved towards me with a ferocious look in his eyes. With every step he took towards me, I could feel shivers down my spine as he moved closer. My eyes quickly scanned around for an escape route as I saw a knife in his hand. I turned left and tried to run away. He picked up his pace and started to run after me. I ran as fast as possible, and I ended up in the amusement ride section there. 
I saw one of the attendants who was also cleaning up when I arrived. I told her about what I had seen and that a man was after me and she should call for help. She didn't believe me though. She thought I was one of the creepy guys who smoked heroin in the bathroom. Plus, I reeked of urine. I pushed her away and ran into the amusement ride section. As I got in, the scary man showed up behind the girl. I tried to warn her, but she was hesitant. As she turned around, he drove the knife into her throat and pulled it out. Blood gushed out. She turned back at me with blood flowing from her mouth and throat and dropped dead. The scary man tried to catch up with me at the amusement rides, but I had hidden in one of the seats. Every step he took had a resounding force of fear. Come on out now, he said almost whimpering. His voice sounded even scarier than his footsteps. I know what you've seen, and I can't let you get away with it, he said. It dawned on me that he was the one who killed the dead guy in the mascot costume, and he was trying to erase any witnesses. I cried silently and crawled into the seat further. I kept praying to God in my mind for help as he moved closer to where I was hiding. I saw his shadow. It looked haunting. My eyes opened glaringly as I tilted my head to look back. He was there with his knife, pointing directly above me. The adrenaline in my body skyrocketed and eroded any form of fear that I felt at that instant. I moved my head quickly, but not before the knife sliced a part of my ear. I shouted and jumped up out of the seat. He managed to grab and hold on to one of my legs and stabbed it. I had never felt such great fear in an instant in my entire life. I pushed him back with my other leg and crawled forward with a knife still stuck in my leg. He pulled another knife from under his jacket and now stabbed me in the back. I let out a cry. He stabbed me again, this time by my side. But I kept crawling in my blood without any sense of direction or time. Unable to scream, he seemed to enjoy watching me in pain. As I turned to beg for my life, he grabbed me by the leg, pulled me towards him, and pulled out the knife in my leg. I let out another shout of pain and began to call for help. Nobody's gonna hear you. <laughs> he said while cackling like a madman. As he attempted to stab me again, I bit his hand so hard it started to bleed. He grunted and slit my face with his knife. I let go of my teeth's grip and I pushed him away. I crawled out and got up, but he was just right behind me. I was limping away from him with every ounce I had left, and he was trailing intentionally behind me while laughing. I was slowly losing consciousness when I sighted a slight metal piece in front of me. I fell to the floor intentionally, but mostly because my body was weak and dying, but also because I wanted to pick up and conceal the metal object. As he drew near me, I stabbed his eye with the remaining energy I had in me. He cried out in pain and held the eye that I had stabbed. I gathered my strength again and limped out of the amusement ride section. He also got up and shouted angrily while running after me with one hand over the damaged eye. As I retreated to escape, I heard sirens, police car sirens. The scary man ran away immediately, and fortunately, he ran into one of the police officers and was apprehended. Thankfully, the police found me in time. The last thing I saw before I lost consciousness was one of my friends rushing towards me. I didn't know how time had passed, but as I opened my eyes, I could see a bright white room. I thought I was dead. Is this the afterlife? I felt and thought as I opened my eyes. I realized eventually that I was in the hospital. It didn't take long when my aunt, mom and friends rushed in. I'd been in the hospital for a week and just regained consciousness now. The doctors patched me up, but they said I was severely affected by the wounds and that I'd end up with scars. Two weeks after, the police conducted their investigations and found out that the scary man, whose real name was Spencer Parker, was part of a group of people who'd go around to places like Chuck E. Cheese and amusement parks to kidnap kids and sell them off to human traffickers. The dead guy in the mascot costume was part of the group. He was disguised as a friendly mascot to lure kids. 
but he refused to work for them anymore, and that's why he was killed. He came back to clean up the body, and when he noticed that I found out about the body, he tried to kill me too. The Chuck E. Cheese Center closed down during the investigation. My uncle said he received the orders to shut down, and he was sent to another center as a manager. Many think the management of Chuck E. Cheese had something to do with the human traffickers, and quickly shut down to cover their tracks. This horrible incident still haunts me. I've not stepped into a Chuck E. Cheese since that day. It's been 12 years, yet the memories of this incident are still fresh. I was 11 years old back when this incident happened. It was a lovely Friday morning, and my younger sister and I were getting ready for school. I could still remember what we had for breakfast. My younger sister was just 5 years old then. My parents had a big fight after I was born, so they lived separately for a while before getting back together after four good years. I loved and cherished my younger sister. She was intelligent and kind. I was responsible for taking care of her, which I enjoyed doing. After breakfast, my sister and I exited the house. Sarah was thrilled. She'd always wanted to visit Chuck E. Cheese. All her friends had gone multiple times, but Mom wouldn't allow her to go even if it was for birthday parties, because there were so many negative rumors about Chuck E. Cheese. So I promised to take her after school, and that was the worst decision I ever made. After school, I quickly picked Sarah up, and we headed for our forbidden journey. There was a Chuck E. Cheese down on our neighborhood, so we went there. It was magical. Sarah was beyond excited. We explored the place and played many games. The mascots were nice and friendly. I also played a lot of games, and it was fun. I was carried away with the games, and I didn't realize it was getting dark. I kept checking my wristwatch. Little did I know that my wristwatch had stopped working. Suddenly, I heard the closing announcement. I looked at my watch again and realized the time was the same as the last time I checked it. I started panicking. Everywhere was empty, and I could only hear a few workers. I looked around and saw Sarah sleeping in a pool of balls. Probably that was why no one saw her, and I was at the last stall playing games. I woke Sarah up, and we headed out. I walked fast. I knew I was in big trouble. I'm going to be grounded for years. Mom's going to be so mad at me, I said with teary eyes. Keep up, Sarah. I said looking back to check on Sarah when I didn't hear her response. I looked behind me, and I didn't see anyone. I walked back and called Sarah, but there was no response. Sarah, stop playing games. We need to leave. Mom's gonna be worried, I said annoyingly. I thought she didn't want to leave. I kept looking and I was getting furious. Suddenly, the light went out. It suddenly became so dark. The only thing I could see was some creepy toys with lights on them. I'm not scared. I'm not frightened. I kept muttering. Suddenly, I heard the floor creaking as if someone was trying to sneak up on me. I paused for a moment, and I looked back suddenly, hoping to catch a glimpse of whoever it was, even though I was scared as hell. S sarah is, is that you? I asked in a trembling voice. Sarah, please come out. This time, I was already in tears. I started shouting Sarah's name, but got no response. I started hearing noises like someone was trying to close the doors, so I ran towards the door. Help! Someone is still in here! The place suddenly became more prominent than it was when we entered because I couldn't get to the door on time. I hit the door a few times and heard a faint scream. It was Sarah. Sarah! I exclaimed and ran towards the voice. I kept shouting Sarah's name, but there was no response. I was so scared and confused. I tried going back to the door. I was running towards the door when I slipped and fell. Something was on the floor. It felt like water, but it was sticky. I didn't bother checking what it was. I stood back up and proceeded to the door, and I noticed a stick, so I picked it up and banged the door with it. Someone's in here! Open the door! I kept hitting the door and shouting. After some minutes, I paused a bit to catch my breath. I couldn't stay calm. I was crying. Suddenly, I heard the door moving. 
someone must have heard me and was trying to open the door. I took the stick and I continued hitting the door. Suddenly, I felt a figure behind me. As I looked back to check who it was, a hand covered my mouth with the other hand on my stomach. The figure dragged me away. I tried struggling, but I couldn't move a bit. It was a firm grip. The figure kept dragging me backward as I tried to break free. It was dark in there, but the figure knew his way. As he was pulling me away from the door, I could hear the door open, and I heard my dad's voice. Tears rolled down my cheeks. I tried to struggle harder, but I couldn't break free. My mom must be worried sick. My parents had gone to my school to check on me when she got home from work and realized I wasn't home with my sister. And when she realized I wasn't at my school either, and neither was Sarah, she went to my best friend's house to check on me. Thankfully, I had told my best friend Ben about how I was going to Chuck E. Cheese with my sister, so my parents made their way to Chuck E. Cheese. Unfortunately, when the door was open for them, I couldn't come out to meet them. The figure that grabbed me entered a room and threw me to the floor and locked the door. I finally saw his face. He was a muscular man in his mid-twenties at least. He also had a partner. Immediately I landed on the floor. His partner covered my mouth with tape. His partner was much younger and had a skinny look. I was so scared. I didn't know their motive. I just knew I was in big trouble and it was drastic. There was another door in the room. They opened the door and kicked me into the room with my hands tied. I felt pains all over my body and then felt someone jump on me. It was my sister. Her hands were also tied. What kind of monster would tie the hands of a child? I burst into tears as I thought about horrible things that could happen next. I looked around and saw two little girls there that were younger than Sarah. I was young, but... I knew I wouldn't leave there alive. I remembered seeing my dad, so I tried to make some noise. Probably he would hear me and, and rescue us. I hit my body severely on the door, but the noise only attracted the bad guys. What's making that noise? The younger one snarled. He had an ugly expression and a very gruff voice, unlike his physical look. He walked close to me, and I moved back in fear. It must be you. These little rats can't make any noise, he said as he gave me a heavy slap. I fell to the ground and Sarah, already scared, ran towards me, crying. He carried Sarah up with one hand. Her legs were hovering. Make another sound, and I'll tear up your pretty little face with my knife, he said as he wiggled a knife in his other hand. Is that clear? He said authoritatively, almost shouting. I nodded excessively blinking my eyes, which must have been red due to all the tears. When they left the room, I moved closer to Sarah, who had already peed her pants, to calm her down, even if I was helpless. I regretted agreeing to take my sister to Chuck E. Cheese. After about 30 minutes in the hostage room, I had no option but to pray my dad would find us. I was already dozing off with Sarah on my lap. I heard a gunshot. I stood up and hid with Sarah and the two little girls. There was a commotion going on outside and suddenly the doors opened. Thankfully, it was the police. We were rescued and my mom hugged my sister and me passionately. One of the bad guys was shot and the other was arrested. Paramedics came and took us to the hospital. The bad guys are child traffickers who've been kidnapping children for a long time and getting away with it. They almost got away with kidnapping my sister and me because my dad had already decided we weren't in the Chuck E. Cheese Center and was about to leave when my mom saw my wristwatch. My wristwatch had fallen off when the bad guy was dragging me away. She quickly notified the police and luckily the cops could trace my footsteps because when I slipped and fell, it wasn't water that made me drop. It was colored slime. So the slime left footprints, which helped the police figure out the bad guy's hostage room. It was... A traumatic experience for my sister and me. It wasn't long before the Chuck E. Cheese Center closed down. My mom still believes Chuck E. Cheese is just a facade to kidnap children. And I still can't get over the fact that I went through all that at a Chuck E. Cheese.